Questions without notice. Are there any questions? Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I ask the uh, Leader of the House to move a motion of censure on the Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I'd better let him start. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I, I assume that means Leave is granted. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr Speaker, I move that uh, this House censures the Prime Minister for one, his continued economic failure, which has created great uncertainty and burdens for families, individuals, young people, seniors, small business and farmers. Number two, his inability to uphold the standards required of a Prime Minister. Three, his failure of policy, which has delivered nothing but false dawns. And four, his continued failure to deliver what he promises. Mr Speaker, um, um, at last, of course, the Prime Minister has accepted a motion of censure, and it is appropriate, as this, as this could well be the last uh, day despite the fact that he told his caucus that he'd bring us all back next year so that we could limber up for the election. So that we could limber up for the election. Well, let's see if we can take the opportunity today to do a bit of limbering up for the election. But it is an opportunity, it is an opportunity, Mr Speaker, for to allow, to allow this House right. to debate some of the issues that the Australian public will be wanting the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition to debate over the next few weeks. And it is an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, Member for Northern for, Territory. It is an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for this House and for both sides of politics to crystallise what the election campaign is going to be about. Now, no doubt the Prime Minister has in his own mind that he wants to have it on a referendum, a referendum on this or that issue. And no doubt again, in the course of his reply, we will get some indication from the Prime Minister as to the sort of issues that he regards as being important in the election campaign. But can I put it to the House, Mr Speaker, and I believe that in doing this I will be speaking on behalf of everybody on this side of the parliament, and I believe that I will also be speaking on behalf of millions of Australians all over this country, including hundreds of thousands, including hundreds of thousands of men and women who, as you all know, as you all know only too well, as people like Sylvia Smith in Bass and Maggie Deham in Macquarie and Harry, Harry Woods in Page and George Gere in Canning and Mary Crawford in Ford and Peter Knott in Gilmore and Gary Gibson, yeah, yeah, Peter, you know this is true, Lord, uh, and Gary Gibson in Morton and Barry Cunningham in McMillan and Peter right. Dodd in Leichhardt and Gordon Bilney in Kingston, Neville Newell in Richmond and Peter Cleland in McEwen and Bob Kenneworth in Duckley. And can I say, can I say, Mr. Speaker, courtesy? Can, can, I, can I say, Mr. Speaker? Can I, can I? Oh, a few of you were feeling a bit lonely. Can I say, Mr. Speaker, that courtesy of Laurie Brereton, um, Mary Easton is going to be a bolter from behind the field, and she's going to be added to that list. But, Mr. Speaker, you know as well as I do, and all of those members. All of those members that I've, that I've named in, the, uh, in that list that I've just read out, and they are, of course, as you all know, the, the principal marginal seat holders of the Australian Labor Party, and they are the people who are going to be on the front line of defending the failed policies of the past 13 years. All of you know that there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who have always voted for your party, have always You've habitually voted for the Labor Party. There are hundreds of thousands of them, and they are literally aching for the opportunity to vote against you at the next election. And that is the why. And all of those people, Mr. Speaker, I mean, I mean, I can, I, I really, you know, one, one really shouldn't, one shouldn't have really have any sympathy for them. But, but you know, I can just understand, I can just understand how desperate many of those feel. Because, because, Mr. Speaker, just imagine they have, spent, they have spent the last nine months watching the major battlefield of politics in Australia, being the major battlefield of politics in Australia, being being over not over the middle ground of Australian politics, not over a constituency that normally belongs to the Liberal Party and the National Party, but the last nine months the main battleground of Australian politics has been over the allegiance of people who have habitually voted Labor all of their lives. And they feel so let down and they feel so betrayed and they feel so angry. 
And whether you go to the inner suburbs of Sydney, and you ought to go there occasionally, Laurie, if you can still find your way, whether you go to the inner suburbs of Sydney, whether you go to the rural areas of Queensland, whether you go to the rural areas of Tasmania or Western Australia, you find the refrain, Mr Speaker, you find the refrain uh, of, of, of deserted, uh, despairing, betrayed, true believers of the Australian Labor Party, and they are really wanting the opportunity to vote against this government. They are determined to vote this government out. They are determined to tell an arrogant, out-of-touch Prime Minister that he no longer represents their best interests, and they are determined to wreak their vengeance on the Australian Labor Party at the next election. And no matter how much, Harry, you and Maggie and all of those other people, no matter how much you will try and dissociate yourself from this bloke of the dispatch box, no matter, no, oh, never, oh, never, 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 no, but thank you, thank you very much, thank you, thank you, thank you very, good on you, Maggie, good on you. No matter, God, God, hey, Harry, would you say that too? Would you say that, Harry? Oh, no, 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 Harry, no, no, Harry, Harry. Oh, Reserve your no, no, seat. Harry. Reserve Harry, your yes seat. or no, Harry? Yes or no? The well, Leader of the Opposition will return, refer to members by their yeah, electorate. Hey, yeah. Graham, will you say that? The Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> but, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I, can I, can I, I tell you, can I, can I, tell, can I tell you, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, can I tell Order, you the those reason? Are my right. Can I can I tell you the reason? The leader of the opposition has yeah. the call. Can I tell you the reason? The Member reason for Mr. Gilmore. Can I can I tell you, Mr. Speaker, the reason the reason that they those hundreds of thousands of former true believers of the Labor Party are aching for the opportunity to vote against this government? There's one very very simple reason. I mean, this, the, the leader of the government, the Prime Minister, has always paraded himself as a bit of a specialist. Well, in a sense, they recognise that. They see, they, see, they see Paul Keating very much as the foreign debt specialist. They see him as the high interest rate specialist. They see him as the high unemployment specialist. But most importantly of all, Mr Speaker, the people of Australia, not only those hundreds of thousands that are going to walk away from you whenever the election is held, but also millions of other Australians, Mr Speaker, they see Paul Keating as the divided society specialist. And, and, and the worst legacy of this man and of this government, when it is voted out of office, will be the extent to which it has divided the Australian community, the extent to which it has put one Australian against another, the extent to which it has presided over a widening of the gap between the rich and the poor, the extent to which it has sought to play uh, pressure group politics to the detriment of the interest of the mainstream of the Australian community. And this man will wear the mark of dividing Australian society, of being a leader who has wounded and wrecked rather than healing and, and uniting, as a leader who has seen partisan political advantage in setting one group against another. And if ever there is a demonstration, Mr Speaker, of the futility of that approach, if ever there has been a demonstration of the failure of that approach, it is of course in relation to the issue about which the Prime Minister and I have just spoken, and that is the wood chip debate. The reason that you are in a mess on forest is that you've politicised the issue to the detriment of the national interest. And that is why, that is why you, are in, you are in an absolute mess on this, on this particular subject. Mr. But Mr Speaker, as I look back over the last um, as I look back over the last uh, eight or nine months, Mr. Speaker, I am reminded of Member the infinite variety. I am reminded of the infinite variety of the attacks that have been mounted on me and on the opposition by the Prime Minister. I mean, when when uh, when I was first elected on the 30th of January, uh, they, the, the the Prime Minister and all of his colleagues they embarked upon this this tremendous campaign to talk about the past, to talk about the 1950s, to try and create the impression that the government stands for the future and the coalition stands for the past. Well, we had an oh, you say it's true. Well, I'm glad you say it's true. I'm glad you say that. I'm glad you do, because we had a marvellous opportunity a few weeks ago to see who's for the past and who's for the future in the dispute about CRA. And as I listened to that dispute, as I listened to that dispute, I heard, I heard words I heard language. Order. I, had a, I heard a violence of language and a violence of words that I thought had disappeared from the Australian political and industrial scene. I heard people talk about drawing a line in the sand. 
I heard people talk about inflicting pain. I heard people talk about chasing companies down rabbit holes. I can say to you, Mr Speaker, there was a lot of pain inflicted. There was about $200 million of pain inflicted on the Australian economy. There was enormous pain inflicted on a leather exporter I know in Western Australia who, after struggling for years to win an export order in Southeast Asia, uh, suffered the ignominy of seeing his export order tied up on a, on, on a wharf that had been rendered useless by the MUA strike, and as a result of all of his years of work, he lost the order to a competitor in another part of Southeast Asia. Now that's the kind of pain. And when I listen to that, when I listen to the language, when I listen to the language of people like Jenny George, the language of people like Bill Kelty, the language of people like Doug Cameron and Tim Pallas, I thought I was hearing debates from years ago when I heard this old-fashioned, class-driven language of the trade union leadership of Australia. And, where, where was, and, of course, and of course that brings us inexorably to the Prime Minister. Now where was he? He was in Japan. I mean, where was, I mean there he was in Japan, stranded in his irrelevance so far as this particular dispute is concerned. Absolutely stranded. I mean, I mean, Mr Speaker, it really did put me in mind of the opening over of a test match. You get the opening over of a test match and the, 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 the bowling was being Order. opened by, by Bob Hawke and Jenny George. And you have Bill Kelly keeping wickets, and you have Tim Pallas and, uh, and Doug Cameron in first and second slip. And where's the Prime Minister? He's been consigned to fine leg. And don't you feel, lo you feel lonely, Laurie? You were left to bring out the drinks. <laughs> but, Mr, but Mr Speaker, I mean, I mean one, of, one of the interesting things in life, of course, of course one of the interesting things in life is, is to study people's self-descriptions. I always find as I'm sure many other members of the House find, I'm sure they always find self-portraits and self-descriptions as being very revealing. They are revealing not only of delusions, but they are also revealing of vulnerabilities. And you know, the Prime Minister has his own sort of self-description, and I think I've got it right when the Prime Minister says, well, you know, they may think I'm a bit arrogant, they may think I'm a smidgen out of touch, but gee, you know, despite all of that, I do get the mail through. I mean, I mean this is the self-portrait he paints of himself. I may be a bit arrogant, grant that, but gee, I get things done and I get the mail through. And I think that reveals both a vulnerability and it also reveals a delusion. Because the great delusion this Prime Minister has is that in some way he does get the mail through. People often say to me, I want to vote against the Prime Minister because he's arrogant. And I say to them, don't vote against the Prime Minister because he's arrogant, vote against the Prime Minister because he's been a failure. Because the real, the, real, the, the real reason why this man should be voted out of office, the real reason why his government should be voted out of office is that this government has been a failure. And those, those on the other side may Gilmore. use their noise, they may use their numbers, they may use anything they like in order to, um, in order to interject and to cry the down what I'm saying. But the reality, Mr Speaker, is unquestionably that it is not the arrogance of the Prime Minister that deserves censure, much of those, much that there is a lot of that, but the reason that he deserves censure is that he's been a failure as the Prime Minister of this country. And that is the reason why he deserves. And, and you ask why I put that proposition, uh, Mr Speaker, let us look at unemployment. I mean, if ever there was a social concern that you would think a Labor government would want to have the most pristine credentials on of all, it would be unemployment. I mean, aren't you ashamed that after 13 years unemployment is now going up again towards 9 per cent? Aren't you ashamed that youth unemployment sits now at 30 per cent? Aren't you ashamed that despite all the talk about turning corners and bringing home the bacon? And this is the one that's going to deliver it all despite all of that talk. You still have a situation where the unemployment rate in this country is starting to rise again. That we still have almost one in three of Australian young people who want to get a job can't get a job. Is that the sort of legacy that you want to take to the true believers in an electorate like Hughes? Is that the sort of electorate, is that the sort of legacy you want to take to Labor voters in other parts of the Australian community? Of course it isn't. And then, of course, we get to the Prime Minister's sort of piece de resistance, and that is the current account deficit. Of all of the extravagant claims that the Prime Minister—oh, he says, 
Here I go, what can I tell you? I'll be going a lot more on the current account deficit between now and the election. Do you think you've heard the last about the current account deficit? Now, wasn't it in 1986, oh, wasn't no. it in 1986 oh, that, no. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that, the, that the Prime Minister said, the Prime Minister said that, if, uh, that if you know we have a current account deficit, uh, which now is much worse than what it, it was then, we'd be headed towards becoming a banana republic, and we now have the current account deficit that is the worst in the OECD. It is worse even than Mexico. We have a foreign debt that's risen from $23 billion in 1983 to $180 billion today. We have interest rates. Australia has amongst the highest real interest rates in the world. Inflation is now at 5.1 per cent, which is one of the highest in the OECD area. Um, economic growth, very interesting, Mr Speaker. The Business Council, the today, the Business Council today has produced an analysis of the Australian economy, which is recorded, and I quote from the analysis, and this has come out only today, the lowest average growth rate for a five-year period since at least 1960. So you have to go back 35 years to find an average growth rate over a period of five years, which is lower than the growth rate of the last five years. And also significantly, that same report demonstrated that in terms of national income per capita, Australia in the international rankings has fallen from 10th in 1983 to 22nd, Mr. Speaker, from 10th in 1983 to 22nd in 1995. Now, if, if the government and the Prime Minister want to take that kind of economic record to the Australian people, if they want to campaign on that, if they think that is as good as it's ever going to get, if they believe that nobody has any reason to complain or object about that, well, I could say, and all of my colleagues on this side of the House could simply say, oh, that we could be so lucky, that people could be so deluded about their own performance. They could be so out of touch with what Australian people think at the present time that they could believe that that is the kind of thing that is going to secure them election. But the other reason, apart from his economic failure, Mr Speaker, that I believe the Prime Minister deserves to be censured by this House, is his failure to uphold appropriate ministerial standards. His absolute failure to sack Carmen Lawrence for having deceitfully misled the Australian people. I mean, it really is a remarkable party. They throw Graham Campbell out for saying what he believes. They keep Carmen Lawrence for lying about what she's done. Order. Now, that is a very, Order. very no, strange— No, no, no. The League of Opposition will withdraw that last comment well, and replace it with other words. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, if you, if you ask me, I they am. throw Graham Campbell out for saying what he believes. They, uh, they keep Carmen Lawrence in for, for deceiving the Australian public about what she has done. And everybody on this side of the House and everybody out in the Australian community knows that if the Prime Minister had had the standards of Gough Whitlam, if he'd had the standards of Ben Chifley, if he'd had the standards of Malcolm Fraser or Bob Hawke, he would have had the courage to sack Carmen Lawrence. And, and, and you know, he, he, parades this, he parades this fiction, he parades this myth, Mr Speaker, that in some way it's been a conspiracy of the Liberal Party. Just remember, Mr Speaker, I mean, they never... He talks about the Burke squad, he talks about the conspiracy, but everybody knows that Carmen Lawrence burnt not because of the Liberal Party, she burnt not because of Richard Court or anybody on this side of the House, she burnt because her Labor colleagues in Western Australia, the old Burke squad, could no longer maintain their conspiracy of silence. And if it hadn't been for the fact that Keith Wilson spoke to Paul McGeer of the Sydney Morning Herald in April of this year, if it hadn't been for the fact that all of her colleagues lined up to give evidence against her, if it hadn't been for the fact that Jim McGinty, one of them, who actually told the Prime Minister that Carmen Lawrence was deceiving the Australian public, he warned the Prime Minister not to back Carmen Lawrence. In other words, he told the Prime Minister that he'd be sending good taxpayers' money after bad if he promised to pay the cost of Carmen Lawrence. If it hadn't been for the actions of those people, all of whom are members of the Australian Labor Party, then Carmen Lawrence would not now be in the predicament that she's in. She's there because she was exposed as being deceitful and dishonest by her own former Cabinet colleagues in Western Australia. She was undone by her own deceit. She was undone by her own dishonesty. She was undone by her own deception. It was Labor mates. It was the Burke squad. It was all of those who brought, those who brought her down. Nobody else. And this prospect. man sitting opposite stands condemned for not upholding the standards of Prime Minister order demand. And it is a mark of the standards that he's had. 
It is a mark of his failure to set those standards as a Prime Minister, which is one of the other reasons why he should be censured. Mr Speaker, I hope in a sense that the Prime Minister was right when he said we will be coming back next year, but I don't think we will, and I look forward very, very much to the coming encounter in the election campaign. Is the motion seconded? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, three times he's tried to get up and move this motion. Three times, he, three times he's prepared. On order, it. No, order. And Mr. Speaker, Prime there Minister not, will be heard. There was not even a flicker of political life in it. There was not a flicker of political life in it. Mr. Speaker, my great fear is he'll die. On order. The, he'll die in the straight on me. If I stretch him out till May, he'll die on the straight on me. Because if this is the best he can do, I've only had to make him run February. February to the end of the year, and, and God, you know, he was, at, he was up the front of the field and he's dropping back, you know, as you can see the line coming up. I mean, if that's a situation of a fighting opposition leader in the last days as he sees it of, of this parliament, well, God help you all over there. God help you all over there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. Mr. Speaker, and, and just to just to reveal, Mr Speaker, the fact that he has not a clue about where we are now in the world or what we're doing, he thought putting together the largest free trade area in the world had me stranded in Japan. <laughs> that is, in, in, in one of the greatest post-war initiatives of Australian, order. Of Australian foreign policy, order. The House will come to order. stitching together a Pacific Rim trading community, we were stranded in Japan. Stranded in Japan. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I want to move the following motion. Speak to it. That all words after that be omitted and the following words inserted. That the Leader of the Opposition be censured for his failure to stand for any consistent policy principle or issue of substance before the Australian people. Order. For his failure to imbue the Federal Coalition with any standards of integrity and in, in responsibility in policy development. In policy Order. Development. No, no, the Prime Minister will be heard. Those on my left. Leader of the Opposition was heard. For his failure to imbue the Federal Coalition with any standards of integrity and responsibility in policy development. For his Member refusal for Parks. to engage the Australian people in serious debate on matters of policy importance. Yeah, and his preference for political stunts, empty headland speeches and smears over policy rigour and substance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it came to Member all this for week Flinders. when the paper which has supported him most finally came and said, how ducks are hard decisions. Exactly. And the Financial Review, in a, in, a, in a long editorial, how ducks are hard decisions. And why did they say it, Mr. Speaker? That on the basic issue of management, on the basic issue of management, he said in his uh, speech at Competitive Australia on the 18th of July, we will make significant public savings. The overriding objective of our fiscal policy will be achieved over the economic cycle, a structural budget surplus, so that rather than contributing to debt Order. creation, the government will be adding to the national savings Prime bill. Minister will receive his seat for In a sense, motion, yes, Mr. Speaker, is highly the, the member for Warringah, a point of order? The amendment was a negation of the original motion. There is no point of order. Resume under, your seat. Under order resume, your seat. Please, resume your seat. Prime Minister has the call. And I Mr. remind Speaker. members of Standing Order 55 while I'm about it. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I made clear made, he made clear that he stands for a structural budget surplus. But when asked this week, on a, the first, one of the rare times he's been questioned on television, when the compare, Mr. Cassidy said it sounds as though it won't be on big program spent items. The government seems to be gleefully awaiting announcements of savage budget cuts into programs. That isn't going to happen. I think there's a lot of things. The government is gleefully awaiting that aren't going to happen, and he kept backing away from that point onwards, Mr. Speaker. Then he got asked. Order. Yeah, okay, we'll get to it. Order. The member for Gippsland Speaker, and the deputy he got asked leader. asked repeatedly at a press conference about whether he's, will you still commit yourself to a structural surplus after accounting for asset players? Well, I haven't seen the starting point. He said. Then he got uh, repeatedly asked the question. And then finally he said, but you, the questioner Order. said, but you talked about substantial public savings in the past. In July you mentioned substantial public savings. Let me say again, our commitment is that if we promise to spend money or forego revenue, 
We will say where the money is coming from. I have never said that we are going further than that. Yeah. In other words, Mr. Speaker, a complete denial of the fact that he intends to get a budget surplus, that he intends on using cuts in program spendings to get it. In fact, Mr. Speaker, at the end of, of uh, this year, after a year back as Leader of the Opposition, on fiscal policy, he stands for nothing. Exactly. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Mr. Speaker, then he says, Mr. Speaker, Order. that he has uh, he falls back to this question. He falls back to this stuff about overlap with the public, uh, public sector between the Commonwealth and the states. And Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd, I'll just tell him that the Department of Finance's assessment is that the total cost of administrative specific purpose payment savings is around 60 million or 0.33 of a percent of the total value of specific purpose payments. So, in other words, Mr. Speaker, by getting rid of the so-called overlap and duplication and administrative efficiencies, he's going to save 60 million. He's only got the balance of 11 billion to go to meet his deputy's target. A balance of 11 billion to go, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, that's that's. He's not going to, he said, change tax rates. He's not going to put up uh, tax, Order. Mr. Speaker. Order. Then he says, but he's not going to make big spending chance. cuts. In other words, Mr. Speaker, he's made himself so small a target. He stands for nothing at all. There is, there is no. He stands for nothing whatsoever in terms of the modern management of the Australian economy. Nothing whatsoever. Then take industrial relations, Mr. Speaker. He mentioned this in his uh, in his in his address. Take industrial relations. He said on so many occasions, I would like to see throughout Australia an industrial relations system that is largely similar to what the coalition government has implemented in Western Australia. I supported the IR laws that have already been enacted in Western Australia. Then he said earlier, in 1992, I feel very comfortable with IR Minister Goode's policy. I think it is an excellent policy. We have had a lot of discussions before it came out. We have had a lot of discussions before it came out. Give or take a comma here or there, the coalition's policy was the same as Victoria's, he said, at the National Press Club. The main thrust of Victorian legislation is on all fours with our approach. And after, of course, they introduced their policy, 400,000 Victorian workers transferred to the federal system. Mr Speaker, I've always been a passionate advocate of workplace contracts, he says. Uh, then he said, our proposals are not a mirror image of the New Zealand proposals, but they are in the same category. They are of the same type. Now, Mr Speaker, this is the, uh, this is the Leader of the Opposition who believes in radical labour market reform. This is the Leader of the Opposition who believes in no flexibility downwards, who believes in contracts without the Commission, uh, who believes in bargaining without a no disadvantage test who believes and is on the record over and over again of saying there is no place for the Arbitration Commission. Amongst other things, he said he would stab it in the stomach. He does not see a role. It's outside. He said, I am irrevocably committed to an enterprise approach with voluntary agreements outside the reach of the Industrial Relations Commission. No commission. Under our policy, the Act will be amended to prevent the Commission having any jurisdiction over these matters covered by voluntary agreements. He sees no arbiter in it. He sees flexibility down. He doesn't believe in compensation for penalty rates. He makes that very clear in a number of statements he's made about this. But what is he saying, Mr Order. Speaker? Order. What's he saying now? He's out there trying to say our policies are the same member as the government. Flinders and the member for Gippsland, we believe that there should be a no disadvantage test of some kind. We will have certain minima. We will have the commission. Uh, we will. Uh, now we will. We'll still have a role for the commission in all this, Mr. Speaker. Someone who's committed to savage cuts in the working uh, works of, uh, of all of all Australians, uh, who believe in all these things, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Those on my left. Uh, he believes in all these things, but now he's trying to say, Mr. Speaker. Now he's trying to say that I know he's really got a cuddly wuddly IR policy. He really believes it's the same as the government's. In other words, on the big thing he staked his whole career on, the great reform, as he calls it, of industrial relations, the importance of radical labour market reform, where is he? He's now trying to whimp away to uh, a policy which he's always regarded as wimpish, and that's, of course, the government's policy of protection for people who are disadvantaged and low paid. So on fiscal policy, Order. he stands for nothing. For Kennedy, on fiscal for policy, Mr Speaker, he stands for nothing. 
uh, on industrial relations policy. As the wait goes on, he's moving back nearer to the government's policy. And what I've said to the Australian people, don't believe him. Don't believe him. All he wants to do is to get into office and say, you know what the players are. You know who the Order. team is. You know what the player, who the players are. My left. You know what the team is. He said over time, having laid out an industrial relations policy over such a long period of time, is that if I win the election, nobody can deny I have a mandate to change industrial relations. So I say to the Australian people, don't believe him. He's weak and he's sneaky and don't believe him. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Order. he's weak and he's sneaky and don't believe him. Order. Now, Mr. Speaker, I promise this wait. I remind you again of standing order 55. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is the same person Member who said Medicare is a failure in his 87 policy document. We will end bulk billing, which produces a scandalous waste of money. Medicare, Order. Medicare is an administrative quagmire, quagmire, a financial monster, and a human nightmare. This is what he said about Medicare. In the fight back policy, he's changed. I warn include the member for Kennedy. Medicare for pensioners and cardholders only. Bulk billing abolished for Medicare except for welfare recipients, and that was only three years ago. And I warn the member for O'Connor. Mr. Quana. Speaker, here's his policy launch: allowing opting out of the Medicare arrangements, abolishing bulk billing. Medicare is a failure, he says in his 87 policy launch. Then he said, "We'll pull it right apart." The second thing we'll do is get rid of bulk billing. It's an absolute rot. Yes, he said, the best we can, we'll go completely back, but I'd love to go right back. Mr Speaker, and now he says he believes in Medicare. Now he believes in bulk billing. After all of these years, Mr Speaker, he's weak and sneaky and the public shouldn't believe him. Mr Speaker, on these big, on these big policies, Mr Speaker, Mr. Order. Speaker, you see, the problem Order. about John Howard, he's missed the whole message with the contract with America. At least Newt Gingrich put his program down and got his majority elected on it. You have Order. no program down. You are now walking away from your program, yet you want to claim a mandate on the basis of the fact you know the team and you know what they'll do. Not a mandate on what you're now saying, but what you've said in the past. And what you've said in the past is is that you'll make Member massive for cuts for government spending, you'll cut, the, you'll cut the heart out of Medicare and you'll cut the wages of working Australians as you push them back to individual contracts. So, Mr Speaker, this is where the great brave John Howard's finally ended up, a parliamentary and policy whip, trying to sneak his way through to polling day so the public won't notice that he's really got the same draconian policies he's Member always had, instead of standing up and saying, if I believe that we ought to have radical change in the labour market, and I'll stake my political career, career on it. He wants to get it by stealth. He wants to sneak there and take it from them, take them from them after he's elected to office. Instead of saying, "I don't believe in Medicare," "I don't believe in the concept of universality," and standing on it and seeing how he goes in the marketplace, he wants to pretend he supports it when he doesn't. And instead of saying that he actually Aston, doesn't believe the in the commission, that he doesn't believe in a no disadvantage test, that he doesn't believe in the no disadvantage test, that he, do, that he believes in flexibility upwards and outwards, but in reality flexibility down, instead of saying these things, knowing they will be unpalatable, he won't say them, and so he seeks to go to a poll without a mandate. He finishes the year having walked past the parliamentary press gallery of slipping and sliding with basically uh, slippery words through television and radio interviews over the year. He's come to the end Order. of the parliamentary year without Order. credibility, without integrity, without honesty and without a mandate. That's where, he, that's where he's finally ended up, Mr Speaker. And, and, and Mr Order. Speaker, what does he, how does he go out, how does he start his censure motion? Pointing to the members opposite, he says, won't be here after the election. I can do the same with the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven sitting members who are over there before the last election, who are not there now. Right. Mr. Hey, Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, after huffing and puffing to censure the government, what did he come up with? One of the weakest performances I've seen in a censure motion in all the years I've been here. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr. Speaker, I swear blind, I'll have to prop him up to keep him as an opponent before polling day. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'll have to put splints on him. 
I'll have to get the splints on him to keep him in the straight. Because I swear, Blind Mr Speaker, he's going to die on me. He, like, the last guy died on me in the last 10 days of the campaign. You know, uh, Labor's got to go. And I said, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Labor's got to go, sure. And we saw the big rally at the Circular Quay. And I thought, this is right in the bag, right in the bag. I said to my wife, this thing is one. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Speaker, Order. what we're seeing from what we're seeing now from this fellow is he won't even stand where Houston stood with some decent policy. Order. He wants to pretend he's got policies and then claim them out. He stands condemned in the terms the I Prime moved Minister's the amendment in. Has concluded. The honourable deputy leader of the opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, what a weak, boring, soporific, pathetic performance that was. Oh, no, those are my rights. There he was, sort of meandering the through Deputy his speech, Leader of the Opposition has the reminding call. one of, a, of an athlete coming down the straight with, with spindly legs turning over but not getting any distance. And we're watching the clock, wondering whether he'll make it to the finish line by the time the clock runs out. And this was supposed to be from the man who's got the next election won. And, and, and what was his big point? His big point was that the Leader of the Opposition stands for nothing, but if we're wrong about that, he's a vicious ideologue. <laughs> you know, the Leader of the Opposition's got no fiscal policy, but we've, we've counted up his fiscal policy and we can put it out at $11 billion. You know, They've got a secret policy to drive wages down, but just in case we're wrong about that, there's going to be a wages explosion. <laughs> you know, these are the lines, the tired old lines that he rattles out from a tired old Prime Minister. And, and what does he say? He said, oh, look, look, you're not like Newt Gringrich. That was his other one. Well, I remember you saying a few months ago that because the Pope wouldn't meet Newt Gingrich, the Pope was on your side in the next election. <laughs> Was I wrong about that? You know, I, I, I've got the reserve in one pocket and the treasury in the other and the Pope in the back pocket as well. You know, these are the monstrous delusions that you come out with. Monstrous delusions. And what it illustrates is that somebody that has been in power for so long has not only lost all grip on what's facing Australia and the problems that Australians are facing, but you've lost all grip of reality on yourself. On yourself. You know, and how does he finish it up? I said to my wife, we've won it. <laughs> we've won it. Prime Minister is sitting in his seat. Order. We won it. Oh. Order. Right. The Deputy Leader don't, has the Don't call. you worry about the McCarris pendulum. I said to my wife, we've won it. And what did she say? What did she say? Bad luck, I was looking forward to the job in Europe. <laughs> I think that's probably what she said. But you know, here's the Prime Minister who began his big censure speech by saying, oh, I guess I'd better take it. I guess I'd better take it. It's a, it's a real effort for you, isn't it, to actually come in here and take a censure and debate anything? You could, have had, you could have had an opportunity to come in here and debate on Thursday of last week. You could have debated here on Monday, but you scuttled out like a rat, like a rat out of the chamber. This is a Prime Minister alone, alone of the 24 Prime Ministers that Australia has had, who refuses to come into the House every day and answer questions, alone of all the 24 Prime Ministers that we've ever had in this country. This is a Prime Minister that has no respect for standards. This is a Prime Minister that describes the Senate as unrepresentative swill. This is a Prime Minister whose Prime Ministership was conceived in the deception of the Kirribilli conspiracy. This is, this is a Prime Minister who has used the privilege of this House to smear reputations around Australia and most recently to smear reputations of royal commissioners in Perth under privilege in this parliament to use expressions like cat's paw and hanging judge and lackey. This is a prime minister that is unable to discipline a minister who on every account cannot be trusted with the truth, as found on the sworn evidence of all of her former colleagues. 
This is a Prime Minister that presided over the forest fiasco and had this Parliament House blockaded for days on end. And I've got to say that was a pretty funny experience too, seeing the Zegna suit trying to walk through the blue ciglets. People that he hadn't seen for a very long period of time coming into work at 10.30 and 11 o'clock in the morning. The part-time Prime Minister who's presided over the ANL disaster. The ANL disaster, the shipping line that's going to be sold year after year and vetoed by the unions. This is a, this is a Prime Minister whose government's been enmeshed in the Civil Aviation Authority scandal. This is a government that was going to privatise the AIDC and rather than selling off the remaining shares, it now wants to buy them back. Rather than getting money in, it's now paying money out in relation to the AIDC. This is a Prime Minister who enmeshed himself in the Colesmeyer board who went out and attacked the superannuation funds of this country as donkeys and lemmings because he didn't like the— quite proper, was it? Quite proper. Okay, you are forcing people to put money under the management of donkeys and lemmings. Donkeys and lemmings. Quite right. Quite proper. Quite Member proper. for Northern Territory. You know, you've got a Member system where you Territory. are taking 9 per cent of employees' salaries from the employer and 3 per cent from employees, and who do you want to pass it over? to manage for 20 and 30 and 40 years, donkeys and lemmings, donkeys and lemmings, quite right, he said, one of the genii of the Labor backbench, quite right, he said. This is a government that's been protesting that it would do something about unfair breath. dismissal laws and has done nothing. And he stands up and he says, oh, but look at me in APEC, I was some modern day Metternich or Talleyrand, you know, Henry Keating, I was over there in Tokyo, it was all my work. The fact is the Prime Minister went off to APEC to lecture on the virtues of free trade at a time when you couldn't move anything in or out of Australia. <laughs> what do you think our APEC neighbours thought of that? Free trade with Australia when you can get nothing across a wharf. And, 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 and the whole dispute was going to be solved in, uh, by lunchtime. And here you had up at Weeper, as the Leader of the Opposition said, people who were working better for better pay. And this was a government that could not hold the line in relation to that, that got its orders, that couldn't solve the dispute. And in the ultimate humiliation, who is brought in to solve the dispute? Not the Prime Minister, not the lorry over there, who's the responsible Minister for Industrial Relations. We've got to bring back, you guessed it, Bob Hawke. And you know, it was a very good illustration to the people of Australia why they brought Bob Hawke, because the truth is this. This Prime Minister is great at dividing, but he can never heal. He can never heal. He is the great divider of Australian society. He has divided it between the rich and the poor. He has divided it with his rhetoric, and he is now dividing the Labor Party in his desperate attempts to try and close down all dissent opinion. And Jim Snow was absolutely right about that. Absolutely right. Well, Kim would agree with that. There used to be a strand of the Labor Party that represented blue-collar thought. <laughs> and represented blue-collar people, but there is no place in it in this modern Labor Party. The blue-collar has been replaced by the Zegna suit, and as a result you see people like Campbell, who did once represent a strand of Labor Party thinking, being told there is no place for them and no place for their views. And the Deputy Prime Minister himself, of course, absolutely humiliated in relation to that, at a conversation with Campbell assuring him he was going to be all right just before the phone call came, I've got to tell you, mate, your time's up. And, and if, you want to take, if you want to take an example as to what the situation is in relation to ministerial standards, this is a government which has the lowest ministerial standards of any government in Australian history. This Prime Minister stood up in this House of Representatives on the 28th of August and he said, quote, I insist that in the performance of their public duties, in their dealings with the public and in the parliament, ministers tell the truth and behave honestly at all times. That's what he said. I insist that in their dealings with the public and the parliament, ministers tell the truth and behave honestly at all times. But the fact is he doesn't. The fact is he doesn't insist on his ministers being honest. The fact is you have a case study which proves it conclusively. You have a Royal Commission which has made very clear findings. 
you have seen a you have seen a royal commission that gave the opportunity for every one of the former colleagues of the minister for health to come in and you have seen the royal commissioner make his finding that in relation to the evidence that was before him when dr lawrence denied she knew anything about the contents of the eastern petition on the morning of the 5th of november 1992 she did not tell the truth Kovacs, Willoughby, M, Sullivan, Estelle Blackburn, Marcel Anderson, seven cabinet members and Kabulki support that the briefings took place. This is the finding. It means that 14 persons, all of whom supported Dr Lawrence's government and or worked for it, contradict her claimed non-involvement and unawareness. Only one of those 14 witnesses needs to be believed to confirm the truth of the contradiction. The chance that each of these 14 persons fabricated their evidence is so remote as to be non-existent. That was the finding. So remote as to be non-existent. And even in relation to that commission, the original argument, of course, was that it was all some kind of fit out by the Liberal Party until it's and it was, was it? So let's just remind who the Liberal Party conspirators were. Kovacs, Willoughby, M. Sullivan, Estelle Blackburn, Marcel Anderson. Kabelki, McGinty, Ian Taylor. You know, we've been running both sides of politics in Western Australia. We, the Liberal Party, had a majority in the Lawrence Cabinet, I suppose. And the fact was that the evidence that damned her, the evidence that came to light, was Keith Wilson, a Labor minister, Pam Beggs. And when, of course, the Liberal conspiracy theory completely disappeared, we had a new theory. This time it was a Labor conspiracy, the Burke Squad. And we had the introduction of the Burke Squad as a reason why the Prime Minister could walk away from that assurance that he was going to insist on his ministers telling the truth. And of course the Burke Squad thesis would have you believe all of these people were somehow being manipulated out of prison by Brian Burke. They all went in and they gave fabricated evidence. But the truth is, as the Commissioner found, this minister could not tell the truth to the West Australian Parliament. She could not tell the truth to the National Press Club. She could not tell the truth when she was asked about it in this parliament. She could not tell the truth to the parliamentary press gallery. And any prime minister worth his salt, any prime minister with any decency and respect for standards in Australia would have taken the, the action which any previous prime minister would have done and would have dismissed her. But this is, in fact, a weak prime minister a weak Prime Minister who is, prepared, who is prepared to pull down the standards rather than enforce them. Whitlam had the guts to sack Connor, but this Prime Minister has never had the courage to deal with or discipline one minister. And it's that failure which is eating the heart out of standards in Australian public life, eating the heart out because we now know there are no standards. Any minister on that front bench of the Labor government knows that they can mislead the public, they can deceive, they can do it at the press club, they can do it at the House, and there will be no discipline whatsoever from the Prime Minister. This Prime Minister has effectively given a green light to all of his ministers in relation to their dealings with the public. And the awful truth is that this Prime Minister cannot discipline dishonesty without demanding his own commission. Because if this Prime Minister now started to insist, if he now started to insist that ministers deal honestly, where would that leave him? Where would that leave him? Where would that leave him in relation to the legislated income tax that cuts, the LAW, the cut tax cuts which are due to take effect on 1 January, in four weeks' time, on 1 January? The people of Australia who had legislated for them a $10 per week tax cut from 1 January and will not receive $1 for one day in relation to those tax cuts. And not only was it the income tax LAW that turned to an LIE, it was all of the other taxes as well. It was the 2 per cent increase in the wholesale sales tax, the wine tax, the company tax, all of those other taxes which show that the platform that you were given this three-year term was essentially fraudulent, a platform which you did not have any intention of introducing, which you have not introduced, and which, if you have your way, you will try and do again in relation to the next three-year term. The fact is that this is a government that has presided over a massive increase in foreign debt, an 800 per cent increase in foreign debt 
over the last 13 years. It is a government that has put Australia into recurring crises on its current account. It is a government which now is facing rising unemployment. And when you hear them talk about this wonderful period of economic growth, a wonderful period of economic growth which had as its high point a low of 8.2 per cent unemployment, and over the last four, years, four months, 8.2, 8.3, 8.5, 8.7, with more to come. This is a government that has lost sight of ministerial standards. It is a government which has tried and failed. It is a government which must meet the final finishing line and the verdict of the Australian people at the next election. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Well, that's a whinge from somebody dragged, yeah. kicking and screaming from the tarshal. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister that has presided over the most massive change in the regulatory environment in the Australian economy, opened us up to be at our most competitive Order. position internationally, presided as Treasurer and then Prime Minister over the creation of two and a quarter million jobs exactly. in this community at the rate of 160,000 a year in comparison to 55,000 a year when your now leader as Treasurer was in office. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister who has presided over an increase in the productivity of our workforce on an annual average rate of 2.9 per cent for the last five years, who has uh, done that in the face of our industrial, with our industrial relations system as opposed to that which you advocate from New Zealand, where the productivity increase there has been 1 per cent. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister that has presided over the creation of the superannuation opportunities for every worker in this country that has taken a position where there were 40 per cent covered by superannuation arrangements to now, where virtually the entire workforce is covered by superannuation arrangements. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister who presided over the healing process of Mabo exactly. in the native title legislation, exactly. if you are going to censure a Prime Minister who presided over the creation of the Working Nations Statement, that statement, which is now with programs acknowledged around the world as the correct way of tackling unemployment in a situation where massive technological change has produced circumstances where you require an enormous training effort by the government, if you are going to censure a Prime Minister that as Treasurer presided over the establishment of Medicare and universal health coverage for all Australians, with, a, uh, with you in solid opposition right the way through it, if you are going to censure a Prime Minister who has created a situation where pensioners in this country get 25 per cent of average weekly earnings, <coughs> if you are going to censure a Prime Minister who has presided over a substantial restructuring of our taxation system, taking the top rate down from 60 per cent to 47 per cent and, and moving middle income earners down from about 35 per cent to the mid-twenties, you have got to do an awful lot better than that. And above all, if you are going to do those things, one thing that you absolutely require absolutely require, and I'm glad to see you've all disappeared because you don't want to hear it, the one thing that you absolutely require is a policy. <laughs> Impossible. You actually need You actually need I've policy. said before it's hard enough controlling them on the floor without the there is, a, <laughs> there is a real problem as far as that is concerned. A few of us on this side of the house suspect you might actually have one. We have been Oh we do. We do. Yes, we know about Black yours. Spots. Yours is our policy on black spots. <laughs> we know about Tim's policy. And uh, we uh, and we know also about the industrial relations policy. Many people here will not comprehend this. But many people here ought to know, and many people, if there are any listening outside this place, ought to know this, that a week before the last election campaign, John Howard came out like one of those chaps that you occasionally, unfortunately, see around the marketplaces in a big great coat. He said, under this great coat, I have an industrial relations bill. It's all worked out. That industrial relations bill is there, ready to go. line by line, ready to go. The moment we get into office, a reasonable question was asked by the Prime Minister at that point of time. Uh, uh, could we see it? Uh, it's a week before an election campaign. The public might like to know what actually is in this bill. Oh, no. 
A fellow in leadership in the party is entitled to keep a little bit in his back pocket to be revealed afterwards. Well, it's three years. It's three years since then, and we just haven't seen that little bit of policy, which just happens to affect the livelihoods of every Australian, in potential at least, if you get into office. We get hints about what it might be like. When a chap turns up in Western Australia, now my home state's a long way away, and it's two hours behind in time, and you can occasionally hope that the journalists over here will take no notice of what you say over there. And you, uh, and you get over there and you talk to Richard Court, who's introduced a massive array of draconian legislation. And you say to Richard, now, Richard, we think that this is a, uh, a pretty good proposition that you've got here on the table, knocking workers out of a right to organise, putting them in the place where they have to get contracts, which will suppress their wages. We are going to take you as a model. Model. That's, right. That's what we That's say when we stand before West Australian business. What next the court proposes is our model, exactly. and uh, we will be putting that model in place when we get into office. Now, in Western Australia, it is the habit of these groups—nurses, teachers, senior public servants—I am afraid to say, in majority, to regularly vote Liberal. It's an unfortunate thing that I have to leave, live with in Western Australia, but it is the case. But in majority, not all of them, in majority they regularly vote Liberal. Right throughout the course of this year, every one of those groups has effectively been on, in some form of industrial action for months and months and months. You talk about shutting the water side. Uh, what happened in Western Australia was a series of bodgy contracts were put up with a bodgy stevedoring organisation. And what happened from that was a shutdown in Western Australia that did the state enormous damage, sent out, of course, to be investigated this particular Steve Adoring contract, and the poor civil servant who had to do that investigation came back. What was his conclusion? Well, that aspect of his conclusion that we were permitted to see, that aspect of his conclusion, was that a crook contract had been let. And so what happened after that, in this great industrial relations nirvana that the Liberals wanted to impose on the rest of Australia, was the state government took its bat and ball home. They stamped their foot and they said, all right, we won't put out another Steve Adoring contract. What we're going to do as we, as we march out of this place is shut down state ships. And now somebody said, well then, how are we actually going to keep the North West supplied? The old, the old National Party Minister raised his hand and said, how are we going to actually keep the old constituents supplied up north? Well, we hadn't thought of that. <coughs> that was a matter which hadn't struck us, not forcibly enough anyway at the time. So they've been scrambling ever since to try and put a contract in place that would do the job. Now, while we're on West Australian subjects, the Liberal Party said, or at least Mr Costello, before he vacated this place, uh, like a rocket the moment I got onto my feet, yeah, that's right. Mr Costello said to, of us, you suppose that we in the Liberal Party run both sides of politics in Western Australia? Now, actually, what we think you run in Western Australia is what Mr Filing says that you run. See, up the back there sits Mr Filing. He is the member for Moore. He has sitting next to him usually Mr Rocha, who is the member for Curtin. Have they had policy disagreements with their leader? Any policy disagreements with their leader? No. Have they been disloyal to their leader? The answer is no. They, in fact, were two of his strongest supporters when he became the leader of the opposition for the third time of asking in the course of this parliament. They were the leaders of his West Australian brood. This man of strength, this non-weak and sneaky man, could not protect in Western Australia his two strongest supporters. And from what? From what? Well, let me, let me now say who Mr Filing feels he fails to have been protected from. I could conclude but by saying that this episode, and what Mr Filing is analysing, is what he describes as organised crime. At the top positions in the Liberal Party in this area, which has produced from that organised crime two or three members of parliament in uh, Western Australia strongly supportive of the Bonner. other side. And he says this, I conclude by saying that this episode in the Liberal Party's history in Western Australia is one of the most darkest and most unsavoury ones. I must say that the Liberal Party is a great institution. It is a great party. It has a great history. Unfortunately, in the case of Western Australia, not just in the case of his electorate, in the case of Western Australia, its affairs have been dominated and taken over 
by a bunch of people who should be nowhere near public office. Yeah. They are a disgrace. And the sooner a proper open judicial inquiry identifies and sets in train the prosecution of those responsible for Wanneroo Inc., the better. The better. Exactly. Now, this is the state government, of course, that can find a load of public funds, five million dollars worth of public funds, to put the kibosh they hoped on a federal minister over here over affairs that have Member nothing to do, has nothing to do with her contemporary position here in this place and the way in which she administers authority. They can spend five million dollars on that, but can they spend a cent? on a proper judicial inquiry oh, no. into those sorts of things which judicial inquiries are classically conducted into, can they spend one cent on that? Not on your knell. Yeah. Not on your knell. A proper open judicial inquiry with the powers of a royal commission is not going on in Western Australia. And it is deliberately not going Member on in Western Honor. Australia because, as Mr Filing points out, as Mr Filing points out, the paper trail on those massive bribery scandals, Straight even mentioning in, case one, in the case of one particular individual, uh, a person subsequently involved in this process, subsequently serving six years in drug convictions in Western Australia. If you have you got that situation where with all of that, with all of that serious ongoing contemporary criminal and political issues not on your nelly, will the leader of the, leader of the government in Western Australia institute a proper inquiry on that? So when we just dismiss, as we do, the motivation, the terms of reference, the conduct, the intensely political conduct of that royal commission in, the West Australia, in Western Australia on Carmen Lawrence, when we just dismiss it, we do it on the basis of detailed, intimate knowledge, detailed, intimate knowledge courtesy of the Liberal Party of what its own affairs are in Western Australia, a most shameful organisation which has seen the dismissal of John Howard's two strongest supporters in Western Australia without so much as a whimper from the Leader of the Opposition. Not a whimper. Weak and sneaky, said the Prime Minister. Other people might have stronger terms to apply to somebody who has left his principal supporters in Western Australia in the lurch like the, uh, like the Leader of the Opposition has. It is no wonder that since the day he took over office, when he replaced the so-called Dream Team—you remember the Dream Team? For us. There was John Alexander Downer, Peter Costello—this was the new Liberal Party, new ideas, <coughs> as I have said on other occasions in this place, all jeans and prams out there telling the public around this country that the Liberal Party stood for new things and worthwhile things dead within eight months. Dead within eight months, the Liberal Party's one shot at renewal in the entirety of this parliament. What did they get back in? The old war horse. The bloke who has the hide leaving Australia with 11 per cent unemployment, 11 per cent inflation, has the hide to rock back into this place and say, please have a 24 hour memory, everybody and make me Prime Minister again. I have an 11 per cent inflation rate. The Prime Minister presides over one which has broken the back of inflation in this country, now lying at about 3 per cent, and that's as high as it's been for about five years. The, uh, the, with the Prime Minister presiding over that, he says he has the hide to be an alternative manager. He has the hide to criticise the level of unemployment now when it was 11 per cent when he left office. But that's not the story, really. The story on unemployment, of course, relates when you go to those statistics at the participation rate. Exactly. In the depths of the recession in this country, we had more people as a percentage of the working community in employment in the best year of John Howard's treasurership than in the best year. I don't mean that in absolute terms. I'm talking about that in relative terms. Of course, in absolute terms, there are two million more. But in relative terms, more than at the best point. Indeed, if now. We had John Howard's participation rates. We had John Howard's participation rates. The unemployment level would be three and a half percent. That would be the contemporary unemployment level. Why is it Member higher? Member O'Connor, I'm not because going we believe in equity in this country, and part of equity means that women can join the workforce. And when women join the workforce, they get supported. 
So we have, instead of 40,000 places in childcare, we've got 280,000, and we're headed to a promise several hundred thousand more than that yeah, yeah. at a very rapid rate. We have an ability, and again, to go back to those points I made earlier, you have the hide to preside over a prime minister who, is in, who has as treasurer and prime minister. You have a hide to try and censure a prime minister who introduced the greatest change in the Australian workforce, made it happen with decency, made it happen in circumstances when the children got properly looked after in that process, and you want to throw all that out for what? For what? A policy vacuum consigning a mound, confining, can hiding a mound of deceit. A mound of deceit which conceals a set of prejudices, not policies. Prejudices aimed at the ordinary Australian working man and woman. Order. You deserve dismissal and censure, and that's what the House is going to give you. Exactly. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Mr. Speaker, let me begin. Let me begin by quoting, Order. quoting a letter to Mike Kaiser, State Secretary of ALP in Brisbane. Order. Those on my right. Let me say, Mr. Speaker. Those on my right. This is a very interesting letter from Middle Australia. It's a very interesting letter from a blue-collar worker in central Queensland. And it's addressed to Mike Kaiser, and I quote for the benefit of the House. And it says, Dear Sir, I inform you of my resignation from the Labor Party, and do so because of the inability of your administrative committee to come to terms with what the ordinary people in remote areas want. It goes on to say, amongst other things, from the fallout after the last election, the ALP has been accused of not listening to people. This claim is valid. He goes on to add, these problems have to be addressed, not just in rhetoric or token gestures, but by a concerned, consultative process, from there to diagnostic determination and early enactment of sound policies. He ends by saying in this letter to Mike Kaiser, Queensland Secretary of the ALP, this, however, is the end of my predicament. And with all this said, I resign from the Labor Party. My name is to be taken off all records, mailing lists, etc. Former Labor member. Now, I'm not going to give you the benefit of a witch hunt of this person, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say that's just one of many letters that are coming to the coalition reflecting the true reaction from middle Australia who have had enough of this federal Labor government and have not had enough of the Queensland Labor government. And on the matter of policy, to answer the Deputy Prime Minister, it's a reasonable uh, thing that he, proposition that he put forward to the House. Let me tell the gallery, let me tell the House that I accept, absolutely, I accept absolutely the obligation to provide a policy comprehensiveness associated with the next election, to provide portfolio policies, and the Leader of the Opposition accepts that fully and they will be done, to provide a set of campaign initiatives to be properly released when the Prime Minister has the courage to give us an election date, and to provide and, in fact, build on policies already announced, which even the Deputy Prime Minister conceded has been done with regard to industrial relations. But I must say, here and now, what our policy will not do. It will not divide Australia and increase the gap between rich and poor. It will not add to high levels of unemployment particularly record levels of youth unemployment, over 47 per cent in the electors uh, Page and Richmond. It will not add to uh, rising inflation. We will not be about record net foreign debt. We will be about giving Australians a fair go, a legitimate job opportunity, and giving Australians a Prime Minister who will unite the nation rather than divide the nation. It is indeed, Mr Speaker, an absolute commitment that at the right time, and now the election is in 1996, we were absolutely right with this strategy, uh, at the right time and early on in 1996, those policies will be produced and will be able to be fully examined. And I must say, uh, Mr Speaker, the problem is irritating to the government, very irritating to the government. It is the right strategy because we want the people to have the opportunity in the election year to evaluate those policies and that we will do. But on the matter of comparisons, which we had from both the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister, we heard a list of names of members who uh, are not here today who were here in the last parliament. Well, can I put two more names down before this House? 
I happen to remember a certain Brian Cortis. Uh, he's not here in this parliament. He was in the last parliament. What's he been doing since? Collecting $300,000 of the taxpayers' funds pursuant to a series of job opportunities which are a disgrace when properly examined. And then that was paid for by the government. $300,000, nothing to do with superannuation, nothing to do with retrenchment pay. $300,000 plus has been paid to Brian Cordes, who the people of Hinkler decided to defeat at the last elections as then sitting ALP member, and quite properly replace him with Paul Neville, a National Party member for Hinkler. There's another name I just happen to have. Someone who was here last time, not here now. It's Rob Hulls. Remember him? I think he was a member for Kennedy. And he's been well replaced too by the member for Kennedy, Bob Catter. But guess where he's ended up? I mean, he hasn't left the public purse. He's decided to go down there to Victoria. He's had over $200,000 of taxpayers' money since the election. With regard, to, uh, with regard to his particular work job at this time, something to do with the Victorian opposition. So I want to say uh, to the House in loud and clear terms that we have reached a stage, a turning point in the life of this government. This government and this Prime Minister may well thumb his uh, finger at the House of Representatives last Thursday and again last Monday. This time he's decided to condescend and allow the censure motion to proceed. It is when a Prime Minister thinks himself above the procedures and proceedings of the House of Representatives in a Westminster uh, parliamentary democracy, then that is when the government is going to change. And that's what this Prime Minister has done in the course of this last fortnight, reached the zenith of his arrogance, and that comes before a fall. Because what we have indeed is shades of 1975. Shades of, and I saw Clyde Cameron wandering around the corridors earlier this week, but the division is now spilling out. We have members now attacking the Prime Minister over the matter of the member for Kalgoorlie. We have former Minister Senator Peter Walsh coming out and saying tonight it will be a kangaroo court here in Canberra, which will strip the member for Kalgoorlie of his pre-selection, and that the member for Kalgoorlie, currently a member of the government, should take litigation against his own party, against his own Prime Minister and against the pro proposal of the Prime Minister with regard to these matters. Well, it is a bitterly divided government. But interestingly enough, who has been left out of the loop on a number of key occasions during the course of these matters? None other than the Deputy Prime Minister. I mean, the Deputy Prime Minister was not told, and it's now publicly on the record, was not even consulted, notwithstanding he's a West Australian, in relation to the uh, stripping of the member for Kalgoorlie of his pre-selection. The Deputy Prime Minister was way out of the loop on that decision, and the Deputy Prime Minister was way out of the loop on another decision, and that was, you might remember, Don Russell, and bringing Don Russell back from Washington uh, to Canberra. And there he was, caught down at the National Press Club. I know nothing about this. I'm out of the loop yet again. It is a government which, after 13 years as a of hard labour, has now got a record of complacency, of arrogance, of division. It is a government which should now be rejected by the Australian people. It's a government which has created that record net foreign debt, $23 billion. $23 billion. That was what was on the Australian bank card when Keating first got the keys of the Treasury, when John Howard departed the Treasury, a net foreign debt of $23 billion. Today, what is that figure? A net foreign debt of $180 billion a seven-fold increase in the course of the last 13 years. It is a government which has given us that record youth unemployment and record overall unemployment, a record set of interest rates driving them up 20 per cent back there in the early 90s. We warned the government. We put the national interest first. We warned the government repeatedly. We are being driven into recession. And what did we get from the then uh, Treasurer, now Prime Minister? This is the recession we had to have. Forget about the heartache created by the bankruptcies. Forget about the heartache created by the agony conferred by that recession, leading right through to May of this year. And they've tried everything this year. You remember they tried a budget. They tried a Republican statement. They tried this document. Do you remember this document? Shaping of the Nation. It was launched by the Deputy Prime Minister. 
I mean, National Press Club, they even deferred it a week. Where did it go? It dropped without trace as, as well it might. But I have another document. This document. And this document says it all in a nutshell. It says, in fact, what the Prime Minister himself said on the 11th of May this year. And occasionally you, <coughs> Mr Speaker, listen to Brisbane Radio, I know, particularly in busy budget weeks. And it was two days after the budget that the Prime Minister went on Brisbane Radio. And speaking of small business, he said, this is as good as it gets. It will never get any better. And the heartache that that created for many of the small business operators uh, listening on that occasion and the ripple that put right across the nation was a legitimate reaction of total anger of a Prime Minister so out of touch that he had no idea in relation to what the real situation is at the coalface. And now the Treasurer will follow me and he will uh, dish out statistics and figures here in Canberra, quoting ABS, ABARE and the like. Well, I've got to say there is now a slippage, a gap and a lead time with regard to the official statistics. I don't suggest they're uh, in, in terms of their parameters, they are uh, correctness as far as they go. But you cannot just rely on those without getting out there and making a fundamental assessment of how things are so different in the standard of living and job opportunity of the 47 per cent of youth unemployed in Grafton, Lismore, Mwilumba, Coffs Harbour versus the youth unemployment right here in Canberra. In the small business closures and shopfront closures in Burke, Balranel, Baduri, Bullia and beyond, and indeed in the suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne versus what the situation might be here in Canberra. So it's time we got back to reality and that is what the approach of the coalition is. So let me just deal then with two other matters related to this area of microeconomic reform. And I have to say, Mr Speaker, we have a situation where we've been told and promised that the government has made great strides. The waterfront, the member for Hume has spelled out just how disastrous and high cost that is. But on the matter of aviation safety, just one little item. I mean, the minister went a whole year without once visiting the then CAA headquarters. The Minister for Transport, the Laurie of Lies, the Minister has in fact allowed a lot of slippage in that portfolio area. Right now, at great expense to the federal taxpayer, a massive inquiry is reaching its culmination, its conclusion, on the matter of the horrific <coughs> Sea View air accident between a New South Wales and Newcastle, a flight between Newcastle and Lord Howe Island that in fact crashed into the sea with a huge loss of life. That Seaview inquiry had terms of reference issued by the Minister for Transport on behalf of the government. That inquiry has taken thousands of hours, many witnesses, and is about to reach a final report. That inquiry is denied the right to give a determination of reason with regard to that air crash because the minister wants to cover up. It is a disgrace that he has truncated those terms of reference to prevent a full and comprehensive response on that particular aspect of aviation safety. It is a track record which builds on the mascot uh, saga and the disgraceful transition that we've had to the third runway and all that the Leader of the Opposition has correctly pointed out in that regard. So I want to say to her that the government has failed on the big issues and the government has failed on a lot of the small issues as well. But above all else, it has failed with regard to the accountability of senior ministers on the front bench here in the House of Representatives. And I can do no better than quote Pam Beggs, not a member of the Liberal Party, not a member of the National Party, but a former Labor minister, who earlier this week said with regard to Carmen Lawrence, and I quote, well, was Jim McGuinty motivated by an act of ven vengeance? He supported everything that I said prior to the Royal Commission in the Royal Commission. And so did several other ministers who were present at that cabinet meeting on the 2nd of November. So I mean, if they're going to start saying, if the Prime Minister is saying that there was the motivation, well then he's going to have to examine the motives of a lot of people. And I would say that that would just totally discredit his statements in the House. And I just find it amazing that he should say it. I was motivated by one thing, and one thing only, inter alia, with regard to Carmen Lawrence. And that was to protect somebody who was telling the truth from the malicious and vicious statements that were being put around. It is, uh, the questioner, Ross Solly, you are also, though, a close friend of Brian Burke's, weren't you? And listen to the reply of this former Labor minister with regard to Carmen Lawrence. The reply, I quote, I am a close friend of Brian Burke, and I had to go to the Royal Commission 
into WA Inc. I was never asked to lie for him, and I would never lie for anybody. And that doesn't change the fact I'm a close friend of Brian Burke. I've always also considered myself a friend of Carmen too. And I am not motivated by vengeance. I'm motivated by the truth. History records that Pam Beggs gave evidence that Carmen Lawrence's version of the situation with regard to the Eastern Petition was wrong, was false, was misleading, and seven other former Labor ministers backed up Carmen Lawrence. We now know the Prime Minister knew before the Royal Commission was set up that that was so. That is why the Prime Minister deserves the centre of the House this day for his reason of failing to stand up for Cabinet uh, standards and sacking the Minister Carmen Lawrence at the outset with regard to her disgraceful conduct. That is why this House should carry this censure motion today. This Prime Minister has had his turn. He's had his time. It's time for a change. It's time to make a difference and get this country back on the rails the sooner the better. The original question was the motion be agreed to, to which the Honourable Prime Minister has moved as amendment. All words after that be amended with view to substituting other words. The immediate question is the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, if this uh, debate is supposed to be a preview of the election campaign, I must say we're a shoo-in because the opposition has not laid a glove on us. Mr Speaker, this has been the most appalling effort by the opposition to censure a government uh, at the end of a uh, parliamentary period, uh, perhaps the end, and, and to say that, uh, that they are making any headway in this debate would be a travesty uh, of any uh, fair judgment of what's been occurring in the last uh, hour and a half. Mr Speaker, what we've been seeing uh, in the course of this debate is how bereft the opposition is, how totally bereft of any uh, policy, but also how totally bereft even of making uh, legitimate and fundamental criticisms. They simply haven't got the magnitude or the fortitude, the intelligence, whatever, to produce uh, substantive criticism. And of course, to take a motion on the basis of economic failure is itself an evidence of stupidity, because there is no way that they can show that this government has been an economic failure. How can you possibly argue that a government that's done far better than its predecessor government is an economic failure? How can you possibly argue that a government that's been doing much better than most other comparable countries in the Western world is an economic failure? How can you rationally argue such a point? You obviously can't. You can, it's just rhetoric and nonsense. It's just assertion. There is not a scrap, an element of, uh, su of substance behind that kind of allegation. And any fair-minded judge would say that that was the case. I can tell you that when I go to international conferences, people say to me, people in my position in other countries, how envious they are of our performance. How envious they are of the fact that we have growth such growth with low inflation and strong employment growth, and they wished it was occurring in their country. And of course, if you look at the records, the, the figures, there, it's all there for you. You can see that this government has done far better than most other countries in, the, in any period you'd like to go back during the period we've been in office. And certainly it's done far better than its predecessor government. And just bear in mind the facts I gave to the House the other day that if the growth rate of the previous government had continued, that is, in the time that the now leader of the opposition was treasurer, five and a quarter years, if that had continued for the next uh, period till now, then we'd have had 50, over $50 billion less of GDP than we have. And that's because we've had much higher growth rates than the John Howard uh, treasurership could produce. We've had 3.7 per cent per annum against his lousy 2.2. And that's it. We've got a much bigger economy. The size of Western Australia and more has been produced by the difference between our growth rates. And you say that's economic failure, particularly when it's been associated with three times the rate of growth of employment, three times producing an additional 1.3 million jobs over what we would have had had the previous government's employment trend continued. And, which, and of course, without that 1.3 million jobs, what would the unemployment rate be today? 23 per cent. 23 per cent. And it's because this government has uh, produced enormously strong job growth that, despite the fact there's been an increase in the participation rate, we have an unemployment rate around uh, a bit over 8 per cent. That without the increase in the participation rate, without the increase in the participation rate, it would be less than 4 per cent. Well, let me say, let me say we're Flinders. proud of the two million jobs. We're very proud of the 2.3 per cent job growth. Sure we're proud change. of the two million jobs. 
and it's, it's 1.3 million more jobs than were coming from the performance of the previous government. So we're proud of that, Mr. Speaker. And we're also proud of the fact that that growth has been associated with very low inflation at about half the rate of the previous government. Half the rate. And if we continue with their inflation rate, which was just on 10 per cent in the period that John Howard was Treasurer, those five and a quarter dreadful years, if we'd done that, then we'd have inflation price levels today 70 per cent higher than they are. 70 per cent. That's an indication of the enormity of the difference between the inflation performance of this government and the inflation performance of the government it replaced. Infinitely better in, in, inflation performance. And of course, even on foreign debt, John Howard presided over enormously rapid growth in foreign debt. 35 per cent per annum was his uh, foreign debt growth rate. And, uh, and if uh, the growth rate of foreign debt had continued like that, then we'd have uh, foreign debt today as a percentage of GDP at 186 per cent of GDP instead of just under 40 per cent. And yet they say, look at this terrible growth in foreign debt. He presided over a rate far greater than this government, and he produced, uh, if, he, if his uh, performance had continued, this nation would have been a total economic shambles. And of course, it's uh, to the credit of this government that those economic trends have not continued, that we've had far better economic performance, and that the nation, therefore, can look proudly to the rest of the world and say that, although, of course, it's not a perfect economy, it's not a perfect world, there are always uh, things that one can do better, but nevertheless, by the standards of the past, it's certainly much better, and particularly when you take account of the enormous restructuring that the previous government never had the guts to start, all the deregulation and microeconomic reform, which has given us great competitiveness, given us growth of manufacturing industry, given us a much more diversified uh, array of exports, given us a, a, a capacity to compete with the rest of the world, to relate to our Asian region economically but also politically, enable us to get APEC off the ground, enable us to uh, produce uh, what will eventually be the largest free trade grouping in the world. I mean, these are just enormous economic uh, substantive performances, and to suggest that that is economic failure it just defies any sense of credibility. As the Speaker, if looking more closely just at the last few years, we've had that growth of, uh, over the last uh, 17 quarters, a record performance. There's never been a time since there's been statistics uh, produced in this country for quarterly national accounts when we've had 17 quarters of continuous economic growth. Is that economic failure? How can that possibly be economic failure? It's been 17 per cent growth in 17 quarters, 1 per cent per quarter, 4 per cent per annum. A terrific growth rate by the standards of most Western countries, and a terrific growth rate almost twice what uh, Mr Howe was able to produce when he was Treasurer. And so you've had that good growth associated uh, with low inflation, the underlying rate under 2.5 per cent well, no higher than 2.5 per cent for almost all that time. Even with the national accounts that came out uh, uh, yesterday, we saw that the uh, private uh, consumption deflator, which is often looked at as a guide to inflation, 2.8 per cent after 17 quarters of strong growth. Of course, what we've made a great structural change on inflation. We've broken away from the John Howard uh, legacy of double-digit inflation and double-digit unemployment. We don't have anything remotely resembling that kind of disastrous outcome anymore. What we have is an economy that can grow and produce good jobs with low inflation and can do it quarter after quarter after quarter, year after year after year. And there is every reason to believe it can go on doing it. And if you don't believe me, believe the private sector forecasters. I think the Economist magazine has a, a table at the back which shows uh, the economic performance as assessed by private sector forecasters for 15 major uh, developed countries. And it says in 1995 that Australia's growth is, is expected to be the third highest of all those 15 countries. And in 1996, next year, it's expected to be the highest of any of those 15 countries. So we are not looking at some doom and gloom future. We're not looking at an economy that's sagging. We're not looking at an economy that's not, being, not able to grow in the future. It's expected by these private sector forecasters, not the government forecasters, that we're going to have growth in, in Australia in 1996, the highest in the Western world. 
That's, the forecast. That's what the private sector forecasters say. And yet we have a ridiculous motion about economic failure. I mean, it's, it just defies uh, any sense of uh, logic, Mr Speaker. Now, of course, we have an opposition which has been desperate for economic failure. It's been praying every week uh, since uh, we've been in office that, we'd have, they'd have economic, that the country would experience economic failure. And of course, every time there's good numbers, they feel terribly remorseful. They oh, are God, oh, we've got to deal with some more good numbers. And so, uh, what they uh, do is sort of find some element uh, to uh, complain about and forecast that it won't last. And they've been forecasting that it won't last year after year, uh, and it's still going on. We've had them. Remember, before the last election, we had John Hewson and John Howard both going around the country saying the country was facing a recession. Uh, a depression, a depression, and, uh, and Mr. Speaker, what have we had since the last election? We've had growth in employment of 620,000. Is that a, is that a depression? Is it recession? Is it uh, anything but a good economic outcome? And of course, we've had very strong growth uh, over all that period. And so the, for, the, the doom and gloom merchants that we hear from the other side have been just totally. Uh, uh, shown to be uh, without credibility, Mr. Speaker, with all those failed forecasts, and of course they're really wishful thinking. They just want to see economic failure because they think then oh, we'll have a chance of sliding under the wire. We'll, we'll sort of get into office because if there's some uh, some basis upon which the people can vote against the government. But the people of Australia cannot vote against the government on the basis of economic failure because there has been none. And, Mr Speaker, we see also a complete failure on the part of uh, the opposition to even uh, face up to the facts in areas where they think they've got a, a winner, like youth unemployment. And what they're saying about youth unemployment is 29 out of every 100 Australians who, young Australians who wants to get a job can't get one. What they don't say is that the numbers of young unemployed today are far less than they were when Mr Howard was uh, Treasurer. When he went out of office, the number of young people, this actual number of young people looking for full-time work and unemployed, was 158,000, and uh, today it's 95,000. 95,000, about uh, 60,000 less in actual numbers than it was uh, when Mr. Howard was treasurer. And Mr. Speaker, what that shows, I think, is uh, just the credible capacity of the opposition to distort uh, uh, the, the reality. I see they have a youth unemployment truck rolling around Canberra, and of course it just, has, just portrays this lie to the Australian people. Uh, Mr Speaker, I notice also that the Leader of the Opposition said today that, uh, we had, that, that Australia had the lowest average growth rate over a five-year period since uh, the 1960s and that this was uh, something that the Business Council had, uh, had uh, said today. Well, Mr. Speaker, all I can say is that I, I haven't been, seen the Business Council article. What I can say is that over the last four years, that we have four and a quarter years, those 17 quarters, we've had growth of 17 per cent, and in Mr. Howard's five and a quarter years as Treasurer, the economy grew by less than 12 per cent. So uh, if you will match our four and a quarter years against his five and a quarter years any time, and it's a far better performance in terms of economic growth. As the Speaker, what we've also seen from the opposition has been a total failure to, uh, to articulate a coherent economic policy, a complete incapacity to say what their policy actually is, certainly a complete you know, inability to criticise ours effectively, and of course the absurdity of saying they want tighter fiscal policy whilst voting against it all the time, whilst trying to block our measures in the Senate, whilst voting against $11.5 billion worth of fiscal tightening in the Senate and effectively blocking, with the support of the minor parties, $3.5 billion, whilst at the same time going around the country saying we need tighter fiscal policy. I mean, how can you regard any such organisation as having any substance when that's what they do? What they, what they do has no relationship to what they actually say. It is just a, a shambles of an opposition. How could anyone possibly think that this could be a group of people that could act effectively in government? You can't trust their word at all. If they believe in tighter fiscal policy, why don't they support it? But they've been voting uh, daily against it in the Senate just all this week and last week. We've seen occasion after occasion when, then, when that has happened. 
And of course, they're, they are totally incapable of articulating what their own policy is. They said in the headland speech of the Leader of the Opposition that uh, we needed to have uh, tighter public or greater public savings. And of course, that means net public savings. But now he's denying that that's what he really said. And yet the headland speech was supposed to be the great economic policy, the answer to the current account problem. Uh, if anyone asks him about that, he says, go and see my headland speech. The headland speech has an economic policy about one substantive item, and that is uh, to uh, increase public savings and, of course, uh, the Audit Commission, which is where he might get some savings from to pay for the billions of dollars of promises that he's making and uh, without any idea of how he's going to fund them. If he is going to fund them, it would have to be through this Audit Commission. The Audit Commission has been a device used by Liberal governments around Australia, state Liberal governments, to delude the Australian people into, into thinking that uh, they, they can get some nice, easy expenditure cuts. After the Audit Commissions have uh, reported, we have seen very substantial cuts in expenditure, and in Victoria we have seen enormous cuts—300 schools closed uh, by the Kennett government. We have seen the massive withdrawal of, funds, uh, withdrawal of funds by the Victorian government on hospitals of 22 per cent in real terms, the whilst this government has been pumping in additional money. Time has expired. The question is, the amendment be agreed to? The Honourable Deputy Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A uh, recent edition of the Bulletin uh, carries a, an interesting article which gives a lie to some of what we've just heard and uh, justifies uh, the very concerns which underline our putting forward this uh, essential motion today, now amended, of course, by the Prime Minister seeking a way around it. But the article uh, says some interesting things, although I can't help noticing as a precursor to that uh, that, uh, that uh, we have a picture here of uh, the Prime Minister. Keating. Keating, it says underneath, watched by an admirer. And the admirer is Keating himself in a, in a poster headed uh, Paul Keating. But the article reads in part, and I quote, underlying Mr Keating's problems is a resurgence of some old economic demons. Having got out of recession and into a period of low inflation before most of the rich world, Australia is now seeing prices rise again. Consumer prices are rising at an annual rate of 5.1 per cent, the highest for five years. Underlying inflation has hit 3.1, breaking the target of 2 to 3 per cent set by, set by the central bank. The latest figures also show unemployment starting to rise again to 8.7 per cent. It goes on to say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a recent report from the Bureau of Industry Economics, a government body, has also undermined the government's claim that 12 years of deregulation and labour market reform have transformed Australia. Now, we've just heard all of that rerun in this place. We've got it right, they say. And I'll come to an example of that in a moment. We've got it all fixed up under our industrial relations policies. We're doing dramatically better. Yesterday it was better than some other country. I think it was New Zealand. But usually it's better than we've done historically. Now that's always done deliberately. We're coming off a pretty low base. But more importantly for the government, it ignores the far more important, the far more significant uh, criteria or comparison, if you like, that of how we are doing vis-à-vis -vis our competitors abroad. And we are a trading nation. We do have to be efficient. It's not our past performance that we have to match or better. It's the performance of those that compete against us. And the Prime Minister talks endlessly about our role uh, in this new, the largest ever free trade negotiation or uh, scenario ever been negotiated, that he personally, of course, as masterminded, is putting into place, will ensure succeeds. And yet the reality is that one of the greatest obstacles to that succeeding will be our domestic competitiveness. If you can't compete at home, what hope have you got competing abroad? And you know, to quote again, to continue from this, uh, the Bureau of Industry Economics body, or a, a, a government body, has undermined the government's claim that 12 years of deregulation and labour market reform have transformed Australia. The report compared Australian energy, transport and related industries with those of foreign competitors. It found that Australia approached the best practice in only two. Only two, Mr Deputy Speaker, and they were uh, road freight and coal handling at ports. And coal handling at ports had nothing to do with your mob, and road freight didn't either. In fact, you've done your best to cripple that sector. In aviation and waterfront, it goes on, waterfront container handling, it has actually become less efficient while the rest of the world has moved ahead. Australia's docks are among the slowest to move containers, 
which often hang around for more than 40 hours before being shifted. And I heard just the other day from, a, from an export company, uh, Agricultural Exports, high value added, a company that has absolutely given up. It's given up because they are so sick to death of uh, container loads of valuable agricultural product, perishables, being left lying around when they're supposed to get out to Asian destinations, mainly Japan, promptly. They don't get there. Product left lying around in the heat to the point where it becomes unsaleable. They have given up when in reality they have enough product to send a container load a day, a day, 365 a year to Asia. Capacity to earn enormous con uh, foreign exchange for a country in desperate need of just that. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me come to another industry that's hot on, uh, on the agenda today, forestry. Now, forestry is an area where uh, you know, you've got a classic example of failure on the part of the government, who now accuses us of being unable to hold a line and to communicate a line and then to stick with it. The government on this one has been utterly appalling. There is no excuse, and no excuse whatsoever, for their incapacity in recent years to do anything other than to pander to whatever opportunism might best present itself as most useful at any given time. Forestry is a vital industry. That was actually acknowledged in here today. And yet how often have we hear, heard the government fail to openly and honestly explain the fact that in this particular case Australia is amongst the most fortunate people in the world. Australians are amongst the most fortunate people in the world. We can have our cake and eat it too. We can have a magnificent conservation reserve system equal to or better than any other in the Western world, any other in the world, at the same time as we can have a sustainable, ecologically sound timber industry employing people, contributing to our economic well-being and offering a great deal of job opportunities for future generations. That message has never got across. Why? Because this is the government that believes in political opportunism. It believes in telling whoever it thinks it might need in terms of votes at the next election, whatever it is that they want to hear so that they can be offered the comfort necessary to get over the line. It never lasts, of course. They never deliver. Consequently, nobody's ever happy, and the government's ended up in an appalling mess, which it now is belatedly trying to address with what I think was its seventh forestry statement today as a precursor to the detail which we supposedly see tomorrow. But what has been the result of this policy inertia? What has it actually done? What has it achieved for this country? This year we will import something like $3 billion in other people's forest and paper products. Three billion dollars. We'll export less than one billion, a deficit of about two, two billion dollars and growing rapidly. It is an appalling outcome and those, uh, those who often uh, sound so self-righteous on this might stop, might stop and consider, might stop and consider where that imported paper and timber product comes from. Might stop and think about Australia's international obligations to ensure that no, it's not just us who are managing our forests properly, but that other people are as well. Now, part of the reason we've got this massive deficit in a, small, in a country like ours with a small population, with a lot of agricultural land where we could be growing plantation timber and value adding and so forth, part of the, 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 the explanation for this scenario, of course, is that uh, we export low value wood chips. Wood chips are basically low value. We bring them back, you know, we export them for a couple of hundred dollars a tonne. We bring them back in for eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars a tonne as paper. What absolute absurdity. What have you done about it? Sat on your hands. You accuse us of failing to deliver a policy line and then stick to it. Where have you been on this? Your record is a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. The frightening thing is that, of course, the projections show quite clearly that unless we do something about this, it will get much worse. Why will it get much worse? No one's going to invest. That's why. There's a couple of billion dollars, if we can believe the financial experts in this country, on hold in terms of the, the investment in value adding of Australian timber product in this country, because nobody is brave enough in the current climate to go ahead and make it all happen. Now, what happens if that, far, that investment goes somewhere else? What happens if it isn't made here? What happens if, uh, if we don't secure those opportunities for this country? Quite obviously, our deficit continues to grow. The 70,000 people that we've got employed in forestry today continues to shrink. If, on the other hand, we actually do something, even belatedly, 
even now, about this issue, the opportunities are enormously exciting. A recent report showed that uh, with the right opportunities, including more hardwood plantations, environmentally friendly pulp mills and other value adding, Australia's current uh, nearly $2 billion a year deficit in forest products could be turned into a 413 million surplus within five years and a 6.5 uh, 6 billion annual surplus by the year 2030. What's more, the job opportunities will see employment rise from around 70,000 at the moment to over 200,000. Is there anyone in this House, anyone in this nation, who believes that those opportunities can afford to be missed by this country? Is there anyone? And what has the government done? It is only now that we see some action. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I come to another issue, this, and this is the question of parliamentary standards and respect for this the people's institution. And, you know, a fundamental po uh, point has been highlighted again this week by the Prime Minister's refusal to sack his health minister in the wake of the Mark's Royal Commission, and that is that this man has absolutely no regard for the elementary proprieties of our democratic system. He treats the parliament and, therefore, by extension, the Australian people with contempt, with absolute contempt, and his arrogance is nothing short of an insult to the Australian people. That is the bottom line. Not since Gough Whitlam paraded this place have we been saddled with a Prime Minister who so totally thumbs his nose at parliamentary conventions. And, you know, the frightening aspect of this is that it is having a very serious effect, a corrosive effect, as a, as a journalist put it in this country recently, out there in the broader Australian community. Because what is happening is that that, that endearing quality of the Australian people to treat, if you like, uh, their leaders and their public institutions with a, with a degree of scepticism is changing. It is now rolling over into a hostile and open cynicism, a corrosive and hostile and open cynicism. And I often talk to school groups, and I never seek to politicise my conversations with them in any way, but I ask them in good faith when I have school kids, stick your paw in the air. If, you heard, if you've heard your mums and dads say that they lack faith now in our parliamentary institutions, if they think the politicians make a mess of it and they think behaviour in this place is no good, and you know what invariably happens, Mr Deputy Speaker? The whole lot of them put their hands up. The whole lot of them put their hands up. And they say, put your hands down. How many of you think that we ought to be doing a better job of it? And uh, they almost invariably always put their hands up again. That is a very frightening thing. Not only is it reflecting the fact that the current voters are openly hostile and cynical about what we're doing, it's a clear indication that the next generation will as well, unless we do something about it. And there's no doubt about it that the prime driver in recent years of that hostility and that cynicism and that distrust is the man who currently occupies the lodge. And for that reason, that reason alone is sufficient to mean that those who have governed over there for 13 years must go at the next election. A parliamentary democracy is dependent upon faith and trust between the elected and the electors. And if you go beyond the certain point, if you corrode that relationship excessively, then you bring the whole thing undone. The whole great blessing, if you like, of parliamentary democracy starts to unravel. And I'm delighted to see journalists starting to draw some attention to this in recent days. And I do like that word corrosive. It describes it well. And we are well warned. The Australian people, I believe, will act on that as soon as they're given the opportunity. And that ought to be as soon as possible. But then we, let's just return to this issue of the Marx Royal Commission again. We had a total of 14 people testifying there to the effect that the recollection of the events uh, relating to the table of a petition in the Western Australian Parliament concerning Penny Easton in 1992 by Carmen Lawrence were not accurate. But they were not accurate. And no fewer than eight of those people were former state cabinet ministers in Carmen Lawrence's government. Now that's extraordinary, Mr Deputy Speaker, to be dumped on by eight of your own former cabinet colleagues. The law of averages says there has to be a greater chance that these people are right and that Dr Lawrence is wrong. That's what the Commissioner concluded. He found that Dr Lawrence had not told the truth about the extent of her knowledge of the petition before it was tabled. Now, the logical and unequivocal, unavoidable consequences of such a finding, according to all accepted parliamentary standards, 
should be for Carmen Lawrence to offer her resignation, or if she fails to do so, for the Prime Minister to sack her. But it hasn't happened. Under this administration, such proprieties are simply not respected. Carmen Lawrence did not offer her ex resignation. The Prime Minister did not seek it, and the Prime Minister didn't sack her, even though the Western Australian opposition leader, Mr McGinnity, person Kinty, personally told the Prime Minister six months ago that Dr Lawrence's recollection of events was wrong. We still get no action. We still get no action, even though the Prime Minister knew six months ago that his health minister was not being Probably accurate in her reflection of the truth. He knew because he'd been told by Jim McGuinty. He knew. Even back then, he should have demanded that she stand down. But no, nothing of the sort. And so this question of standards <laughs> has now become so important that the Australian people cannot ignore it. This is their house. This is their uh, institution. And here we're seeing this sort of story, the incredible shrinking house. The fact is that the parliament is prevailed over by a man who has so demeaned not only his own position but that of the office that he occupies that this country must have a change in order that people's faith can be rebuilt, in order that we can cooperate together as one people under a government designed, uh, concerned and determined to pull them together as one people instead of ruling as this man does whilst he talks about us as one Australians by the old order. and nasty trick order. of order. The hon. Member's time has expired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Minister for Transport and Industrial Regulations. Mr Acting Speaker, I'm pleased, to participate, I'm pleased to participate in this debate and the government's censure motion against the Leader of the Opposition. A Leader of the Opposition, I can say, who's diminished by the day this year, diminished almost every day since he became Leader of the Opposition, and who has diminished by the minute during this miserable performance that he's put on today. Mr Speaker, this this is an opposition leader who, in 1995, has set out to disown everything he's ever stood for, who has gone back on every commitment he's given the Australian people for 20 years, and who thinks he can slink into office by disowning all of his own principles. Mr. Mr. Sp Acting Speaker, it doesn't matter which area you look at. It doesn't matter whether it's industrial relations reform. The industrial relations reform that he held out <coughs> as being the most important single challenge facing modern Australia and facing contemporary politicians. It doesn't matter whether it's a question of Asian immigration or whether it's a question of his views on the monarchy or whether it's his views on cutting government expenditure or whether it's his views on slashing Medicare. In each and every one of these areas, we've seen the backflip after backflip. We've seen him back away from every single principle he's ever enunciated over 20-odd years in this parliament. Mr. Speaker, and if there's one fundamental reason why he'll never, why he'll never be the leader of, of Australia, it's the fact that he's shown absolutely that he's not up to the job, not big enough, not, not big enough, not big enough for the job, not able to stand for principle, and not able to mark out a clear ground in Australian politics. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to take part in this debate and to draw attention to the to the deceitful manner in which the leader of the opposition has 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 sought to have Australian workers believe that they will not be any worse off under a Howard government. He, he, has set out, he has set out, with the able assistance, I might say, of the member for Flinders, to pull the wool over the eyes of the Australian electorate in a pretense, by borrowing the government's rhetoric about no disadvantage tests, that they will not be worse off. And he pretends, at every turn, that the opposition's no disadvantage test is uh, really a rough equivalent of the government's no disadvantage test when all the time their no disadvantage test of course is not against the existing circumstances of the worker not against the total award entitlements of the worker but against an unspecified list of minima being dribbled out by the member for flinders the last one dribbled out i might say equal pay for work of equal value something that's been entrenched in the australian workplace for more than 20 years and people are now supposed to sit back and say isn't it wonderful They've given us this marvellous, generous concession. One of the minima is actually going to be equal pay for work of equal value. But wait for it. When it comes to CRA, when it comes to practice over the last two weeks, what do they propose to do there? No, there's no support for the union movement in their call for equal, equal pay for work of equal value. What they propose to do is to rip order, order the minister on a point of order. I've been counting the interjections across the table from the member for Flinders. When, I've, when I got up to 25, I wonder if you could protect the minister at the table from this, 
this, this oh, no. lazy interjection. Oh, I thank the honourable minister. That the Mr. minister has the call, and the minister Mr. should be heard in Mr. silence. Mr. Let, Mr. Speaker, let me say nowhere more so than in the area of industrial relations and transport do you see illustrated in the in the greatest possible fashion the deception, the absolute deceit of the leader of the opposition, and no more so in this area of the no disadvantage test, where day after day the member for Flinders and the leader of the opposition are trying to deceive Australian workers into thinking they'll be protected, when all the time. They know that under their policy, any worker changing employment will face the contract or not get the job. And that's been the situation at CRA for the past two years. I might say a situation at CRA that's been addressed by the Industrial Relations Commission using powers provided under the Industrial Relations Reform Act, powers of compulsory arbitration to force the parties to the table to see a return to work to see an end to the national maritime dispute, to see an end to the national coal dispute, and to see already awarded an 18 months backdated 8 per cent pay increase to the workers who have been so badly disadvantaged as a result of the policies promoted by CRA, the sort of policies that the opposition would see the length and breadth of the Australian workforce. Mr Speaker, there is no way that these people can pull the wool over the eyes of the Australian electorate as far as the no disadvantage test is concerned. Because Australian workers love their awards, and rightly so. They know that the fundamental protection of the award system is at the very heart and the very soul of what is necessary for them to have guaranteed security, not only for themselves, but for their wives or husbands, as the case may be, and for their whole families. And this opposition that pretend to talk about the values of the family, what would they do in opposition? rip away the single most important provision, that is the guaranteed protection of an award safety net to provide absolute protection, <coughs> protection enforced by the Industrial Relations Commission through the application of a strict no disadvantage test. Mr Speaker, the other thing that the opposition leader should be condemned for is this miserable effort of his of, tr of trying to disguise his absolute intentions in this respect. Because, of course, day after day he turns up, says one thing, and then immediately backs away from it. He turns up uh, uh, on radio this week and says, to be an effective reformer, you've got to be a practical reformer. You've got to understand the mood and the temper of the community and the temper of our people. Of course, what this is is simply hiding the true intention. It's trying to skate into office on the basis of a blatant, bare-faced lie. That's what it's all about. And, and of course, and, and of course, oh. when you test them in these Order. areas, if, if that comment was attested to an honourable member, it should be withdrawn. Yeah, well, it, I, I, I withdraw it accordingly, Mr. Speaker. We saw it best of all illustrated well, in. I've withdrawn it. Order. The honourable member Flynn is on a point of order. Yeah, well, the minister has also accused the leader of the opposition of deceit, and uh, given that we're now now, now that we're upholding now that we're uphold, no 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 now that we're upholding standards, Mr. Speaker, then I invite you to also require that. Uh, that allegation to also be withdrawn. Lord, I've, no, I've that's asked, fair enough. That, no, no, Lord, no. The, un, the honourable member of the said, I've asked the, the minister to withdraw the word lie, and that is as far as I intend to go at this stage. The honourable Mr. Minister, Speaker, this is the leader. This is the leader of the opposition, who two months after Graham Kirith had announced his second wave of legislation in Western Australia, went out there and said, "Terrific, wonderful, our very template," he said. This will be our model, and we all remember the headlines in the West Australian newspapers. Howard WA is our model, and of course, Order. the honourable mem member for Flinders will withdraw. He knows that he can't get away with that, even by way of interjection. Well, of course, I withdraw. The minister, Mr. Mr. Speaker, this, 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 this is the second. This is Order. the second the honourable member for Flinders will cease interjecting. The most reactionary piece of politics in the industrial relations arena ever introduced in the history of this country. A piece of legislation that would have wrecked, wrecked bedlam as far as IR in, in Western Australia was concerned. A piece of legislation that would prevent a worker from having a stop work on the basis of an occupational health and safety issue, exactly. which would outlaw and in its original exactly. form would have seen trade union leaders potentially having their goods and chattels, having their houses confiscated on the basis of, 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 penalties, of penalties provided in the, in the instance of encouraging workers to go on strike. Mr Speaker, and of course it was withdrawn. And the opposition said, oh, we, don't, we didn't endorse the second wave. We never endorsed the second wave. We were only for the first wave. But when you look at the first wave, what have you got? I'll tell you what you've got. You've got to take the contracts or you don't get the job. You've got a miserable minima of $301 per week in Western Australia. That's the first wave. That's what you've endorsed. 
And that was a wage, of course, which would have been higher but for the fact that the Western Australian IR Minister, Graham Keirith, intervened and knocked over the decision of the West Australian Industrial Relations Commission. And, of course, what have you got in Western Australia? No, no disadvantage test whatsoever. No, no, safety, That's, net. no safety net. And that, that of course, and that, of course, is the first wave that they say they're endorsing, the first wave that they're very proud, even today, to say is a very good thing for Western Australia. The first wave that's seen nurses paid $5,000 per year less when they change employment because they lose all of the protections of the award system. Mr Speaker, let me, let me, say, let me say this. When you turn to the other area of my administration, transport, you see, you, you, you see again the bare-faced deceit of the Leader of the Opposition, a Leader of the Opposition who would deceive the electors of Sydney into thinking that they're going to get some relief from aircraft noise, who day after day has said all he wants to do is share the burden. All he wants to do is see the noise spread over a wider area of Sydney, when all the time all he really wants to do is prop up his personal support in Benelong prop up his own votes to save his own miserable electoral skin. And of course, <coughs> in the process, absolute and utter dishonesty as far as his true intentions or the effect of those intentions, because the reality in this area is very, very simple and it's very, very sweet. He is saying, and indeed the Senate committee majority today said, that they would leave it to Air Services Australia to determine what the flight paths in and out of Sydney Airport would be. And I might say that's a big change from what they were saying up until a few days ago, when they were saying one of their first acts in office would be the reopening of the east-west runway. But this week we've seen the Senate committee, the majority committee chaired by the shadow minister for aviation, say we're going to leave it to Air Services Australia. And of course, this is Air Services Australia, who not once, not twice, not thrice, but now four times have spelled out their view, have spelled it out in the clearest possible terms, spelled it out in their position papers. Each and every one of them. The Civil Aviation Authority, um, as far back as the 30th of November in 19, 1994, spelled out uh, again, I might say, uh, on the 3rd uh, of August uh, 1995, spelled out a third time on the 14th of August 1995, and spelled out a fourth time by Mr. Bill Pollard, the new Chief Executive of, uh, of Air Services Australia. Clearly stated that the Air Services Australia organisation believe that parallel runways give capacity and give safety. That's their view, and yet the opposition would seek to pull the wool over the eyes of the electors in Sydney, saying, elect us, and suddenly this noise burden will be lifted. And of course the opposite will be the case, because there's no doubt that if they had their way, the parallel runways, Air Services Australia have made it very clear, would receive more use, not less use. This isn't really a case of reopening the east-west runway. This is a case of takeoffs to the north on the new parallel runway. And of course, that's where Senator Pera had himself well and truly tripped out last Sunday and spent most of this week backing away from. But I've had the, I've had the advantage of asking Mr Bill Pollard of Air Services Australia what he believes would, he, he should do. I said, if you had the choice, and I had him in yesterday, I said, you're now the boss of this outfit. If you had the choice of reopening the east-west runway, or takeoffs to the north on runway 34 right, which would you choose? He said, well, undoubtedly. He said, we'd take 34 right, takeoffs to the north, exactly. because that would give us greater capacity and greater safety. safety. If right. we're going to have any change of oh, runway configuration, that's what we would do. That would give us 85 takeoffs and landings with optimum safety in each direction, irrespective of the wind. That's right. And of Do course, that's exactly what the door is left open for by Senator Pera's report brought down in the Senate today. It's not less noise, it's more noise. It's no protection from noise. And yet all the time the opposition say, oh no, trust us. We're just for sharing the noise burden over Sydney. You know, um, we're, and of course, what's been, what's been sacrificed on the way through, and this is the fourth point I want to make, the fourth point where the leader of the opposition has been absolutely derelict in his duty and has betrayed the interests of Sydney, has betrayed the interests of all Australian citizens, and that is the manner in which he used and abused his Senate numbers only this week to see the airport's bill, the bill to provide for the leasing of the airports, knocked over most viciously and maliciously in the Senate. A $2 billion hit on the budget, forward estimates, and at the very same time, the destruction of the chance of a completion 
of Badgerys Creek Airport in time for the year 2000 Olympics. That's what it means, because we all know the critical path, and we all know that we are right hard up against it. And I tell you, unlike the opposition, I've built a few things in my life. And I know what it takes to I know what it takes to build things. I'll tell you what it, I'll tell you what it takes to build. It takes to build things. It needs a darn lot. It needs a darn lot of momentum. And, and it needs some imperatives. And I might say and I might say we have had the momentum. Because in Badgerys Creek, during the time I've had responsibility for it, we've seen it drawn up from an eighteen hundred metre taxiway to a twenty nine hundred metre runway. We've seen the provisions made available for the funding of a terminal, of, of a control tower, of a general aviation facility, of firefighting facilities. We've seen it taken further and expanded to provide for the future development of a 4,000 metre runway. We've seen some $500 million committed to this purpose, and we've seen almost $500 million committed to building the road infrastructure to link that airport to Badgerys, Badgerys Creek to Sydney Airport. All told, almost a billion dollars worth of momentum that this government has built and built in the course of the last 18 months. And what have we seen? We've seen that destroyed by the decision of the opposition to block the airport leasing bills. And what, and what happens when you lose momentum on a great project like this? And when you lose the imperative? And have no doubt, when you have, have no doubt, the momentum and the, and the imperative was to get this thing done in time for the year 2000 Olympics, that has gone. That is destroyed, and in spite of all John Howard's preaching down through the years about microeconomic reform and the absolute essential nature of this development of parallel runways at Kingsford Smith Airport, today that has been thrown into a complete spin and destroyed as a result of those sitting opposite. Order. And if ever there was an example the that shows that they're expired. unfit to government, that is it writ Order. large. The Honourable Member for Flinders. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to uh, support the motion of censure moved by the Leader of the Opposition, uh, which in its first paragraph uh, censures the Prime Minister for his continued economic failure, which has created great uncertainty and burdens for families, individuals, young people, seniors, small businessmen and farmers. And I must say the performance we've just had from the Minister for Industrial Relations, the pathetic performance we've had from this Minister, is in fact one of the reasons that this government is a failure. I mean, he is the minister who you might remember was previously in the New South Wales Parliament. He was the minister in charge of the monorail. He was such a disaster as a minister that Barry Unsworth, when he was the Labor Premier of New South Wales, would not have him on his front bench because the people of Sydney knew what a complete and absolute failure he was. He is the minister in federal politics. They switched him out of New South Wales because they knew what a failure he was. They put him into federal politics. In federal politics, he's been the minister responsible for the fiasco at the third runway. He's the minister for ANL, Australian National Line, which is basically run by the unions, which has been one of the greatest loss-making enterprises in the history of the Commonwealth government. He's the minister uh, basically responsible for the system that has allowed Weeper to, 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 to happen, which has been one of the great humiliations for this government particularly when Bob Hawke was brought back by Bill Kelty to uh, solve the, the issue that the Prime Minister himself was unable to solve. The man who was uh, responsible for a lot of that is, of course, none other than the minister who's just spoken. And, of course, he's the same minister who's responsible for the failures of this government on the waterfront. The waterfront in Australia is an absolute disgrace, an absolute disgrace. Mr Deputy Speaker, did you know that today on the Australian waterfront we still have what's known as nick-off time. You know what nick-off time is? Nick-off time means that you are allocated as a wharfie to work certain hours, and yet the union organisers allow for you to take time off, not to turn up at work, in other words, but still to be paid for the time uh, that you're basically at home. In other words, you get paid even though you're not at work. It's called nick-off time. This minister is responsible for that system. Uh, on the Australian waterfront today, we have a system which requires every machine to be operated by at least two people. So if you have a forklift, for example, under the award, under the arrangements with the unions, which is endorsed by this government, yet you need one bloke to run the, drive the, uh, the uh, forklift truck, but under the system there must be another bloke standing side beside him, even though there is no job for that person to do. It is an absolute outrage. 
and these people are on 75 grand a year on average. This is the minister responsible for waterfront reform, and yet he has the gall to come in here, uh, as he did, and as both the, the treasurer and the minister for finance both started their contributions to this uh, debate and this censure, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by boasting about the government's economic success. The uh, treasurer said that people overseas looked at Australia and were envious of our growth. That's what he said. I mean, it's just a sick joke. A sick joke. And the Minister for Finance, uh, he uh, more generally boasted about Australia's economic performance. Now, quite frankly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, this is so obviously and easily contradicted by the evidence uh, that I could spend uh, a lot more time on it. But I just want to go to an independent source just to show you the extent of the problems in Australia. Now, we don't say that nothing has happened in the last 15 years. And I don't mind saying that there have been some things that the government's been do that has done that it's done by way of economic reform, which has been beneficial. But the real question is, have they done enough? Now, this is a report by McKinsey's. Uh, you know, it's the world uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, international uh, economic uh, consultants, management consultants. This is a report they've put out today. I'll just read the first uh, few, few uh, first paragraph. It says. The Australian economy has undergone, undergone significant and extensive reform in the last 15 years. Major government-led changes have transformed its financial system, business regulations and industrial relations environment, and reduced trade protection. There's also been much change in business practices and in the relationship between employers, employees and unions. Yet despite these efforts, Australia's relative economic prosperity has not changed since 1970. Its GDP, that's our national production, per capita, is 30 per cent behind the best performing country, the United States. Most of this gap is due to lower labour productivity and the remainder to lower employment per capita. In other words, the difference between us and the United States, which is a far better and far more efficient economy than ours, uh, the difference between us is put down to two things by McKinsey's, the uh, international uh, consultants. One is that we basically we have a much higher unemployment position, so therefore a lot of our people aren't working, so we're falling behind on that score. And the second is that we have very poor a very poor productivity performance. And the, if you look at it, if you look at it, it's that poor productivity performance across the Australian economy. Uh, yeah, well, this is this. Well, can I just respond to that? I mean, that is the sort of smart aleck comment we have from a minister who basically could not care less that we have 29 or 30 per cent of our young people who are unemployed. Uh, no, that is a fact, Minister. I mean, you, you, you come from a family with an interest in public service, but you ought to, in your private moments, acknowledge that economic management in the last 13 years has been an absolute Order. failure, an absolute and dismal failure. And if you look at the—you you say, tell the truth. You look at what some of the things that last minister said, which are patently not true. And let me just demonstrate a couple of them. He said, oh, look, under the coalition, you'll face the contract or not get a job. And then he said, but that's been the case for the last two years at Weeper. I mean, what a nonk, what a drongo. I mean, that is the situation well, under uh, Labor today. I don't think that's that, is, that is the position. That is the position under the Labor Party today. That is your law today. I mean, to be attacking the coalition over what is your policy is just incredible. He then says that we will remove protection. Labor gives a guarantee of security. Well, I say to uh, those listening, what does Labor's guarantee of security actually mean? What does it mean for those 28 or 29 per cent of young people who are unemployed? What sort of guarantee do you give them, Minister? I mean, it's a sickening hypocrisy to talk about us reducing people's wages. What has happened in the last 13 years? Well, if you look at the official statistics, average weekly earnings uh, in their totality have actually declined under you people. Now, you go down to the Industrial Relations Commission and you support every wage increase for the last 13 years. And what has happened? What has happened? Those wage gains have been lost through, the, through inflation, principally. And as a result, people are actually worse off under you. So much for your guarantee. I mean, one, if you're lucky enough to have a job. But even if you do have a job, the truth of the matter is people have been falling backwards. 
And he also said uh, another uh, blatant untruth. He said Western Australia is our template in respect to the, uh, the second wave. I mean, that is just a joke. I mean, I don't mind debating these issues, but why not at least sort of debate them on the basis of what has actually been said, Ra rather, rather than just, well, he didn't say. He did. Look, oh, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't respond to your silly interjections, but it just, shows you, but it just shows you the poverty there is on that side when it comes to you know, some substantial debate. And he also said in respect of, he said in respect of Western Australia, he said that Western Australia has no, he said that Western Australia has no safety net. Now that is just not true. That is, ba that is basically not true. And okay, the interjection is in respect to the minimum wage in, in Western Australia. Well, the very interesting thing about the minimum wage in Western Australia is that the Western Australian state Order. minimum wage actually is member higher, Pelley, is actually higher than, a, than a number of federal awards operating in Western Australia. And as the Glimmer twin is from Queensland, it is, of course, also higher than the minimum wage set by the state-based arbitral tribunal for the southeastern division of Queensland. Now, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. On economic performance alone, this government deserves to be censured. And when we get to the next election, it won't be a referendum on our industrial relations policy, as claimed by the Prime Minister the other night. What the next election should be is a referendum on Labor's economic mismanagement. And if people focus on, those, uh, on that very simple basic issue, then there's no doubt what the result will be. They will be thrown out. But they should also be uh, censured, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, on the basis of the Prime Minister's failure to sack the Minister for Human Services and Health. This must be one of the most open and shut cases I have seen of uh, a minister failing to match appropriate standards. And to support my case, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to refer to some of the remarks of Commissioner Marx, uh, who has examined the minister's conduct in the Eastern Affair. Now, let me just uh, go to one aspect of his report, which uh, was, in a sense, unrelated to the petition, because it I think it gives you an example of the lengths to which the minister herself has gone to, basically to cover up her position and to defend her position. And I refer you to uh, page 60 of the, uh, of the report uh, and paragraph 4.210. It reads as follows. Dr Lawrence even more clearly told an untruth to the press club at Canberra on the 19th of April 1995 when she said that she knew on Wednesday the 4th of November that she would be exonerated in regard to the impressed account. And he quotes from what she said. I clearly want to debunk the claim that I seized on this petition as a way to deflect attention from a police, police inquiry into my impressed account. The fact is that by the day before the tabling of the petition, I was already aware that the inquiry was completed and that I would be exonerated, and I checked that detail with the lawyer involved yesterday. And that's what she said to the National Press Club. This is what Marx then proceeds to say in the next paragraph. On the day before the tabling of the petition, Dr Lawrence could not have been already aware that she would be exonerated because the decision not to charge her was not made by the police commissioner until the day following the tabling. This is an open and shut case. She made an allegation that she was aware that she would be exonerated by the report, but the report hadn't been handed down. It's a blatant untruth. Don't worry about the rest of the Eastern matter. This minister is caught absolutely cold just by that set of facts. You don't have to believe anybody on this issue. The facts are there, clear, absolutely uncontradicted. The fact of the matter is, as Commissioner Mark said, watch, and this is the quote, what she said to the press club was untrue. This minister does not tell the truth. Now, even last night, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's this, all this uh, uh, debate about her legal costs. Last night, she was uh, uh, in the media saying, "Oh, look, if she'd known that she might have to foot the bill on some of the legal costs, then she wouldn't have proceeded with it." Now, that's just not true. She knew exactly at the time that she proceeded with her legal claim to try and stop the commission from. You know, inquiring into the truth of her remarks. She knew exactly there was going to be a controversy about it. And there she was, old Madam Innocent, uh, attempting to suggest that when the decision was made to proceed with the legal claim, that she was uh, somehow unaware of the controversy. There were press releases flying back and forth between the opposition and the government the day that that decision was announced and the day after. 
So for her to say last night, oh, she was an innocent, she didn't realise the controversy, is just plainly untrue. Yeah, yeah. Plainly untrue. I mean, you'd have to come to the conclusion that the minister is a compulsive liar Order. when it comes to uh, these issues. The honourable member will withdraw that. Well, I, dr I draw your attention. Uh, well, no. on the point of order, Mr. Uh, Deputy. No, no you on, the point of order, is, on the point of order. There is no point of well, order. I have I've directed that you withdraw. Right, well, the... I withdraw. It. I withdraw it, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But I also draw your attention uh, to uh, the previous use of exactly that term against the member for Chisholm, which was not required to be withdrawn. Order. Uh, Order. A, I think the honourable member is about uh, to reflect on the chair. Whatever ha may have happened in another context is to be regarded entirely in that context. Let me uh, continue on, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the, the Marx Royal Commission, the, the Marx Royal Commission, uh, concluded that the minister had failed to tell the truth. And the really damning thing about the Marx Royal Commission is that it relied on evidence not from anybody in the Liberal Party, but it relied on evidence from her own people. Now, the minister had the gall to say that she didn't remember any discussions, and yet we know there was a meeting of the Labor Party shadow cabinet in Western Australia in which they decided, each and every one of them, to tell the truth about what happened. And the reason that she is under the political pressure she's still under today and why the Prime Minister deserves to be censured is because virtually every last one of them has test testified it against her. And it's no good the Prime Minister blaming the so-called Burke squad. The fact of the matter is that there was no conspiracy. As one of the ministers uh, said in the last day or two, the reason she spoke out is because it was about time the truth was told. Now, in a sense, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's enough to censure the Prime Minister. He has a responsibility beyond his own political interests in the national interest to uphold standards, he has singularly failed to do so. Order. He ought to be censured the by this House today. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Honourable Minister for Employment, Education and Training. To Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the amendment moved by the Prime Minister and to totally reject the proposition moved by the Leader of the Opposition. It's an opposition, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is bereft of talent. It's prepared to hide the nastiness of its policy prescription, knowing that it's been rejected before. It's pretending today to be different, more compassionate and more capable. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's none of the above. And today's performance in this House, I think, attests adequately to the lack of talent on that side of the parliament. It's also an opposition prepared to resort to deceit, not just in the cover-up of its own policy prescription, Mr Deputy Speaker, of its own hidden agenda, but in also depicting the government's record of achievement. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to concentrate on the area of employment because it seems to be an area that all on that side have alluded to, and make this point at the outset. There is no stronger commitment by this government in any policy area than to getting the unemployment rate down. It's a commitment we're pursuing through sustained economic growth, which has seen 621,000 jobs created since the last election. And it's also a, a policy prescription pursued through the massive commitment of, of resources to target this time around in the recovery those groups that otherwise would get left behind, the people for whom the economic recovery would pass over the long-term unemployed, the long-term youth unemployed. And it's those groups, Mr Speaker, that we have allocated specific attention to, as well as, I might add, ensuring that the skills level of the country is raised, that we're not just employing people, but we're training and skilling them at the same time. Because we know that the jobs of the future are increasingly going to require levels of skills. And unless we address the skill formation agenda sensibly, our capacity to grow as a nation in any sustained basis is severely, uh, would be severely restricted. Now, on both counts, the economic growth and the resources, this is a government that's delivered, Mr Deputy Speaker. We have just seen yesterday the 17th quarter in a row of economic growth, 51 months of economic growth on the trot. And that's the best record achieved since the war. So in terms of achieving the economic growth, which is producing 
the job activity, Mr Speaker. That is a record of significant achievement. But on the question of job creation over the term of the government, let's just look at the uh, figures between 1983 and today. The labour force has grown by close to 30 per cent in that period, and employment has grown 31.3 per cent. It's the fastest labour force growth and the fastest job creator of all OECD countries in that period. Some failure, some failure, Mr Deputy Speaker. And in terms of the performance since the last election, remember the election commitment we made gave primacy to the creation of 500,000 jobs over the term of this government, a promise that was ridiculed by the opposition, ridiculed by the current leader of the opposition who said it's unachievable and it's an insult to the intelligence of the Australian public that the Labor Party should get up there and promise it. Well, promise it we did and deliver it we did. We passed the target six months ago, Mr Deputy Speaker. And we have produced 621,000, not 500,000, 621,000 jobs in less than three years. Some failure. In terms of the commitment that the government's made through the Working Nation program, the most significant commitment ever made by a government in terms of resource allocation to lifting the employment and labour force of the country, to lifting the skill base a commitment of $9 billion over the course of four years, and we're only one year into it, look at what that's achieved. We've seen the unemployment rate fall. It's at 8.7 per cent, but it was at 11.2 per cent. In trend terms, I might add, it's steady at the 8.5 per cent figure. So far as the long-term unemployed are concerned, the people that we said we would re-engage, we wouldn't leave behind, of the 621,000 jobs created, over 100,000 of them have gone to the long-term unemployed. You compare that to the economic period 1983 to 1989, when we also presided over a long growth period in this economy, of the 1.6 million jobs then created, they only picked up 100,000 in the 1.6 million. We've bettered that out of the 621,000 in two years compared to the, five, the six years before. That shows the importance of targeted measures. It demonstrates that by focusing on the real issue and directing resources, we can achieve results. Now, on the question of youth unemployment, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a critical area for activity. And the reason I say that is because when you look at the opposition, they've got no policy in terms of solving youth unemployment. They want to send round first a bus to say it will consult with youth, the coach of Kant, and then they've got a truck that's going around now highlighting the high level of youth unemployment. But as the Treasurer indicated earlier in his uh, address, Mr Speaker, to say that youth unemployment is at 27 per cent is just a nonsense because what it's saying is that 27 out of every 100 are out of work. Well, the reality is it's not 27 out of, every, out of the 100 of the total of the youth cohort, the total of the youth population, because the vast bulk of them remain in school or in training. It is 27 per cent of those that are not still in school or in training, and the reason it's so high is for the obvious fact that training and education improves a person's employability. If they have dropped out of school, if they're not undertaking training, their chances of getting employment are significantly reduced. They are harder to place, and we acknowledge that. But the simple fact remains that when John Howard left office, there were 158,000 young people unemployed. Today it is 95,000. It is still far too high. But it is a significant improvement on what we had. Now, I might say yesterday the member for Canberra uh, asked me a question in this House in terms of why we were no longer publishing the quarterly figures in terms of youth unemployment. My response to the House, which said, in essence, that we weren't publishing because of the unreliability of the, of the data, was greeted with some derision 
uh, by the opposition when I uh, said that in the House yesterday. But maybe they should listen a bit more carefully to what some of their own Liberal colleagues have to say on this point. Senator Tierney, listen to this because I think it's important for you when you go around running the lie again, said this in relation to quarterly unemployment figures in the Senate um, Estimates Committee back in May. These figures, he's talking about the same ones referred to yesterday, come out every month. Do you have any view of the confusion that they're creating? This applies fairly obviously to a small region, he says. The ABS figures tend to bounce around a fair bit because of small samples. He then goes on to say, we have confidence in the ABS figures as quoted for New South Wales, the whole of the state, but ABS's sampling techniques become very inaccurate at lower levels. Unfortunately, some of our parliamentary colleagues tend to quote these figures if they look favourable in a particular month, which tends to be misleading. Hear, hear. We have found this hidden, the, 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 we have found a Liberal that's prepared to tell the truth, but not the member for Canberra yesterday when he sought to exploit that issue yet again. But in terms of the same issue, Mr. Speaker, what did the Chief Minister of the ACT, um, Kate Carnell, have to say when the Canberra figures came out on youth unemployment under the same analysis? She called on the Australian Bureau of Statistics to rethink its methodology. Mrs Carnell said it was almost impossible to identify accurate trends because of the data used by the ABS in compiling unemployment levels among the 15 to 19 year olds in the HCT. Another Liberal, but they are hard to find, who is prepared to tell the truth. Now I accept, Mr Speaker, that people on the other side want to use figures and they can still have access to the data and produce whatever figures they want, but they at least should be honest enough to acknowledge the unreliability of the data because of the small samples. And if I just go on to uh, say, because it was a point that I made yesterday, I'm not trying to address this question of youth unemployment from the basis of just looking at the statistics, but I think we do have to put the issue into some perspective. And that's why I've spent some time in terms of the stats. But this government has a huge commitment in terms of addressing youth unemployment as a discrete and targeted measure. We know that training improves a young person's employability. The simple statistics, Mr Speaker, are that you're twice as likely to be unemployed if you haven't got year 12 than if you've got year 12 or better. 84 per cent of people that go through a traineeship are still in employment 12 months after the traineeship. So if those facts are right, what do we need to do to open up traineeships and training options for young people much more effectively? Well, we've done it under Working Nation. We've opened up traineeships in a whole range of industries and areas that hitherto didn't have them. Areas such as the environment, areas such as arts and sport and the media, areas such as information technology, areas such as the traditional craft industries of automotive and construction, where we're offering options other than just the apprenticeship. And the fact that we've opened them up, Mr Speaker, has seen a huge jump in the demand for traineeships in this country. So the demand for that type of labour is responding. We are offering new opportunities, new opportunities for our young people. But I'm prepared to go the next step. I'm prepared to say, Yes, it is a legitimate expectation that if young people go through the training, they be entitled to a job. And what we're working on at the moment is making that link, putting together the programs that deliver the training on the one hand and give the job offer at the end. And that's an initiative that was launched recently and I'm looking to expand upon. I believe that we as a community do have an obligation to the young people of this country. We've got to give them new hope confidence that they can pursue a rewarding career with some dignity. The, recent, the report that was tabled uh, earlier this week that projected where the jobs would be in the year 2005 holds great promise for young people, in my view, because it says that the jobs are there—2.1 million of them are capable of being secured over the course of the next 10 years. 
The real issue is how do we prepare young people to better able compete for them? Just as we've created the 621,000 jobs over the last two and a half years, the issue is not can we produce the jobs. The issue is how do we get young people into them? And the sort of programs I've been talking about, Mr Deputy Speaker, will achieve it. I believe that it's not just important that we address this uh, uh, position from the point of view of good policy for young people. I also believe it's good family policy, because the most important family policy that we can produce as a government is a policy that ensures the children have an opportunity for a rewarding career and a secure future. And that's what this government is setting itself to uh, ensure, Mr Speaker. Now, I just want to go, because I've talked about our record, uh, Mr Speaker, but where does the opposition stand in terms of its policy? They've given up. They've actually said the 5 per cent target, which is our target for getting unemployment down by the year 2000, they've said it's unachievable just as they said our 500,000 job target was unachievable. Well, we achieved it and we will achieve the 5 per cent as well. But the reality is it's only this government that's prepared to commit itself to a target. The opposition has given up. What's the point of sending a truck round the country talking about the problem of youth unemployment if you've given up in terms of a target? You've also given up in terms of committing the resources because the only program nominated for cuts by the shadow treasurer when they, if they were to get into office would be the working nation programs. They have not recanted on that commitment. Yet it's these programs that are bringing the long-term unemployed in, creating these new opportunities for youth, looking for the opportunities as a school to work pathway. You can't just say you believe in these things unless you're prepared to commit the resources. This is a government, Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, that's not only prepared to set its targets, it's prepared to stand on its track record of achievement and commit itself to going further. And it's a government that's prepared to commit the necessary resources to achieve that objective. We will not be beaten in the race for Order. getting unemployment down. The we will achieve our objectives. Time has expired. The Honourable Member for Gippsland. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training would have us believe that the solution to youth unemployment is a growth rate of 5 per cent. Then why is it that the man sitting directly behind him at this moment, the Treasurer, has conceded after the release of the national accounts figures that we can hope for a 3 to 4 per cent growth rate? A 3 to 4 per cent growth rate, he said, and we're set for his, his exact quote from yesterday on the release of the national accounts was, we are well set for continued growth in that 3 to 4 per cent range. So was Ian Salmon, the President of the Business Council of Australia, wrong when he said this morning, in response to the national account figures and the Treasurer's concession, that the government will not meet its grandiose target, again reiterated by the Minister for Employment today, when Mr Salmon said there's every chance that it will dip below 3 per cent, and of course the difficulty taking the longer term is when it will come back. Mr Deputy Speaker, that means the government will not achieve its target of 5 per cent unemployment by the year 2000. The Treasurer has conceded it. The Minister for Employment, Education and Training has again attempted to hoodwink the parliament that the government is keeping to its 5 per cent growth rate. And indeed, the Treasurer went on to say in regard to yesterday's national account figures that, and I quote, if you can bottom out somewhere around the 3 per cent mark, as we are at the moment, it's a damn good outcome. If that's what we're softened to, who can complain about that?" Unquote. Who can complain about a 3 per cent growth rate? Those unemployed who are depending on the government living up to its boast of a 5 per cent growth rate to achieve that 5 per cent unemployment uh, target by the year 2000. So, it's a fact that the 3 per cent growth rate will mean that unemployment will continue to rise from its present very high level. So the Treasurer asks us who can complain about that 3 per cent growth rate? What about Australia's 787,000 unemployed, 600,000 underemployed and 500,000 hidden unemployed? Aren't they entitled to complain about the failure of the government's economic policy to achieve sustained economic growth? That's exactly who should complain. So the fact that the Minister for Employment, Education and Training could come into the parliament 
and stick to, its, to his well-worn script of a 5 per cent growth rate as the solution to all of our economic problems, particularly the tragedy of youth unemployment, is exactly the reason why we are censuring the government. We are censuring this government a, for the failure of its economic policies and the economic hardship that, that has befallen so many small businesses, working men and women and uh, farmers, and we're also uh, censuring the government because of the inability of the Prime Minister to uphold the standards required of a Prime Minister of that office. The, the Prime Minister and his government have done nothing, as we cite in our censure grounds, but to deliver false dawns and to a failure to deliver what he and they collectively promise. Mr Deputy Speaker, the performance by the Minister for Education, uh, Employment and Training just summarises what's so uh, corrupt about this government, that once they've got hold of a lie, they will never let it go. They will uh, restate it endlessly. They may redress it. But the fact is they will hold firm rather than make any concessions, because once a concession is made, then the whole uh, sorry mess will begin to unravel. And, the, and one of the most revealing, if not the most revealing, uh, statements we have heard from members of the government today was from the Prime Minister himself, when towards the end of his uh, address on this censure motion by the opposition said this. I told my wife, Anita, we've got this one won, this one being the election. We've got this one won. Well, how self-delusionary can you be? Of course, the Prime Minister's got a track record for deluding himself. Remember, he thought he won the last election on the basis of his own personal following and, of for, and on his government's policy. Rather, as we concede on our side of politics, we lost the election. You never won it, and almost every member of the government, with any modicum of common sense and political judgment, knows that to be the truth. They won because they lied and distorted the public policy debate. And yet the Prime Minister to this day will cut off, without a second thought, anybody he believes wasn't a true believer. And you know how he defines a true believer? Anybody who credits him wholly and solely with winning the last election. Mr Deputy Speaker, we welcome this self-delusionary complex that has enveloped the Prime Minister. He's so out of touch. I mean, how many other members of the government are prepared in this place or outside to corroborate the Prime Minister? Who is going to stand up and say, we've got this one won? Come on, where's your courage? The minister's at the table. Will you say you've got this one won? Are you going to walk away from your prime minister? Honourable He's member, very fond of Honourable member will questions. redress his remarks through the chair. Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Communications, Arts and Tourism is very fond of posing questions during question time to the Leader of the Opposition. Now I'm asking him one. Will you corroborate the Prime Minister in that you've got the next election Order. won? Address your remarks through the chair. Mr Deputy Speaker, will the marginal seat holders of uh, Page, Richmond, uh, Macmillan, McHugh and Leichhardt, are they going to say we've got the election won? The moment the Prime Minister said that, it resurrected—you could see it on their faces—resurrected their greatest fears of him, that he, that he is so out of touch, so removed from ordinary Australians and the political process that he will follow blindly the uh, economic destructive policies at present and will, and will believe that he can retain incompetent ministers and untruthful ministers such as the Minister for Health without any political retribution. We're happy for you to believe that. We don't believe we've got the next election won, but we're going to earn the, the votes of the Australian electorate. We don't take them for granted like the Prime Minister. We're not going to conduct a campaign of fear and loathing like the Prime Minister will with uh, the, the, the concert of the uh, trade union movement, as their leaked documents have revealed. I mean, this Prime Minister has stood in this place this week and said, no matter what the Leader of the Opposition says on social security and on health, on industrial relations, don't believe him. Don't believe a single word he says on any of those subject matters. So how in this country is there going to be informed political debate when the Prime Minister sets out from the start to totally debase the exchange of views and the 
and the airing of policies for the Australian people to choose on. So Australians must understand who is entirely responsible for the erosion of, of standards and, and principles in public life today. He will not credit the opposition with even the beginning of a public debate, let alone at the conclusion of one. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, you have to ask, if, if the members of the government are so confident, are so sure with their Prime Minister that they've got the next election won, why are they all running as independents? Why have almost all of them but those in safe blue ribbon Labor seats disaffiliated their, themselves on their advertising material from the Australian Labor Party? Will somebody in the government's marginal seat band stand up and produce some material which has some identification with the Labor Party and its titular head, the Prime Minister of Australia, Paul Keating? Of course not. They, they want to distance themselves from the Prime Minister uh, to the greatest extent humanly possible. So the, uh, there's no doubt that the Prime Minister is complacent and, and megalomania, megalomaniac description of the result of the next federal election will have sent a, 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 a shiver up the collective spine of the Labor backbench. Mr Deputy Speaker, and that's why, because he's so out of touch, the Prime Minister doesn't recognise the failings of the Minister for Health. Nobody in Australia believes that she has told the truth over the Eastern affair. How can they? when eight of her ministerial colleagues, several of her personally appointed staff, the whole lot of them paid up members of the Labor Party, uh, 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 took a completely opposite point of view to the Minister for Health and her recollection. Now, the Minister for Health's defence, consistently in and outside this place, has been that her recollection has been different to all those other people, but that's fair enough with the passage of time. And the Prime Minister has very lamely repeated this defence at the dispatch box. But you've got to remember that the Minister for Health, three days after the death of Penny Easton, set out that defence in the Western Australian Parliament, only a few days after the famous Cabinet meeting where she said the Eastern petition was not discussed, she stated in the Western Australian Hansard that it was not discussed. We're not asking her, nor did Justice Marks, two, three years after the event to set out her recollection and compare it to that of her Cabinet colleagues and staff. No. Her recollection was set down only six or seven days after that infamous Cabinet meeting. So there's no possibility that her recollection was, was dimmed with the passage of time. She was caught out telling an untruth, and yet she remains a senior member of Cabinet under the leadership and prime ministership of Paul Keating. So the fact that he wants her to remain there, it, of course, serves the political advantage of the, uh, and purposes of the opposition. The, the longer she remains there, the more angry the Australian electorate becomes and the weaker her contrived and specious attacks on our health policy. But because we adhere to the standards of ministerial responsibility, we want her removed, Mr Deputy Speaker. So the, the, the government is not doing itself any service in a political sense in retaining her. It should remove her so that we can again entrench this concept of political and ministerial responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mr Deputy Speaker, of course the government will lash out in all directions to protect her. We had the Prime Minister and again you saw the colour drain from the faces of the Labor benches when he said that it was a Burke squad attack on her that brought her down. On the one hand it's a Liberal Party conspiracy but on the other hand it's really a Labor Party conspiracy. The Burke squad. Well, which one do we believe? We know very well it was the Labor Party members honestly and genuinely stating the truth as it was that brought her down. She was the instrument of her own destruction, Mr Deputy Speaker. So the Burke squad, of, of which the Deputy Prime Minister is a member, is, there, is it any wonder the Deputy Prime Minister has exploded with rage over the dumping of the member for Kalgoorlie, a good friend? It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. 
Firstly, he had to sit there in humiliation to hear the Prime Minister accuse, uh, uh, attribute the downfall of Dr Lawrence to the Burke Squad, of which he is a paid-up and leading member of. He was the one who gave a reference for a uh, disgraced and, and uh, jailed Brian Burke in court. So, of course, he's a close friend, then and now. That's not the issue of his personal loyalty. The issue is that he's been tagged as a member of the Burke Squad, which conspired together within the Labor Party to bring down the Minister for Health. Then, two days later, he is not consulted in, in, the, in the stripping of the member for Kalgoorlie's pre-selection and all of the political consequences that will have for the Deputy Prime Minister's Western Australian division. So, of course, it's been made known that he angrily confronted the Prime Minister, because he knows the Prime Minister thinks so little of him that he did not bother to ring him any more than Bill Kelty bothered to ring him to consult Paul Keating on Bob Hawke's appointment. So there's a total lack of communication within the Labor Party. The Prime Minister doesn't ring the Deputy Prime Minister on the sacking of the member for Kalgoorlie. Bill Kelty, supposedly the Prime Minister's closest friend, uh, certainly in the trade union movement, possibly outside politics, and uh, his key witness at the Kirribilli Agreement, doesn't ring him as he's about to humiliate him with the appointment of Bob Hawke. So what is this? Bob Hawke sort of paying out on Kim Beasley, humiliating him deliberately in the eyes of the party and the press go in the general public as some sort of weird payback for his own humiliation by Bill Kelty. This Gov Prime Minister is not fit to lead this country. He has brought down the standards of the office of the Prime Minister and, by extension, the, the standards of the elected chamber of the people of Australia, the House of Representatives. We censure the Prime Minister. Order. The Honourable Minister for Communications and the Arts. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, it's uh, always interesting to hear a contribution from the Honourable Member for Gippsland. He is uh, usually a cheery little fellow who sits over there with nice interjections. But You've got to make the comparison between the Honourable Member for Gippsland and the person who he followed into this chamber. Just think back to the people like Peter Nixon and the contribution that Peter Nixon made to this chamber in the old Parliament House. You wouldn't have had Peter Nixon supporting the privatisation of Telstra or the deregulation of Australia Post because of what that would have done to people who live in the bush. You wouldn't have had the National Party of, Ian, you wouldn't have had the National Party of Doug Anthony lying over and letting the Liberal Party tell them that they're going to national, that they're going to privatise Telstra or they're going to deregulate Australia Post, and you certainly wouldn't have had the member for Gippsland's predecessor, Peter Nixon, tapping the mat and letting the Liberal Party say what they're going to wreak on rural and provincial Australia if they have their way. But it is good to have the member for Gippsland here in this chamber, Mr. Speaker. It's probably an alternative to having the boys run the run the family business, and for that reason alone, we're pleased to have him here. But the point I'd like to make, Mr Speaker, is that this censure motion is, gives us a chance to look at the comparison between the, the policies and the achievements of this government versus the alternative which the opposition have tried to put forward in the last three years they've been in opposition. And if you take a quick snapshot, Mr Deputy Speaker, of what's been achieved by the government in the last three years, you can't help but be impressed. Mabo, the first federal government that's been prepared to address an issue that's of national importance to this country. I know it upsets you and the National Party that the government had the, had the courage to address it, but we did, and we've provided more stability for people who want to invest in mining and other development issues, as well as giving Aboriginal Australians their right to proper recognition of native title. We've been able to address the issue of unemployment. Through Working Nation, we've put a, a massive amount of resources into making sure that more Australians have got a chance to get a job, more young Australians are better trained to get a job, and in particular those who have been out of work for the longest get the greatest assistance from the government in getting back into the workforce. We have been able to, through the efforts of the Prime Minister, pull off the Bogor Declaration, pull off a, a free trade area in the Asia-Pacific region that will ensure that Australia, as a country that benefits from free trade, continues to get greater access in markets in the Asia-Pacific region. We've been able to make sure that through Creative Nation we're looking after our cultural industries and we're making sure that Australia remains at the leading edge in the development of new forms of communications technology. 
through the, through the reforms in superannuation. We're building up Australia's national savings. We're making sure that more Australians have, a, have enough money behind them on their retirement that they don't have to rely only on the pension. Through the drought relief package, we've made sure that those farmers who were hurt hardest by the drought received assistance from the federal government. We've led the debate on the Republic, much to the outrage of a few people on the other side of the House. We've had the telecommunications review, the most important review that's been released this year. And of course, next week we'll have the Prime Minister releasing the innovation statement. So a whole series of measures, month after month, indicating the government taking forward the policy debate, making sure that Australia is ready for the important issues that are uh, before the country. And the alternative, Mr Speaker, I think was adequately explained in the on the front page of The Australian today. The risk of becoming an invisible man was the headline, Mr Speaker. And I quote, John Howard has managed to make himself so small a target for Labor that he runs the risk of becoming invisible to the electorate. And that sums it up, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition, the incredible shrinking man. The Leader of the Opposition, the man who says the truth is so important to him. The man who said on the 25th of August 1995, and I quote, we want to assert the very simple principle that truth is absolute, that truth is supreme, truth is never disposable in national political life. The man who says he supports truth, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the man who doesn't want to tell us what his policies are. The man who refuses to outline the policy details of the Liberal and National Parties in the lead up to the next election. The man who refuses to take the Australian people into his confidence. And let me just run through a few of the issues that we, where we don't know what the opposition will, will do. And the first is on Telstra and their bland commitment to privatise Telstra. We had, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition making it clear that, as far as he's concerned, he'll have the foreign telephone companies having a large chunk of Telstra. We've had, we've had Senator Alston, the official spokesman on communications, making it clear that there will be significant foreign telephone companies owning shares in Telstra when they privatise it. Now, the, the, the Shadow Minister with responsibility for privatisation, she happens to have a different view. She was in the paper a week ago saying that she won't let the foreign telephone companies own any shares in Telstra, even if it means that she gets $10,000 million less for the sale of Telstra. The $10 billion smaller, lower price, the $10 billion lower price because she won't, she won't let the foreign telephone companies have a, a chunk of Telstra. A totally different position to that from the Leader of the Opposition and Senator Alston. But I think what the Australian people have got to ask is, do they want British Telecom to own 49 per cent of Telstra? Do you really want American Telephone and Telegraph to have 49 per cent of Telstra? Do you want France Telecom to have a big chunk of Telstra? Because I can tell you this, if they do, if they privatise Telstra and the foreign telephone companies have got a large chunk of Telstra, I don't want them making decisions about Australia's future telecommunications infrastructure. I certainly don't want them deciding whether or not Telstra will be up in Asia winning business for Australia, making Australia the telecommunications hub for the region. And why would British Telecom let its part-owned subsidiary, Telstra, be up in the region competing with British Telecom for business? That's the important point you've got to ask. And you can certainly say, Mr Speaker, that if they do privatise Telstra, even if the shadow minister at the table has her way and there is no foreign telephone companies owning Telstra today, what stops them owning it in the future? And what stops the new owner of Telstra, once it's privatised, breaking Telstra up and selling off the most profitable bits, selling off the mobile telephony, selling off the international business, leaving nothing but an unprofitable, leaving nothing but the, the loss-making areas in the bush? Because I can tell you this, Mr. Speaker, if you take away the cross subsidies for Telstra, the people in the bush are the ones who will be hit hardest by the privatisation of Telstra. The people in the bush will be the ones who want to know what, what the Leader of the Opposition means when he says he will privatise Telstra. And we've seen, Mr Speaker, on Australia Post that the Leader of the Opposition has said that he wants to implement the Industry Commission report on Australia Post. He wants to deregulate our postal services. I'll tell you what that means, Mr, Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker. It means 1,300 post offices will close. It means that there will be nine, at least 9,000 jobs lost. And it means that the Opposition, the Liberal Party, is arguing to walk away from the standard letter rate across the country. It means that if someone, if, if, if someone in the gallery sends a letter to some relations in the bush, you'll be, paying, you'll be paying more than the standard letter rate, more than 45 cents to send a letter to the bush. And imagine if you happen to live in the bush and every letter you send to your, 
to, to business colleagues or every bill you pay that gets sent to the capital city, you've got to pay the real price for sending that. That's going to cost an absolute fortune. John Howard, when he says he wants to implement the Industry Commission report into, into deregulating Australia Post, is saying that he supports the introduction of what they call the maximum affordable price for postal services. And that means that John Howard thinks, the Leader of the Opposition thinks, that, that once you deregulate Australia Post, they should be charging whatever they think the consumer can afford to pay. Now, it certainly means, Mr Deputy Speaker, we'll no longer have that standard letter rate. We'll no longer have the freeze that we've had from 1992 that's going to stay there until 1997 on that 45 cent standard letter rate. And it's going to mean that all those post offices will close. It's going to mean that the jobs will be lost. Why? Because they're obsessed with this dry, rationalist economic agenda. And the shadow minister at the table is the one who fights hardest for that Thatcherite policy, who believes most strongly in privatising and deregulating. So perhaps the onus is on her to tell us uh, why they believe in implementing that industry commission report. And again, Mr Speaker, if you turn to cross-media ownership, we've had the government uh, state very clearly we stand by the limits on cross-media ownership. We had uh, the member for, uh, for McKellar and the Leader of the Opposition in 1991 sign a petition saying that they were against any further increase in media concentration. They were against Mr Packer getting control of the Fairfax Group. And yet, in, uh, in more recent times, we've had the Leader of the Opposition walk away from that commitment in 1991. And when he was asked about this by Ray Martin, he was asked, uh, what about the suggestion that, in fact, you were party to a petition in 1991 that called for tougher rules? This is to the Leader of the Opposition, and he, and he said, well, that was the opposition's policy at that particular time. John Howard says, I wasn't the leader then, and I wasn't the spokesman on communications. I, I went along as a team player. Now, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, what happened to, to truth? What happened to truth is supreme. Truth, truth is never disposable in national political life. Well, apparently it is disposable on cross-media ownership because the Leader of the Opposition has a very different position today than he had in 1991. And he refuses to answer that very specific question. Do you think someone should be able to own a newspaper and a television station in the same city? He says he'll have a review. He says he'll do anything but give us a clear outline of the opposition's policy. Well, come the next election, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're going to have a very clear choice. A leader that's introduced the reforms with Mabo, Working Nation, Bogor, Creative Nation, the Republic, the Innovation Statement, the Drought Relief Package, superannuation, or a furry ball. The choice is a leader like Paul Keating, a leader like the Prime Minister, or a man who's rolled himself up into a cuddly little furry ball that refuses to tell the Australian people where he stands on these issues. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't think the people of Australia want a furry ball for their Prime Minister. Or the Honourable Member for McCullough. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I look at the motion that was moved by John Howard earlier this afternoon. And the censure against the Prime Minister deals with these topics. The Prime Minister's continued failure to give economic prosperity. That he has created great uncertainty and burdens for families, individuals, young people, seniors, small businessmen and farmers. That the Prime Minister has failed to uphold the standards required of a Prime Minister. That he has failed in his policy to deliver anything but false dawns and that he has continued to fail to deliver what he promised. Now, I rise to speak in this debate because of my concern for my country. I came into politics because I wanted to have a say in what happened to my country. History taught me that there were two groups of people in the world, those who had decisions made for them and those who were part of that decision-making process. And in speaking to this debate, I want to make this point. There is another way. The Prime Minister has followed the philosophy of collectivism, of which socialism is one part, and it doesn't work. It delivers lower standards of living, greater dependency, and less freedom. And our parties are worlds apart. Ours is a party that believes in the freedom of the individual and in the principles of free enterprise. And free enterprise are the principles that can offer this country a different set of policies and a different way that leads to the prosperity of all Australians. And that's what this next, next election is going to be about. The principles of free enterprise are as immutable 
as the laws of gravity. They tell us several things. Firstly, government doesn't have any money of its own. It only has the money that it first takes from the earnings and savings of individuals. And when it gives money away, it has to take it from the earnings and savings of individuals. There is no such thing as government money. It is taxpayers' money. And when the Prime Minister says this is as good as it's ever going to get, for him personally that's true. A house of $2.2 million, a very high standard of living for himself and his family. But what about for the ordinary punter? What about for the mums and dads for whom there is no recovery at all? Because that's exactly what's happened in this country. There is no recovery for ordinary folks. Again and again, when you go to open a trade fair or you talk with small business people, and these are the people who survived the recession we had to have and are supposedly in this recovery period, and yet they're struggling to make ends meet. And at every turn, they find government oppresses them. Well, the principles of free enterprise can work for this nation. Because the free principles of free enterprise tell us that the business of government is twofold. It's about providing those things which the private sector cannot or will not provide and providing for those who cannot provide for themselves. And yet here we have in government the man whom we are censuring, the Prime Minister, who seems to be a man hell-bent hell on destroying this country, which he then thinks he can leave and go and live somewhere in Europe. It's either that or we have a Prime Minister who is no longer able to make decisions for the benefit of all Australians, that he is so isolated and so perturbed that you could say he needs help to straighten out his mental condition. His bad language, his failure to follow the rules of decency, his upholding of lies as an acceptable way for parliamentary life, a complete and absolute lack of morality and ethics in government. And I define morality as very simply as this. It is the motive, the intention behind the action. And so when we condemn this government for what it has done, lowered our standard of living, brought uncertainty for thousands of families, failed in policy to give a direction whereby the country can prosper, and failure to deliver on his promises, of which probably the failure to deliver on the tax cuts which were made LAW law is the most cynical of the lot. In this parliament, we hear the Prime Minister rise again and again, and in a reckless manner, attempts to assert lies as being the truth, on the basis that the number of times you repeat it, presumably, makes it stick. I heard the Prime Minister who described the Senate as Swill stand the other day and say somehow it was the opposition who had no respect for the institutions of our country, whereas it is the other way round. And it is shown at every turn there is no respect for the institution of parliament, no respect for the, institute, for the conventions that attach to it, whereby resignation is required if a minister is found to have lied, as has happened in this place. But this censure is about Fundamentally, fundamentally Order. about the failure to deliver economically for the people of Australia. And Order. I think it's time we took a look at some good concrete figures. Let's have a look at some distinctions between Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. The OECD indicators of living standards, namely the GDP per capita and private consumption per capita, are used to assess Australia's performance relative to that of New Zealand and the United Kingdom. While New Zealand's position in the top GDP per capita countries improved between 1970 and the early 1990s, and Britain's remained unchanged, Australia's position fell by five places, from 12th to 17th. The average increase in OECD countries in GDP per capita in the same period was 505 per cent. Britain and New Zealand both exceeded this average by scoring an increase of 515 per cent and 615 per cent respectively. Australia, on the other hand, managed only 377 per cent. 
While Australia had a substantially higher living standard in the late 60s relative to the United Kingdom and New Zealand, this comparative advantage has all but disappeared. In 1972, New Zealand's GDP per capita was half that of Australia's. In 1990, it was three quarters. Similarly, Britain's GDP per capita was 76 per cent of that of Australia, but in 1990, it increased to 99 per cent. Australia has scored even worse using the consumption per capita as an indicator of living standards. The OECD average increased in consumption per capita again between 1972 and 1990 was 390 per cent. Britain and New Zealand both exceeded that average, achieving increases of 437 per cent and 740 per cent respectively. Australia, on the other hand, achieved a below average growth of 342 per cent. Furthermore, in 1972, New Zealand's consumption per capita was 49 per cent of that of Australia's, <coughs> while in 1990, the percentage increased to 90 per cent. In 1972, British, British consumption per capita was 82 per cent of that of Australia. In 1990, Britain surpassed Australia with a 106 per cent increase. The Australian very simply deserve better. It is the philosophical backup of the policies that this government has put in place over the last 13 years that has resulted in this drop in standard of living. It is this uncertainty that has resulted in parts of our society no longer being able to cope at all. We have the highest youth suicide rate in the world, something that must be a shame in this country. Where are the provisions that we have for leadership in this federal parliament, in the government ranks, to set standards and to set, set examples for the way young people should aspire to behave? Is it surprising? Is it surprising? Is it surprising that so many young people lose hope? Is it surprising that so many lose hope? That they don't see that there is any opportunity for them in this land under this government. They don't see that there is a future for them. What a tragedy. What a tragedy it is that we find that somehow those sitting on the other side of the table think that's amusing. Order. As I said, Mr Speaker, in debating this censure, my colleagues have outlined again and again instances of where this government has let the people down. It has dealt with one after another the way in which convention is broken, the way standards are broken, the way in which bluster, toughing it out, seems to have become the order of the day. We've had the supreme example in this very House, where we have had on the one hand the Prime Minister say, or the Solicitor General say, first of all, that the only reason that the, the Commonwealth Government, and thereby the taxpayer, could be held uh, responsible for paying the legal bills of Carmen Lawrence was because the Commission the Royal Commission in Western Australia was testing whether or not she was fit for public office. You then have the Prime Minister say that he's going to pay no attention to the findings of that Royal Commission and force through, firstly, in this set of appropriation bills, namely Appropriation Bill Number 4, <coughs> payment of certain of those bills, having acquiesced in the Senate's determination that those parts of the fees which were attributable to Carmen Lawrence's attempt to shut down the Royal Commission should not be paid, but the sheer effrontery of uh, the Minister for Finance saying that he would introduce it again next year to recoup that, ma that money uh, so that all of Carmen Lawrence's bills would be paid by the taxpayer. Compare that with the difficulties that ordinary folks have in getting legal aid. There is virtually in New South Wales, for instance, no money left for civil actions. It's hard to get money for criminal actions. And certainly there's nothing like $800,000 made available. There is also nothing like $5,000 a day being paid for a top silk coming, up, coming right across the continent to present the case. So what we see here is two standards. We see one standard 
for the government, which finds that the only people who prosper under this Labour government are those who lead it. The current Prime Minister, when he said it's never going to get any better, was quite right for him personally, for him and for his mates. But for the ordinary people, the ordinary people who want to have simply the right to aspire, to have hopes and aspirations, to see their children grow and to again reach their horizons of hope, to see a nation that is proud of the leadership that it gets. Those are the things that this country indeed is entitled to. So as I said, I rise to speak in this debate out of concern, concern for my nation, the Australian people, and the fact that we have a government that continues to let them down. And to stress that if we follow those principles of free enterprise, then we too can return to prosperity and the sort of hope the Australian people are entitled to. Now, the speaker before me, Mr Speaker, the Minister for Telecommun Telecommunications and the Arts, attempted again to use one of those sets of lies which he intends to repeat. Oh, and I, no. want to lie, I want to set down for the record the guiding principles, the guiding principles or if the honourable member was suggesting that the minister lied, that comment should be withdrawn. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll put it this way: the minister misrepresented my position what? so that is it the, was a total untruth. If you the use the word untruth and not the lie, then the so honor, be it. The honourable member is withdrawing. I withdraw the word okay. lie the and replace it with the McCullough. word untruth. Very Order simply, the, the commitments that we have territory. given for the privatisation of Telstra are fourfold. One, it will remain in Australian ownership with mechanisms put in place to ensure that we do not see a repeat performance of what happened with Qantas, where Qantas fell into the hands of foreigners because of the government's failure to put a proper mechanism in place. It will remain in Australian ownership because we want to see it a strong and prosperous country, owned not by a minister of the Crown but owned by the people. Two, community service obligations as they exist will continue to exist. There will be no cessation of them. They will be maintained. And all that nonsense that the minister went on about saying that we would do away with them is totally and utterly false. Three, untimed local telephone calls will remain both for individual, that is residential and business consumers. And fourthly, we will not use the proceeds to squander away on recurrent expenditure, as this government has done with all the proceeds of its privatisation, but indeed we will ensure that it is used primarily for the retirement of debt. The debt legacy that order, this government has left to the nation order, the has to be attacked. The member's time has expired. The parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, what a gormless performance. What a gormless performance. The histrionics that have come from the opposition this afternoon, you'd think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we were looking at a session of Hancock's Half Hour. Because the comedy which we've seen come from the opposition is entirely appropriate for that sort of, that sort of show. It's the sort of reporting we'd see on Newsfront. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, what we've heard from the opposition, these, these policy eunuchs on the other side, these people who would seek power without purpose, these people who have no, no idea of what policy really means, these people who follow a leader who slip, slides around, backflipping at every turn, he'd, he'd make the gymnastic squad. Of that there'd be no doubt. He'd make it, or at least the high board diving team. But one thing's for certain, Mr Deputy Speaker, were he to be approved, were he a member of that team, we know what would happen. He'd come down with a flop because that's exactly what he's done this afternoon. We've seen, I think, I think, the beginning of the end for Mr Howard, the Leader of the Opposition, this person who would have us believe that he's a model of integrity, this person that would have us believe that he's a model of honesty, this person that would have us believe that he's a person of such integrity that he would never seek to mislead the Australian community. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this not the same person who, prior to the 1983 election, 
failed to disclose a deficit of $9 billion when he had the information a week before the election? Was this the same person? Is this the same John Howard? Is it? Well, of course it is, Mr Deputy Speaker. And then we've seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, over the years, as we've seen the, th the third incarnation, reincarnation, of, uh, of him as the leader of the opposition, what we've seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, is, uh, is the sort of the reclothing, the resuiting of little Johnny, the resuiting of little Johnny. And we've seen him try and move his policy, policy position. But the Australian community aren't going to be fooled by this, aren't going to be fooled by this. We've heard this afternoon, clearly demonstrated by the, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance and the Treasurer, the Minister for Industrial Relations, the Minister for Communication and the Arts, and the Minister for Employment, Education and Training in their own portfolio areas, the sorts of recanting that has taken place by the Leader of the Opposition, the way he's tried to re-suit himself. But the, position which is being, the, the question which is being continually asked from this side of the House and from the Australian community, and which is based on this thing about honesty, integrity, is who is he? What is he? Where is he? What does he stand for? Where is he coming from and where does he want to take us? Well, he has never told us. What we do know is where he's come from. What we do know is how he's trying to reclothe himself, reposition himself, how he's trying to minimise himself as a target. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are a number of very important social issues which this country has addressed over the last few years and could only have been done by a Labor government. Could only have been done by a Labor government. And the most important of those in many respects was the Mabo decision. The Mabo decision. And what do we see when the opposition was confronted with the prospect of debating Mabo in this House, the native title legislation? What do we see the opposition do, Mr Deputy Speaker? What we saw the opposition do is as they have done on every piece of progressive legislation in this House since 1983, was oppose it. And we know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, um, when uh, the Prime Minister uh, spoke about, uh, spoke about the, native, the importance of the native title legislation in Mabo on the 10th of December 1983, in a, famous, a very famous, a landmark speech in Australian history by the Prime Minister in Redfern, and he said this, by doing away with the bizarre conceit that this continent had no owners prior to the settlement of Europeans, Mabo establishes a fundamental truth and lays, and lays the basis for justice. Never a truer word spoken. Never a truer word spoken. But then we see the opposition climbing into bed with Mr Court in Western Australia, going into the I was up at the Senate the night that Mabo legislation was passed. And to see the opposition, to see the opposition voting against the legislation. And then we had the opposition uh, leader in his famous is it wetland speech? I'm not quite sure. It might demonstrate something. Is it a wetland speech? A oh, wasteland speech. Oh, wasteland speech. I thought it might have been wetland speech. Because it was, because it was, it was certainly full of liquid. It was certainly still of liquid. And what, what do we find out about that particular speech, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that uh, we know that in that area on Aboriginal affairs, he in, fact now says, he, in fact, now says that the Mabo decision was correct. Having taken the government through this process, sacrificed the principles of Mabo in the attempt to try and amend the legislation in many respects, making sure that Aboriginal people, Indigenous Australians, were confronted by the prospect of a political divide because of their shameless behaviour, their shameless behaviour, he now says they accept the Mabo decision. Now, what sort of contortion? In terms of policy, are we supposed to proceed from that? What sort of contortion, in terms of his political activity, are we supposed to proceed from that, Mr Deputy Speaker? And then we have him say, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course, and these are the most important words in terms of this, this so-called headland speech, was this rider on the acceptance of Mabo. However, we reserve the right to amend the Act to assure its effective operation. What does that mean, Mr Deputy Speaker? What is that code for? That's code for slipping into the legislation. That's code for slipping into every Aboriginal organisation in Australia who supports Mabo. That's code for saying to those people who Mr, uh, Mr Howard describes in this wetland speech in this, the following way, the whole Aboriginal policy area has been hijacked by the social engineers, the politically correct and other sundry groups more intended on dividing and uniting our community. Are you kidding? Is he kidding? Who is he trying to fool? Who is he trying to fool? The only people who have sought division on this issue in the Australian community have been the opposition. 
led by the Leader of the Opposition, led by the Leader of the Opposition, and now seeks to reclothe himself and recant. And then, of course, there's the question of immigration policy. Immigration policy. Well, haven't we got a doozy here? Haven't we got a doozy here? We have, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this government is very proud of its immigration policy, and it, and it should be proud of its immigration policy. It should be proud of its policy of multiculturalism. It ought to be proud of them. The nation's proud of them, but not the opposition. Not the opposition. And what did the Leader of the Opposition say in 1988? Let me tell you what he said in 1988 about immigration, Mr Deputy Speaker. In relation, of course, you remember it's about Asian immigration. Remember? I'm sure you do. You don't want to remember. You don't want to listen to it, but you'll remember. He says, it will be our immediate terms and I quote this from the 2nd of August, Australian newspaper 1988, it will be in our immediate terms, term interest and supportive of social cohesion if it, Asian immigration, was slowed down a little so that the capacity of the community to absorb it were great. Later on, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the 11th of August 1988, he says this uh, in a news release. He says this, I stand by my comments of the past two weeks on immigration and ethnic affairs. He stood by them. I will not modify views. I will not modify views. Very strong words. I will not modify views designed to put the national interest, designed to put the national interest and national unity, national unity at the forefront of decisions on immigration and related matters. That's him. He then goes to say, and understand, these words are very important. They say a lot. The views I have expressed have been carefully formulated and progressively articulated in various forums around Australia over the past six months. They weren't something off the top of the head. They weren't something he made up at the spur of the moment. These were things he thought about. These were well-considered ideas. These were well-considered opinions. He was saying to the Australian community, I want to change the immigration policy. I don't like the fact that we've got Asian, Asian immigration. What did he say this year? What did he say this year? What did he say this year? Well, I'll tell you what he said, Mr Deputy Speaker. He may came out and tried to recant. And there's a very interesting article, an extremely interesting article, uh, in which is I'll just, I'll just say what he said this year. The concerns that I expressed at that time, seven years ago, were in the context of the emphasis that I, was, I always believe we ought to put on the things that unite us as Australians rather than the things that divide us. That's what he said. But these were well-considered views. These were views that he was expressing for some months. They didn't come off the top of the head. And then he's trying to recant. And what did the community think about that? Well, there's a very interesting article in a magazine called Chamber News, the Western Australian Chinese Chamber of Commerce. There's an editorial comment which, is said, which says this. In 1988, I quote Mr Deputy Speaker, in 1988 he managed to divide Australians with his remark that Australian immigration had, no, had to be slowed or else the country would face dire social consequences. Seven years is an extremely long time in politics and one would think that people have forgotten those comments. His re-election as opposition leader changed all that. His, his infamous consensus comments came back to haunt him. To the extent for much of his travels around the country at the time our article on page five was prepared, he had, he had to qualify his remarks many times. Quote, continuing the quote, his own silence in the preceding years about what he really meant when he mouthed these words haven't helped to improve his credibility, especially Australia, among Australians' Asian population. That's the fact of the matter. Because what we've seen from this man over the last few months is an attempt to try and beguile the Australian community, to try and reclothe himself, and really is the big bad wolf. Come into the bedroom, son. Come into the bedroom. Have a look at me. Aren't I nice? Aren't I terrific? Aren't I terrific? But it really isn't. He isn't at all. Because we're not fooled. He's a person without substance. He's a person who talks about standards and he has none. He's a person who talks about honesty and he's dishonest. He's a person who talks about having policy input and he has none. The fact of the matter is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this motion this afternoon puts it very squarely on the table where the opposition stands. It shows they are without substance. It shows they are without policy. It shows they are without integrity. It shows they are out without leadership, and the opposition leader should be condemned for his position. Order. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The honourable member for Wills. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. I just think it's very, very difficult to decide which way to go on this particular censure motion. If I understand the Leader of the Opposition correctly, the Prime Minister is the closest thing to a baby eater, a megalomaniac who basks in his own glory and tolerates appalling standards amongst his ministers. He's a bloke not fit for office and not a, not, should never be allowed to lead this country. Just by coincidence, everyone on the Prime Minister's side rejects that uh, view of the Prime Minister. So it just happens to line up that particular way. 
quirk of fate, isn't it? Now, the PM, for his part, reckons that the bloke on the other side is nothing but a queen-loving lickspittle, a little Tory from out of Sydney. Well, that's what he does say, Mr Deputy Speaker. I mean, I can't say as I agree with him necessarily. Now, how anyone could take this censure motion seriously is beyond me. You'd have to be almost brain dead to believe that this is a serious debate. Anyone who believes that the Marks Royal Commission was set up with honest intentions has got to be kidding. It doesn't matter whether the Commission is a good bloke, an ex-communist and followed particular procedures to the letter. Even if he did all of that, it still wouldn't prove that the Marx Commission was a decent political activity, because it wasn't. It was a witch hunt. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And it was set up for political reasons. It was set up as a political payback. And the, fact, the, the idea that people could come into this House day in, day out and argue, in fact, that that Royal Commission was set up to actually search for some kind of information that would be relevant to the Australian public absolutely astounds me. No one out in Punterland actually believes that, except a few turkeys. Well, they don't even believe it in here. They just claim they believe it. What is really more to the point, and I said this the other day, why did John Haldon take that disreputable petition into the House? And why haven't members in this House actually said that that sort of practice is disreputable and shouldn't be used by politicians? When the, when, when the member for Kennedy got up and made accusations about the former Senator Richardson, the people on the Labor side jumped to their feet to condemn him for it, the same when another member made accusations about public servants. But, so there was a concern then about the propriety of parliament. But when it came to the other issue, when it came to the Heldon petition, no one wanted to talk about it. My learned friend, the member for Melbourne Ports, will want to tell you that it's compulsory. It's an obligation to, to lodge petitions. Well, I'd put it to you this way. If it's an obligation to lodge the petition, and of course the clerk in this parliament or this parliament, the advice from this parliament is that the, uh, the state ruling or the state rules, the parliamentary rules in West Australia are silent on the matter, but that's something for another time. But the question is, if, if it is compulsory, then why wouldn't a person disassociate himself from a petition of that kind? So I reckon there was something, something stunk in West Australia, there's no doubt about that. But asking the minister resign after, to resign after a political witch hunt, one side doing that, when, when I know what would happen, if the coalition was sitting on the other side, they would be defending the minister to the back teeth. They would be defending her every single day and they'd pull out every sanctimonious line to do it. Well, I know what you'd be doing. I know you wouldn't be over there condemning your minister. You'd be standing publicly saying it was a witch hunt. Now, when it comes to the crunch, what separates the Labor Party from the Liberal Party is nothing like what the myth makers would have us believe. The facts are both parties gloat about cutting government expenditure. Both are addicted to privatisation and both accept deregulation of the labour market and both accept foreign ownership of Australian industry. So when it comes to the crunch, what does separate the two sides of this House? Well, some of the social issues separate them. On Mabo, of course, you find that the coalition is reactionary. On the Republic, you find that the, the, the coalition can't embrace it, can't understand that it's going to be a fact of life and want to run around making out their monarchists and they love queens. Well, so be it. Now, but assurances by the Minister for Communication that he is an economic nationalist and that he would not let Telstra be taken over by foreign interests are laughable. The idea that, that, that the Member for Communications would, would actually not let Telstra be taken over, not, not let it be privatised, then would stop it being taken over by foreign interests. What an absolute giggle that is. When you look at all of the private, look at all the assets that this government has sold, one after the other. Each time the barrier is lowered, each step we find another explanation for selling off another public utility. And I just can't believe the minister, the fact that he could come in and with a straight face tell us that he is opposed to privatisation. He wouldn't let a foreign company own Telstra. Well, the bloke who runs Telstra at the moment is an American and his name's Rupert Murdoch. And he hasn't had to buy it, he's just been given it. No wonder they haven't sold it. And down in Victoria, one public utility after another is being acquired by foreign interests, and the Prime Minister doesn't say boo. 
Not one single word out of the Prime Minister about the selling off of public utilities down in Victoria. It is an absolute disgrace. I cannot believe that it goes on and the Prime Minister comes into the House and talks about being a Republican and does absolutely nothing about it. When I put the question to him about electricity to France and its, its bidding for United Energy, he said, oh, that's a matter for the Victorians. He wasn't there to protect us down in Victoria. He wasn't going to use Foreign Investment Review Board powers to uh, put the jackboot into a foreign, into a French nuclear company, if you don't mind, a French nuclear company bidding for a, a United Energy in Victoria at the same time as the French were letting off atomic bombs in the Pacific. Unbelievable. I'd like to see some of these Labor members actually defend the sale of these public assets. Well, they do. I know how they defend it. They say, oh, look, that's different. Uh, we can't control that. The other, the other issues, the, the uh, Commonwealth Bank, oh, it's got no role anymore. But I tell you what, if public utilities, if gas, elect electricity and water were in the hands of the federal government, they would be sold. There is no question about it. Now, a real Republican, as I said, would definitely protect Australian industry, but we won't see Australian industry protected, and more of our industry is being sold off day by day. But if you talk about Australian industry being sold off, they, they suggest that you're some old-fashioned cad that you've got no idea about global economics. Now, the Minister for Industrial Relations points to the opposition and says that the use of contract labour, as per the CRA dispute, is what will become law under a coalition government, or a co if the coalition becomes the government. He, he is probably right. The problem is it's already law under the Labor Party. The battlers, the battlers have been sold out. The, the enterprise bargain policy adopted by the Federal Labor Party threatens trade unionism. It threatens it as a concept, as a symbol, and in practice, as we've seen in CRA, it drives workers into small groups where they are in danger of being toppled by employers. And how do we know this? Those historians in the Labor Party need only look back to the 1890 strikes to see what happened in those times, to see the use of common law to destroy trade unions. And what was the trade union response? Apart from the fact that it made a big mistake and said we'll organise a Labor Party to protect our interests, which it could never do because the Labor Party from the time of its inception was a revisionist or reformist party, what it said was we've got to go for big, strong unions, one big unions, and out of that developed the IWW and the like. And those blokes, and well, because there weren't a lot of women amongst them, but they understood that in unity was strength, but it had to be a broad-based organisation, trade unionism. What the, pro what the present Labor Party has done is drive workers into small organisations where, as we have seen in CRA, they are threatened. Now, members can tell us that this agreement is a victory for workers. All this agreement says is that workers have the right to collectively bargain. Now, put it to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, if there are ten members in a, in a factory or on the factory floor where there are 100 members all told and 90 of them are on contracts, it wouldn't matter how often you organise to collectively bargain. Eventually your members will be gone and they'll be driven into private contracts. And that's exactly what CRA are doing. CRA are doing the bidding for the modern form of industrial relations a modern industrial relations that have been orchestrated by the Minister for Industrial Relations, one that's accepted by this side of the House. No question about that. Now, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, that is really a study in sophistication when it comes to providing work for the heartlands where people are massively unemployed. What the Minister for Employment, Education and Training would have us believe is that all you need to do is train unemployed workers. So you reskill them and you will get them into jobs. The assumption with that thesis or that proposition is that per people, workers are out of work because they're not skilled. Now, just because the, the, there's a correlation between lack of skill and unemployment does not prove that the reason you are out of work is because you are unskilled. The facts are people are out of work because there aren't the jobs to provide for them. And you can skill well them. Look, the, per the, mem the minister or the, sorry, the parliamentary secretary there can talk about skilling and say that this will provide the way forward and this will put workers back into work or unemployed workers back into work. But the facts are it's not happening. And the minister never talks about the number of part-time jobs that are caught up in this job growth. 
And does anyone ever thought jobs have to grow? As your population increases, it's inevitable that jobs grow. What you need to do is study the nature of the jobs. Where are the jobs coming from? Why can't the minister tell us the kind of jobs that we should be looking for in the future? Why can't a minister, an industry minister, tell us about the kind of industries that we should be developing in the future so that we could then make training real? Or are we talking about a kind of training that's based around some service industry, a point I've taken up before? Are we saying that the future lies in working in uh, hotels up in the north of, north of Australia, in Queensland, for example. We're going to work on hotels and we're going to change beds and bedpans, and that will and that'll give us a bit of work. That's, are they the sorts of jobs we're talking about, or are we talking about real jobs? And If they are real jobs, let's start identifying them. And better than that, let's start doing something about it out in the northern, northern and western suburbs, the heartlands where people are massively unemployed. And it's quite interesting too. The Minister for uh, Employment, Education and Training crows about the training programs, but he didn't mention that he took $1.2 billion out of the last budget, uh, out of Working Nation. But oh, I don't know how much he's tucked back into it. We really need uh, a more interventionist approach to the problem of unemployment. And I thought it was kind of amusing, in a, in a sense, that uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Con Shacker, raised the idea of using super funds, directing super funds into local investment. And all the opposition could do was laugh about the proposal. Now, I thought it, that, that is just bizarre, because what is wrong with trying encouraging the super funds to put the money back into Australia rather than following global trends and send the money offshore to make interest for the, those people who have their money invested in the super funds? What is wrong with encouraging a bit of economic nationalism? What is wrong with asking that money be invested into the future of our children and, and sorting out those suburbs and those municipalities out in the north and west of Melbourne and elsewhere where the true believers live but are being jettisoned by the Labor Party? Really odd that the coalition should laugh about that policy because it is just plain common good sense. So, as far as, the, as far as this censure motion, there is no way known I could bother to vote. It is just a joke. And people ask you about voting in this parliament, and my good friend up there, the member for Werriwa, trotted out a leaflet one time saying, oh, clearly he doesn't vote on every division. Of course I don't vote on every division, because so many of them are just absolutely ridiculous. What we've done today is we have wasted hours and hours and hours of the parliament's time. It would be better to have a serious discussion about some of the real issues rather than continue to make myths about the differences between the two parties. Because in reality, as most people outside know, the difference between the parties is marginal. And what we will see is a growth of third party support out in the community. And I'm not saying that just because I happen to be an independent. The facts seem to support that. The party system is definitely fracturing. And it's fracturing partly because the, the Labor Party has moved to the right. The drift of the Labor Party to the right cannot be uh, explained away by any member. The right wing can come in and try to defend it, but they certainly know that the modern Labor Party is a party of the right, that it is a party of privatisation, that it is a party of deregulation, and that all the guff that the Prime Minister trots out about him being the great progressive in Australia is just that, just guff. If you want to be a fair income Republican, then go and do something about economic and cultural sovereignty. And I've got to laugh when the Minister for Communications talks about culture. That Hollywood showbiz mausoleum we're going to build up there in the showgrounds will not be good for Australian culture. We know what it will be. It will be another Murdoch enterprise about paid television, a television system we don't need and one that won't, construct, won't develop a real cultural assessment or an art form that actually assesses and refines and develops and illustrates Australian culture. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, we get this censure motion today, the day after we've had 17 quarters of economic growth, the day after the opposition did not ask one question of the Deputy Prime Minister about the uh, current account, uh, did not ask one question about the quarterly accounts. Uh, the day after, we've seen the economy continue to grow at uh, very substantial levels, and we get this uh, censure motion coming up on the third or fourth occasion when the opposition has had a deliberate tactic over the last couple of weeks of trying to disrupt the parliament as much as possible, of trying to take action to ensure question time is truncated on each and every day, to avoid the accountability that they say is so important and is then the subject of this censure. 
What a lot of nonsense from the opposition that that's been allowed to be the tactic that's to be followed. And today they had the, the chance to have question time, deal with all the key issues on the economy that they say are the subject of this censure as far as continued economic failure is concerned and the other issues they raise there and all the matters about standards and uh, false dawns and so on. But what do we get? No, we don't get that. We get this uh, trumped-up censure motion, and then we get the sort of very low, poor performances we've had throughout uh, from the various opposition speakers that have contributed to the debate. And this comes at a time when what has been really going on is a real questioning start, starting to occur about what the opposition might or might not stand for. We get uh, headlines in the editorial in yesterday's Financial Review, how ducks hard issues. We get headlines in today's Australian result of a news poll a canvassing of people across Australia saying that they how risk becoming invisible man. So what we should be getting from the opposition on this last question time or this last day of proceedings of a major consequence in the parliament for the year is a real attempt to enunciate something they might stand for. What do they stand for on industrial relations? Now, we really do know what the opposition stands for on industrial relations because John Howard has said in the past, he said in the past, I've been here 25 years, I've been here 25 years, my jobs back program, it was the right course on industrial relations. I'm not going to change from that. But as soon as there is a bit of strife because of what's happened in Victoria, or as soon as there's a bit of strife because of what's happened in WA, John Howard says, well, I don't really stand for any of those things. That's not really my industrial relations policy. Trust me, trust me, we won't really do that. We'll go back to what happened in 1990. Remember before the 1990 election, Andrew Peacock taking the view, best to not stand for anything. What did they describe him as then? The puff of smoke. That was Andrew Peacock before the 1990 election. And so that didn't work. Andrew Peacock's approach didn't work. So then they had to have the, the manifesto fight back. That didn't work. The people wouldn't buy that. So now they go back to invisible man, uh, puff of smoke type approach to uh, these issues. And if we come to other key areas, 17 quarters of growth, the fact of the matter is throughout the last three years the opposition has been predicting there'd be another recession. It's a double dip, they kept saying. There'd be a run on the dollar. The government couldn't manage the economy. There wouldn't be a budget surplus. All of those sorts of things. Prove wrong every single time. That's been the opposition's track record as far as economic approach is concerned. You contrast that with the fact that the government made a commitment before the last election to create 500,000 new jobs in this term. What was the response from the opposition, the then industrial relations spokesman for the opposition, the now leader of the opposition? Unachievable. Couldn't be done. Well, of course, what we have achieved is 620,000 jobs in those three years, along with those 51 uh, months of strong economic growth. And then we move on to other key areas. Let's take uh, national savings. The opposition constantly berated our approach to savings. Amongst other things, when we introduced the superannuation arrangements in 1991, uh, John Howard said legislation to increase employer contributions to superannuation would be nothing short of parliamentary confiscation of the assets of employers. And we've got a whole litany of quotes of the same type of approach uh, attacking the government's superannuation arrangements, attacking that uh, strong development of a national saving strategy through superannuation, which already has achieved $200 billion of superannuation assets, and with that figure to grow massively over the next few years as a result of the measures the government introduced in the budget this year. And the opposition has gone month after month piece of legislation after legislation attacking that superannuation arrangement uh, as being one that was unfair, unworkable, totally uh, undesirable as far as Australia is concerned. And as, indeed, as recently as the September and October this year, we had various speakers uh, from the opposition, including the shadow minister for superannuation matters. He's now been silenced on these issues publicly. Indeed, he's got the flick altogether for that great person of integrity that's going to presumably seek to take his place in the seat of uh, Bradfield, uh, Brendan Nelson. All of those uh, strong credentials he's got uh, to represent uh, people because of the whole basis of truth and integrity and all the other, th other things the censure motion talks about. Well, as recently as last month, Members of the opposition were saying our superannuation policy uh, was uh, unfair, unworkable, etc. One of the people I note on the speaker's list as to follow is the member for Ringer. 
Now, he said, as recently as the 25th of September, compulsory superannuation is one of the biggest con jobs ever foisted on the Australian people. That was the 25th of September that that was, um, statement was made. Now, the members to speak later, I think maybe he got caught up in one of those uh, cables or wires or towers that he's talked a bit about in making that statement, because less than two months later, what did the deputy leader of the opposition do when he went and spoke at the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia National Conference? He said, we're going to adopt Labor's superannuation policy. That's what he said. We'll adopt Labor's policy, the one that was the great con less than six weeks earlier. Well, of course, what we know about the opposition is they will say anything. They will say anything and do anything to try and make out that they, all the things they stood for over the last four or five years, they no longer believe. That's what they'd like us to believe. And this censure motion is really about trying to cover up, trying to cover up that fact that the opposition's approach is to try and do anything to avoid actually being exposed for this sort of hypocrisy that's associated with today's censure motion. And it is a great load of humbug, this particular censure motion, because rather than, rather than try and take steps to say in this last uh, few days of this session of the parliament, well, the opposition does really stand for things. They really do, really do have some substance to their whole approach to seeking to be the next government of Australia, what do we get? This sort of cant and hypocrisy that has been pursued in this censure motion today. And the facts of the matter are, if you look at all of the key areas on industrial relations, the government has a policy that has delivered strong productivity growth for Australia, strong employment growth for Australia, and has helped to deliver both the reform but also the sense of fairness and the sense of uh, a decency that industrial relations should deliver. When you come to the area of our international approach, the government has been able to deliver on the big picture. That massive uh, reform that the APEC process delivered in Osaka last week, and which is a great credit to this government, to the Prime Minister and to the Foreign Minister. And it's easy to say, oh, well, the opposition it would do this or that in relation to those areas. We come to this speaker's notes document the opposition's put round. And they have sort of said in the area, well, APEC. That's maybe something, but they'd do things, they'd do things altogether differently. The shadow trade minister, he'd be able to map out a major course of action such as uh, APEC, but he'd also have all sorts of bilateral arrangements that would achieve far more. What a lot of nonsense. You compare the front bench of the opposition to the front bench of the government in areas like trade, foreign policy, uh, treasury, communications, etc., and look at what their policies are in those areas and you have absolutely worthless propositions that have come forward, absolutely zero substance coming forward, and the people of Australia, as today's news poll, are waking up to the fact. John Howard might have stood for something. Twenty years ago, he might have stood for something. What does he stand for now? Trying to do anything he can to ensure that the people of Bennelong uh, somehow are conned, as far as Sydney Airport is concerned, to suggest that he was something different. Uh, ten years ago, that he didn't really support the third runway at all, when everybody there knows that his whole approach to those issues, his whole approach has been to, yes, he did support the third runway, yes, he didn't uh, express any great concern at all about what the impacts might be of residents of the Bennelong electorate or surrounding parts of Sydney. And you can't remake, you can't reshape this censure motion, the amendment that the government has moved, is a demonstration to all that the opposition hasn't remade itself, they haven't reshaped itself, they deserve the strongest possible censure for the inability to deliver alternative policies of any worth or value to the people of Australia. And this censure motion that they launched today was a clear manifestation of the fact that they don't have the credentials to govern Australia and the people of Australia should judge them accordingly, as this House will, in moving <coughs> this uh, amendment to the censure moved by the Leader of the Opposition. What are the Honourable Member for Wakefield. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Member for Parramatta knows much better than he does. The Member for Parramatta comes into this House and suggests that the Opposition has in some way been unwise because it has traded question time for this opportunity to move a censure motion. Traded question time for a censure motion that the Prime Minister refused to take on two other occasions. Traded question time when day in and day out we come in here and ask questions and get no answers. Traded question time when ministers day in and day out do nothing but use question time to abuse the opposition and evade any opportunity to be accountable. What we have done 
is to use what we as opposition members are meant to use, and that is a forum of the parliament to call the government into account. The member for Wills preceded the member for Parramatta. And the member for Wills said, we've all wasted our time this afternoon. Well, it's easy for the member for Wills. He's an independent member. No chance of ever being the government of this country. Never likely is the member for Wirra, where we're probably the only time he's going to agree with me in the entire debate, never likely to be called to account. Easy for him, but for those of us in opposition, we have a responsibility. And the responsibility is to call the government to account for the things that it's failed to do, commend it for the things that it's done that we agree with, and frankly, call the Prime Minister for account to account when he has failed to lead Australia as it ought to be led. Preceding the member for Wills, we had an astonishing speech from the member of the, for the Northern Territory. And the member for the Northern Territory had the sheer unbelievable bare-faced audacity to bring the immigration debate into this chamber and to try with that in some way to discredit the honourable performance of the Leader of the Opposition. No one else in this House would surely, have, would surely sink so low. The member for the Northern Territory stood up there as if he alone had some sort of monopoly on all that was decent and trotted out all this sanctimonious humbug, failing to recognise that all that the Leader of the Opposition had ever done in the immigration debate was to welcome Asian immigration and call for assimilation. But no such recognition from the member from the Northern Territory, of course. No recognition from him that all of us in some way have been compromised from time to time, none more so than he, as we all know. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I stand here on a rather unusual platform because I share with the member for Gippsland the rare distinction of having spent longer in opposition without tasting government than any other members of the federal coalition. I entered in March 1983, so I have not been blinkered by some rosy impression of what my lot might do in government. But from March 83 to November 95, I have watched 13 years of progressive deterioration in both the standard of living in Australia and in the parliamentary standards that Australians <laughs> expect from this particular chamber. I have watched them eroded, eroded from 83 to 92 under Prime Minister Hawke, but that erosion has been unbelievably accelerated under Prime Minister Keating. And frankly, and the member for Parramatta, who, as I said, knows better than he said, stood up and illustrated the point I wish to make, that speaker after speaker from the government, in defence of the Prime Minister, have only stood here and said, look at what we've done. Why, they've implied. Look at the World Bank survey, which only two months ago said this happens to be, per capita, the wealthiest country in Australia. This happens to be the country where, if you take our land, our minerals, our plant, our equipment, our housing, our factories, um, our farms, and capitalise it against each Australian, then in US dollar terms each Australian is worth $835,000 or $1.9 million, uh, no, $835,000 United States, or $1.9 million American. Well, there are a few Australians, Mr Deputy Speaker, who wouldn't mind taking their cash and running in the present climate. But this censure is not about that. This censure is about the question that every Australian asks, and that is, why, if in capital terms I'm that wealthy, has my standard of living fallen? And in addressing the censure motion, the Leader of the Opposition made it perfectly clear that, frankly and uncomfortably, we have dropped in national income per capita from 10th in the globe to 22nd, while the Prime Minister has been the Treasurer or the Prime Minister. Surely that fact alone, in a nation as wealthy as this, is good reason for a censure. Mr. Deputy Speaker, our standard of living used to be the highest in the world, and it has slipped 
as everyone knows, from the highest in the world to 22nd. Mr Deputy Speaker, today, this very day, we had our current account deficit for this month revealed, and it came in at $1.6 billion. And some commentators would tell you that's reason for rejoicing. That is, we imported more than we exported to the terms of $1,600 million in a one-month period. And the only reason people want to rejoice about it is that it's under $2 billion. We've now got ourselves into some sort of mental state, which means that a current account deficit that comes in under $2 billion is meant to be a good figure. Does the parliament realise? Do the people of Australia appreciate the fact that from 1975 to 1983, Australia, in 88 months of recording, never, never recorded a current account deficit over $1 billion. And from 1983 to 1985, under the present stewardship, out of 150 months of recording, on 96 occasions, we've had a current account deficit of over $1 billion. That is, we've slipped back every month by that degree. And on 11 occasions, a current account deficit of over $2 billion each month. Surely those figures alone are justification for a censure motion like this, and the opposition in leading this censure only reflects what the rest of Australia says. This can't go on, and this man is not fit to lead this country. As the Leader of the Opposition said in statistics that by now every Australian must be familiar with, We've gone from $23 billion of borrowings to 163, and still we slide down. Now the government will claim quite legitimately that Australia's exports have continued to rise, and they're right, they have. But our share of the world export market has declined. And if you want a measure of what's wrong with Australia, there it is. Sure, we're exporting more. But other countries are outperforming us hand over fist. In fact, in terms of our share of the world export market, we've gone from 12th when you came into government to 21st today. Isn't that of itself sufficient reason for this censure? The minister then why aren't we part of it? Let me ask the member for Werriwa. And why aren't we involved in it? And I'll come to APEC in just a moment. The reality inescapably remains that we are not the performers in per capita terms of export into Asia that once we were, and that relative to our competitors, we have slipped under your stewardship. Uh, the, member uh, uh, order. The, the member of Wakefield might like to come back and direct his comments to the chair. I'm sure he realises that. Uh, well, if I'm not provoked, the member I will. Might, for where I should, should say, not the member for Warringah, haven't started yet. <laughs> the member for Warringah might, might cease interjecting too. I respect your decision, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training came in here and lauded the way the government had exceeded its targets in terms of creating jobs for young people. And that's good news. No one in the opposition has ever pretended otherwise. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, after 13 years, we still have at least 8.6 per cent of the workforce out of work. Are we supposed to celebrate that in November 1995? And how fluid is that figure? Given the multiplicity of training schemes that have appeared, oh, I'm not allowed to be critical of training schemes because people on training schemes become more employable. But people on training schemes are also no longer counted as part of that unemployment figure. So heaven knows what that real figure is. We have over 9 per cent of people out of work, and we are supposed to apologise for moving a censure motion against the Prime Minister. Only this week I had an employer in my electorate ring me, as the parliamentary secretary may well have them in her electorate ring her, complaining about the fact that he had jobs and no one prepared to do them. That's an indictment of the way we go about employing young people and of how serious we are 
to addressing the whole question of job creation. But talk about industrial relations, and the first thing that will happen is that someone on the other side will stand up and paint the opposition as if in some sort of pre-Lord Shaftesbury concept we wanted to send children up chimneys. How absurd can you get? Don't you realise that in common with every one of you, I too am a parent, a parent of children in the workforce, a parent of children I don't want exploited just as you don't want people exploited either. I have a vested interest in an industrial relations system that is fair and that frankly offers better pay for better work in common with everyone else. And we have a situation here where any suggestion that the opposition is critical of the performance of the Minister of Health is instantly met with a cry that in some strange way the Royal Commission was loaded against her, ignoring the fact that eight of her colleagues were the very people who gave evidence against her and also found her guilty. And while I'm on this question of misrepresentation and deceit, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me address the whole matter of parliamentary standards, because we have a situation where you know and I know that the standard of this chamber and performance in this chamber has slipped under the stewardship of the Prime Minister. Here is a Prime Minister who openly defies the Speaker, a Prime Minister who thinks he can front himself to the dispatch box and address the parliament whether he has the call or not. No civility, no decorum. Every member of the opposition is treated as dirt. Now, this must be said for the former Prime Minister, Mr Hawke. Never while he was Prime Minister was I faced with that sort of situation. And if I met him in the corridor, at least I was treated as an Australian with a role to play and a job to do and a justification for being here. But not this man. In the eyes of the Prime Minister, the opposition has no role at all. And that is inexcusable. In common with everyone opposite, Every member of this opposition has been elected to this chamber, charged with a serious responsibility to represent an electorate, government or opposition, and expected, frankly, and I'm proud of this as an opposition member, expected to voice the concerns of all those people who didn't vote for the government. Now that applies no matter which party is in opposition, and that means that the voice of the opposition ought to be heard and heeded. I don't expect to win divisions because the people of Australia didn't elect me into the government, but they elected me into the parliament with a job to do, and part of the justification for my job is the right to be heard, not treated as dirt by the present Prime Minister, against whom we have moved, quite rightly, this censure. I am tired, Mr Deputy Speaker, of being treated with scorn and derision tired of being treated as if I had no real role in this parliament when I proudly stand here as a member of the opposition and as the member for Wakefield. And Mr Deputy Speaker, finally I stand here representing rural Australians, who are probably the most accommodating Australians they are, that, that there are, probably, certainly the most forgiving because they are accustomed to the vagar vagaries of the seasons and so they are a little more cynical than others about what politicians believe, about what politicians pretend they can deliver. And rural Australians are also angry with this Prime Minister because they've borne the brunt of much of his economic mismanagement. They're the people who are generating the opportunity for export renewal, and they're the people who feel that this Prime Minister has failed to give them a fair go. Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Wills said that we had much in common. I'm sure the member for Werriwa will, dis will disagree with him. Order. But the, the truth remains time has the Prime Minister is the man who has snuffed out the light on the Order. hill. Order. Order. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Cryer. Mr Deputy Speaker, let it be forever a matter for the public record that on the last days of the sittings of the 37th Parliament, that the final motion of censure by the opposition against the Prime Minister was proposed by a leader of the opposition that has been rejected once by the Australian people as being unsuitable to lead this great nation and who is the third choice of his peers to lead the Liberal Party. 
And let it be a matter for the public record, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the member who seconded the motion against the Prime Minister, the member for Higgins, is someone who on two occasions refused to take the poison chalice of the Liberal leadership. The member for Higgins must rank as one of the greatest political squibs of the 37th parliament. Mr Speaker, the future of this great country is too precious to place in the hands of a third-rate opposition who will deliver second-rate government to this country. The people of Australia have a clear choice of national leadership at the next election a leadership to represent this great nation in Asia and the great forums of the world. On this side of the House, they will have Paul Keating, Kim Beasley, Gareth Evans and Ralph Willis. And on the oppos opposition side, they will have a choice of John Howard, a reject in his own ranks, Tim Fisher, who was not taken seriously by anybody in this country, Alexander Downer, who was unceremoniously dumped from the Liberal leadership for his incompetence, and Peter Costello, the, fine, the shadow finance minister who gleefully announced to the Australian public that we were heading for a double-dip recession when the Australian economy motored on to 17 quarters of positive growth. Those are the choices that are before the Australian people at the next election. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is not fit to lead Australia. We on this side of the House know it, you on that side of the House in your heart of hearts know it, and the Australian people know it. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me quote from a report in a publication, Rear Window, edited by Andrew Main and Rowena Stretton. It describes the Leader of the Opposition's 17-page presentation to a council meeting of the National Farmers Federation. According to the report, the Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition staff instructed that there be no questions to the Leader of the Opposition. And when the NFF resisted, the Leader of the Opposition staff then offered to write the questions, offered to write the questions for the farmers. There is only one reason why they would seek to do that. And that is simply that the Leader of the Opposition is incapable of providing a coherent answer to questions about his own policy. Can you imagine the Leader of the Opposition sitting down with the Japanese Prime Minister or the Indonesian uh, President and handing them a list of questions they could ask, they could ask about Australia's place in the world? Mr Speaker, there is no one in this House or the Australian community that really believes that the Leader of the Opposition could have stitched APEC together. There is no one in this country who really believes that the Leader of the Opposition could have steered the Mabo legislation through this great parliament. And there is no one who believes the Leader of the Opposition would have had the political courage or the vision to put one simple proposition before the Australian people and that is that Australia ought to, be, ought to be led by an Australian and that they ought to have an Australian as their head of state. And there is no one who believes that the great social policy advances that have been made by this Labor government could ever have been constructed by a Tory government led by the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I listened intently to the Leader and Deputy Leader of the Opposition and their contribution to the censure of the Prime Minister. And there was simply no substance to the attack. No fresh policy position with which they could flail the Prime Minister. Simply tired rhetoric from a tired opposition who have given up on policy debate in this country. Mr Speaker, this is the most deceitful and divisive opposition which has ever put itself before the Australian people for judgment. And their ultimate deceit is typified by their deliberate policy of withholding from the Australian people what they intend to do in government. It's a simple strategy of deceit. And we in Victoria know quite a deal about that simple strategy because we experienced it in 1992 with the election of the Kennett government. Jeff Kennett told Victorian workers that none of them would be worse off with the, with the election of a Liberal government. And on coming to power within a matter of months, he mounted a massive assault on the wages and conditions of workers under state awards. 
and John Howard is simply a Jeff Kennett clone. They come from the same Liberal industrial relations stable, and we know exactly what he will do in office. Let there be no illusions. Let the Australian workforce be under no illusions what he will do when he comes and, and if he comes to office. He will strip away the award conditions of workers. He will depress the uh, wages of workers. He will not endorse a no disadvantage test in industrial relations. And he will stab the independent umpire, the Industrial Relations uh, Commission, in the stomach. Not my words, but his. And while he does that, Jeff Kennett waits in the wings to punish Victorian workers for fleeing to the sanctuary of the federal industrial relations system. He has simply said that with the election of a uh, Howard coalition government, workers in Victoria will have nowhere else to go. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the greatest political obscenity of them all is John Howard and Peter Costello's pitch to the battlers of this country. Is this the same Howard and Costello who, in 1993, put before Australian workers a regressive industrial relations policy designed to strip their wages and award conditions? Is it the same Howard and Costello who, in 1993, put before the Australian people a radical plan to dismantle Medicare? Is it the same pair who put before the Australian people a plan to slash $10 billion from social expenditures in this country? Can it be the same Howard and Costello who gave their heart and soul to fight back that awful Tory manifesto designed to attack the economic and social conditions and wages of workers. Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the greatest political obscenity is that Howard and Costello, after all of that in their heart and souls, now want the battlers in Australia to actually reward them for those policies with the fruits of government. Well, let me tell you, the battlers aren't that stupid. Now, I, I uh, listen with interest to the contribution for the, uh, uh, by the member for McKellar, that Tory high priestess from back down the time tunnel. And uh, her speech, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, was one great diatribe against Australia. She constantly runs down Australia, as her leader does, and puts up the United Kingdom and New Zealand as something we ought to emulate. Well, I say to the honourable members opposite and I say to the honourable member for McKellar, if it's so good there, why don't you go and live there? Why are there? Answer me this question. If it's so good in New Zealand, why are there a quarter a million of them here in Australia seeking to build their lives and the futures of their families? The important thing to appreciate about the stance of the honourable member for McKellar and, the, uh, McKellar and the leader of the opposition is simply this. Both of them can't stomach the thought of an Australian being an Australian head of state. Here we are in 1995 and the leader of the opposition dusts his cap to a monarch 10,000 miles away and can't even stomach having an Australian as an Australian head of state. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm proud to stand on the record of this government and on the record of the Prime Minister. I am proud that this was the government that brought into this parliament the greatest piece of social legislation since Federation, Mabo. I'm proud of, uh, to be a member of a Labor government that put on the floor of this parliament Working Nation, a program of economic and social structural change that every country in the Western world now wants to emulate. I'm proud of the economic achievements of this country. I don't run them down like the, like the Leader of the Opposition and the member for McCallow and, and members opposite. I'm proud of the fact that we've had 17 quarters of positive economic growth. I'm proud of the low inflation. I'm proud of the fact that there is uh, the lowest level of industrial disputation in this country for over 40 years. I'm proud of Australia standing in the world. And I won't stand on the floor of this parliament or I won't stand on any platform outside of it and I won't stand in any international forum running this country down like the Leader of the Opposition does and the honourable members opposite. 
I'm proud to be an Australian. I'm proud of uh, the fact that this government engineered APEC, APEC, and I'm proud of the breadth of our social policy. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I listened to a succession of uh, uh, members opposite who railed against the Prime Minister's defence of the Minister for Health and how they can stand up in this parliament and defend one of the most grubby political exercises that uh, West Australia and this nation has ever seen is quite beyond me. A rigged terms of reference, absolute lies told to uh, this particular parliament about that parti uh, by that Royal Commission, a rigged terms of reference, a hanging judge and a bodgy outcome. And they parade it before this uh, illustrious House as the truth of the matter. That is a disgrace in itself. And I am pleased that the, uh, that the Honourable uh, the, uh, Minister for Health has drawn the line in the sand on this grubby exercise, has stood at the line and has not bowed, has not bowed to any sort of uh, mealy-mouthed pressure that the honourable members have brought to bear on this particular issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, in closing, let me say this. In the final uh, moments of this particular parliament, the 37th parliament, we have seen an, a, an opposition incapable of carrying a policy debate before this House. We have seen a leader of the opposition parade himself in front of this House as an alternative leader with no policies, with an attitude to run down his own country a man who is incapable of considering that Australia should have an Australian head of state, and a, a man who carries baggage from the past that really puts him to the bottom of the harbour in political terms, right where he belongs. Honourable members on this side of the House know the record of this government, and it is that record we will go to the Australian people and we will stand upon it. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I am confident, as all the members on this side of the House are, that when the dust settles on this particular election in 1996, we'll, we will have relegated to the political scrap bin a whole generation of Tories and Liberals who have not had the wherewithal, the intellectual capacity to achieve government in this country. Mr Deputy Speaker, it will be our pleasure. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member Oringa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I can understand uh, why the member for Karaya would be standing on his record because, quite frankly, it's the best way to try to hide the record of this government. Today we've had a cavalcade of ministers and parliamentary secretaries coming out with platitudes and clichés trying to defend the indefensible. Only one of them has sounded at all convincing. And that's the Deputy Prime Minister, because I suppose he's got something to look forward to, and that's being Leader of the Opposition after the next, uh, after the next election. Mr Speaker, this censure motion deserves to succeed because of the arrogance of this government, the dishonesty of this government and the incompetence of this government. And Mr Deputy Speaker, 1996 is going to be a watershed in Australian politics. 1996 is going to be a watershed like 1949, because Howard's battlers are going to be to the 90s what Menzies' forgotten people were to the 40s and 50s, and it's on their shoulders that a new generation of Liberal dominance is going to be created. There's a few parallels, Mr Deputy Speaker, between 1949 and now. Ben Shifley had chaos in the cold fields. Paul Keating has chaos on the wharves, in the coal fields and in the mining industry. The difference is that Ben Chifley was against the strikes and Paul Keating is in favour of the strikes. And the Australian people are asking who is responsible for the $200 million wiped off our production by this strike. And the answer is a Prime Minister who went to Osaka, who swanned off overseas rather than stay at home and fix the problem that he created. You see, this Prime Minister is very good at starting fights, but he's very bad at finishing them. He's very good at creating problems, but he's no good at solving them. This is a Prime Minister who turns around and says, oh, oh, the CRA dispute. Marcel Marceau could fix that. Well, what happened to Placido Domingo? What happened to Placido Domingo? He could not do what he said 
Marcel Marceau could. And my authority for this is none other than the Prime Minister's erstwhile best friend in politics, but that man who rushed out of the dinner party with Solly Lou, that man who forsook Melbourne's millionaires to raise the standard of the class war, that man who leapt out of his Xenia suit to don the cloth cap, and that man, Bill Kelty, said that I have confidence in the former Prime Minister, but I have no confidence, no confidence whatsoever in the present Prime Minister. The present Prime Minister is someone who has been rejected, has been rejected by no lesser figures than the leadership of the ACTU. And it's interesting, while we're on the subject of Bob Hawke, the member for Corio claimed that people on this side of the parliament were un-Australian. Well, let us remember that it was Bob Hawke himself, no less a figure than the former Prime Minister, who said of the current Prime Minister that Paul Keating is the first ever occupant of the lodge who doesn't like Australia and doesn't like Australians and would rather be living somewhere else. Well, let me tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that after the next election, Paul Keating will be living somewhere else. He certainly won't be living in the lodge. You see, this week we've seen a strange contrast between the Prime Minister's spoken language and the Prime Minister's body language. His spoken language has had all the usual violence, all the usual vituperation, but his body language has been tense, arms crossed, because now there are enemies all around him. Bill Kelty is an enemy. Kim Beasley is an enemy after what's happened to Graham Campbell. Graham Richardson has been an enemy for months, plotting his downfall. The Prime Minister, you've got to say that his mental stability is, is, is no longer something that we can take for granted. This Prime Minister sees enemies everywhere. The Burke mob, that's the latest list of enemies that this Prime Minister is seeing everywhere. This is a Prime Minister who has no friends, and his attitude to this parliament makes that very clear indeed. I mean, he said, he said, he said that he's got the Pope on his side. Well, to be honest, that's about all he's got left. And frankly, you'd need to be the Pope to have any sympathy left for someone who can only be described of, as the Jack the Ripper of Australian politics. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker the fact is that this government has failed. It has failed where it counts. It has failed to deliver the goods to the Australian people. Foreign debt is now worse than Mexico's. Real wages they are now lower than in 1976, and a bus driver in Sydney today earns less than a bus driver in Taiwan. Economic recovery is a complete illusion. It has not crawled off the pages of the Financial Review and into the pockets of ordinary Australians. Your mortgage costs more and your house is worth less. That is the reality of life under this government. There are 800,000 unemployed, and what does the Prime Minister say? He said, this is as good as it gets. That's his message to the 800,000 unemployed. That is as good as it gets. Mr Deputy Speaker, 13 years ago, Australians believed that we were a rich country getting richer. Today we think we are a rich country getting poorer. This is the first generation in Australia's history which fears that it will leave its children a lower standard of living than its parents left us. But it's worse than that. It's worse than that. There's the fraud and the hypocrisy. There is the betrayal of a Prime Minister who has abandoned the workers that he has always claimed to represent. And ben Chifley and John Curtin would turn in their graves to see what this government has done. We have a Prime Minister who goes to a Labor area when he wants a safe seat, but as soon as he's looking for a nice house, where does he go? He goes off to the silver tails in the eastern suburbs. But the Prime Minister is nothing, Mr Deputy Speaker, but the chief exemplar of a culture of greed which this government has created and we need look no further than the Australian Industry Development Corporation, a government-owned enterprise which this year lifted payout to directors from $3 million to $18 million at a time when the company made a multi-million dollar loss. What a disgrace, what a shame and what a betrayal of the values that the Labor Party once represented. And Mr Deputy Speaker, heaven help us if the AIDC had actually made a profit. How much would they have paid themselves then? 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, is it any wonder that this Prime Minister has given up on domestic policy and he's now uh, seeking refuge uh, in that ultimate last resort of failed leaders? He now wants to create a Canberra Commission to rid the world of nuclear weapons. He can't solve little things like unemployment and the foreign debt, so now he's going to try to tackle ridding the world of nuclear weapons. And I suppose he's going to redesign Sydney, completely end any acrimony between black and whites Australia, and I suppose he's going to find a cure for AIDS too. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, this Prime Minister is a fraud. He said at the beginning, he said at the beginning of his term he said that he would deal honestly with the Australian people. He said that he expected ministers to tell the truth. And what happens, Mr Deputy Speaker? Well, along comes Carmen. Along comes Carmen. And what happens to the Prime Minister's commitment to the truth? Well, there was the Minister for Human Services and Health. What was she saying in Parliament? In Parliament, when asked what had really happened, she kept saying, my recollection is my recollection. Did she dare repeat? what she'd said to the National Press Club? Would she dare repeat what she'd told the Western Australian Parliament? Of course not, because she knew that she was guilty. And what's more, the Prime Minister knew that she was guilty because the leader of the Labor Party in Western Australia had told him. And then in the Royal Commission, what does the Minister for Human Serv Services and Health do? Well, she takes refuge in the Alan Bond defence. I can't remember. I can't remember. To every inconvenient question, she says, I can't remember. And of course, who did that last but Alan Bond? And he was only able to get away with it because he said he had brain damage. And this is the person who's Minister for Health. I suppose it's so that she's got doctors close at hand if she finally collapses under the strain of all this nonsense. The fact of the matter is, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister, under the pressure of defending this Minister for Human Services and Health has gone slightly troppo. First of all, it was the Liberal conspiracy. It was the Liberal Party that was responsible for putting all those people up, Carmen Lawrence's former ministers and staff, to say what she had really said. Then, of course, when that looked up utterly absurd, it was a Labor Party conspiracy. A Labor Party. It was Burke's mob that had done it. The fact is, this Prime Minister is shackled to a political corpse. He knows it. This parliament knows it, the Australian people know it, and the strain is starting to show. But he's got a problem, hasn't he, Mr Deputy Speaker? Because if she went, he'd have to go too, because he is the ultimate master of misrepresentation. He is the ultimate true deceiver. There was, of course, the LAW uh, law tax cuts that were never delivered. There was the third runway that was supposed to mean more takeoffs and less noise. And the opposite has been the case. There was the consumption tax that in 1985 he said we must have, and in 1993 he said we'd never have, and ever since he's been giving, us, giving it to us by stealth. There was the privatisation that was supposed to be selling off the nation's silver that we'd never have, and, and now he's giving it to us in spades, selling off the heritage of this nation. To whom? To whom? To the hated POMs. The ultimate misrepresent. The ultimate, the ultimate true deceiver. Now, the fact is, members over there talk about a hidden agenda. Their charge has no conviction, no conviction whatsoever, because they are led by a man who is the ultimate policy chameleon and a man who has demonstrated throughout his career no commitment whatsoever to the concept of truth from the days of his rorted pre selection, from the time he's failed to get his tax returns in on time failed to declare where he lived for the purposes of travel allowance, failed to come clean on his business relationship with Warren Anderson and various people. This is a man who embodies, who embodies misrepresentation and deceit. And of course, the ultimate illustration of this is the government's failure today to accept perfectly reasonable suggestions for truth in advertising legislation. Why won't they accept it? Because they know that if truth in, ad in political advertising legislation is in place for this election, the Prime Minister will be able to play no part in the coming election campaign, and he will be the ultimate Marcel Marceau of Australian politics. Now, the fact is they can't make up their mind, can they, 
whether the opposition are wimps or ogres. You know what it's going to be? The next election is going to be a contrast between Honest John and Jack the Ripper. That's what's going to happen at the next election. Our policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is very clear. Our policy is to be different from this government. Our policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is to promote workers' rights, not unions' rights. Our policies say that your wages can go up, but they can't go down. If someone comes along, if your employ employer comes along and puts $15,000 and puts fifteen thousand dollars on the table for improved work practices, our policy is that you can accept it. You can take the fifteen thousand dollars. You won't be condemned to poverty forever. You won't be condemned to the miserable, the miserable wages immobility of this government. Our policy is to protect Medicare. Our policy is to make it easier to save money. Our policy is to make it easier for people to buy shares in their own companies. Our policy is to make Australian workers partners with their employees, employers, not antagonists. Our policy is to make it easier to take out private health insurance. Our policy is to raise parliamentary standards. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that, that the coalition in government will do what this government has completely failed to do. We will bind up the wounds of the Australian people. We will restore the social fabric of this great nation. We will enable the Australian people for the first time in years to feel good about themselves. That's our policy. That's why we're different and that's why we're going to win the next election. Mr Deputy Speaker, this government deserves very much to be censured. This government deserves more than that. This government deserves to be ejected by the Australian people. The Australian people, they don't expect miracles. All they want is a bit of honesty from, the Austra from their rulers, and that's what they will get under the next government. The fact is it is in the Australian people's hands. I know at the next election that they are going to go for it, and this time they certainly won't be disappointed. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Werribee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, what a funny old position the coalition parties have got themselves in. And this debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, shows the mess, the ramshackle mess of their political structure and their integrity. We just heard from the member for Warringah, who present himself as the future of the Liberal Party. A young member recently elected the future Liberal Party. Who does he take as his political protege? Bob Santa Maria. It's all the way back to the 1950s with Bob Santa Maria and John, and John Howard. Howard. All the way back to the 1950s to the white picket fence with John Howard and the protege and the mentor, the mentor of the member for Ringa, Bob Santa Maria. And that reminds me of an interesting incident last year that reflects perfectly on the Liberal Party in the 1990s. And that was the book that was co-authored, co-authored, co-edited by the members for Menzies, Moore and Deakin. Now, a funny thing about those three, the members for Menzies, Moore and Deakin, two of the three have been disendorsed from the Liberal Party. Their book was called The Heart of Liberalism. Well, they ripped out the heart of liberalism when they disendorsed the member for Deakin, who's in the chamber, and also the member for Moore. But in this book about the heart of liberalism, we come to the last chapter, and it's entitled The Future of the Liberal Party. The future of the Liberal Party. And who's the author? Bob Santa Maria. They've got Bob Santa Maria in the last chapter reciting the future of the Liberal Party. And what were the three planks that Santa put forward as solutions in the 1990s? It was to send everyone back to the land. The idea that everyone could go back to the land and live a nice, simple, plain farmer's life with no stress, no family back, uh, breakdown. The second plank was to send women back to the home, to take all the women out of the workforce and put them back in the kitchen. The third plank from Santa Maria writing a chapter about the future of the Liberal Party was to take the technology and put it back in its box. And that's a perfect echo of the member for Ringer, all scared of technology progress. Oh, we don't want any of that. We don't want any of these highfalutin new modern devices like telecommunications. We want to put it back in the box where Santa says it, it deserves to be, where Santa wants it to be from the 1950s, where John Howard wants our society to be right rooted in the 1950s. Now, I mean, Fancy the member for Ringer wanting to lecture the House about parliamentary behaviour. This is the member for Ringer who had the hide and the gall to be describing the Prime Minister of Australia as Jack the Ripper. Well, this is the same member for Ringer. When he was at the monastery, he wasn't known as Jack the Ripper, it was Tony the Stripper. So, I mean, if he wants to engage in those sorts of standards, jumping fences in and out of the monastery, bringing that low level type of behaviour 
into parliamentary forums, well, he's going to get it back. He's going to get it back with spades. This exposes the humbug and the cant, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of what the opposition have been saying in this debate, and it exposes the funny old position, the funny old position they've got themselves in. Because in 1993, not so long ago, at the last election campaign, they put forward all the things they believed in. They worked for two or three years. The member for Ringa was in the research team working on all the ideas that the Liberal Party and the National Party really believed in. It was called fight back. It's called fight back. It's locked away now like a mad uncle in the attic. They never talk about fight back, but it reflects all the things they believe in. The individual employment contracts, the dismantling of Medicare, the 15 per cent GST, and cutting away all the public sector programs that provide for an equalising and civilising society. Their fundamental political beliefs, the things that were reflected, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the Fight Back Manifesto, of course, are just an echo of Thatcherite philosophy. The idea that there is no such thing as society. There is government, and there are individuals, but there is no partnership between the two. There is no partnership between government and individuals that forms a thing called society. And their sole role in politics, their sole role is to push away public sector programs and to push more and more responsibility onto individuals. And of course, the wealthy and the privileged in our society can pick up those responsibilities and entrench their position. But for the disadvantaged, the people that they would call battlers, of course, it makes it even harder. Because without the civilising and equalising role, the great tolerance and liberation of the public sector, then those so-called battlers have an even harder lot in their life. But then what happens after 1993 when they find out the things that they believe in, Mr Deputy Speaker, all the policies they supported in fight back were basically unelectable, unsupported by the people of Australia. In 1996, they're going to go to the electorate with the things they don't believe in. So what sort of empty shell of a party is this to go to the people with all the things they believed in in 1993, find out that that was unelectable, and now to try and put on the fraud and the hypocrisy of going to the election next year with all the things they don't believe in? And this is exposing the two faces of John Howard. The member for Warringah and other speakers have said, oh, the Labor Party can't make up its mind. They seem to be campaigning against two John Howards. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's a perfect reason why we're doing that. There are two John Howards. There's the private John Howard, who believes in all the policies of fight back, and there's the public John Howard, who's trying to present himself to the people of Australia as a sensitive new age guy, as a reborn political leader, the sort of leader who uh, eats quiche, the sort of leader who helps little old ladies across the road, the reborn sensitive new age John Howard. Well, I mean, it's a fraud, Mr the Deputy Speaker, and the Australian people won't have a bar of it. They know the two faces of John Howard. They know the face of John Howard, the private John Howard, who supports fight back. He supports it to his bootstraps. And they also know the public John Howard, who is now trying to have a massive lend, a massive lend of the Australian people. And the Australian people will determine at the next election that they like neither face, neither face of John Howard, and they will reject both comprehensively at the ballot box. But it reflects also something interesting about the coalition at this part of the political cycle because they know they're going to the people with the things they don't believe in. But they're sort of half excited, half g'd up by the fact that the opinion polls show that they're a bit ahead. So they're sort of getting around with that hangdog look, oh, we're really not going to the people, getting a mandate for the things we believe in, but half excited about the prospect of a coalition government. Well, this is a party with an empty shell, a party that's totally poll-driven and has no conviction. It has no integrity. It has no purpose for its existence. Because without those things called conviction and ideology and policy and belief in politics, in public life, Mr Speaker, there can be no achievement. There can be no achievement without those key ingredients of a meaningful existence in public life. And for the Liberal Party and the National Party, they must sit around in the dining room, they must sit around in the party room wondering what's it all been for? What's it all been for in 13 years? of opposition, because they spent most of the 1980s shaking out the ideology and direction of the Liberal Party. It was Howard versus Peacock. It was left versus right. It was wet versus dry. It was a party ripping itself apart to refashion its core beliefs, its core ideology for the 1990s. And now, going into the next election, Mr Speaker, what have they got? What have they got in their leadership? They've got Andrew Peacock writ small. They've got Andrew, the Andrew Peacock without a suntan. They've got Andrew Peacock without Shirley MacLaine. They've got Andrew Peacock without the Gucci toothbrush. 
So I've got Andrew Peacock without the serious look. All they've got left is John Howard and the worried look. They've gone through this massive pro process of ideological struggle in the 1980s, the wets versus the dry, Howard versus Peacock, left versus right, to end up with a Peacock style of leadership, all image, no substance, led by John Howard. It's an absolute fraud. They've got Andrew Peacock without the suntan. All they're left with is the worried look, that constipated look that sits permanently on the face of the leader of the opposition. So it's a sad old state, Mr Speaker. It's a sad old state for a party left without a heart, left without a conviction, left without the core political belief to go to the people with, with the things they believe in, the things that they showed the Australian public with the Fight Back Manifesto. And this is the same John Howard, Mr Speaker, who said in his budget reply speech earlier this year, and I quote, I've dedicated my public life to the pursuit of substantive policy change and I've led the debate. Well, it's a funny way to lead the debate by trying to hide your policies, a funny way to lead the debate and produce substantive policy change by campaigning on the things you don't believe in. The Leader of the Opposition is Australia's answer to Jim Hacker. His motto is, I am their leader, I must follow them. It's the same John Howard who adopted that motto when he was Treasurer between 1977 and 83. the Treasurer who showed leadership by walking away from the internationalisation of the Australian economy. The same Treasurer who showed substantive policy change by walking away from tariff reduction, micro-reform, by industrial relations reform, by integrating Australia into the Asia-Pacific. This is the same John Howard who has the hide to come into this parliament on this debate, Mr Speaker, and want to talk about economic performance. Now, the uh, Leader of the Opposition produced some figures from the, the Business Council. I've got a better source, the Parliamentary Library, Mr Speaker, because on that side, on the opposite side of the House, they wish to compare the performance of this government on economic management. Who would they take as their standard? Who would they take as their benchmark? Is it the Menzies government? Would that be a fair comparison against the performance of the Labor government from 1983 to the present? I mean, the Menzies era, we hear in this parliament, is described as the utopian age of economic growth, the utopian age of economic performance in Australia, the golden age of Liberal government. So members opposite would surely accept the proposition that it's a valid comparison to look at the economic performance of the Menzies government from 49 to 66 against the Hawke and Keating governments 83 to 95. Well, Mr Speaker, what do the figures provided from the Parliamentary Library show on the key performance measure of GDP per capita per annum, the performance of the Menzies government 2.0 per cent, Hawke and Keating 2.1? We're greater than Menzies. We're greater than the golden age on the key measure of economic performance. GDP per capita, per annum. On other measures, employment. Under Menzies, the annual growth, 2.1 per cent. Under this government, 2.1, just as good. Business investment is a proportion of GDP. Under Menzies, 10.7. Under Hawke and Keating, an average of 10.8. On inflation, Menzies, 4.6. Under this government, 5.4, trying to wind back the Howard legacy. But when it comes to the key measure, when it comes to the key measure, the things that the Liberal Party and the National Party would really pride themselves on in the 1990s, it would be on government outlays. It would be in growth of the public sector. Because there was an interesting reminder of this just last Sunday on that uh, infamous Meet the Press program, Mr. Speaker, when the leader of the opposition said, "Oh, there's not as much fat in the system as there was 15 years ago." It was almost like he'd forgotten about well, who was in 15 years ago? Who was the treasurer? who was responsible for a fat budget 15 years ago. It was J.W. Howard. Look, like, I mean, how selective, how convenient that he can stand there on a national TV program and say there's not as much fat in the system as there was 15 years ago without saying who was responsible for the fat a decade and a half ago. It was him. It was him. This is the man with no history. He is the Ronald Biggs of Australian politics. He wasn't there 15 years ago at the scene of the crime. It was someone else. But on this key measure of comparison, let me return to the figures. Uh, looking at uh, the Menzies period compared to Hawke and Keating on Commonwealth outlays. Under Menzies, it was 2.5 per cent growth per annum. Under this government, 1.5. Lean, effective, efficient government under a Labor government. And when it comes to Commonwealth taxation, we always hear the opposition say, oh, it's a high taxing government. Well, have a look at Menzies' performance. Annual growth in Commonwealth taxation receipts of 2 per cent. Under this government, 1.1 per cent. We are better than the golden age. This is a new definition of economic utopia established by this government. On the sort of comparison 
that the opposition, the Liberal and the National parties, would say is the only fair comparison in uh, post-war economic performance. So this is a good government. It was once said, of course, of Jack Lang that he was greater than Lenin. Is the opposition now going to confess that Paul Keating is greater than Menzies when you look at the economic figure, figures, when you look at the economic data? Now, beyond that, of course, of course what uh, the opposition are basically saying in this debate, what they'll be putting forward at the next campaign, Mr Speaker, is that look, this is a government on the economic data. It's better than the Menzies government, 49 to 66. The opposition, we have no policies, but we want to be in government. The Labor government has done better than the golden age, the utopian age of Menzies. They've got no policies, but they want to be on this side of the House. Well, that is such a sham. That is such a fraud to be putting to the Australian people. No policies, but what have they got in personnel? They've got John Howard, the third choice, not of the Australian people in this term of parliament, the third choice of his peers. Not, not, not good enough to beat John Hewson in their leadership ballot, not good enough to beat Alexander Downer, the second choice, relegated to the third choice. Not the third choice of the Labor Party, not the third choice of the Australian people, the third choice of his peers in this session of parliament. The most overrated character, Mr Speaker, the most overrated character that Australian politics has seen for a long while. I mean, how long do you need to be in this place to know the fundamental tenets of pension policy? How long do you need to be here? He's been here 21 years and he doesn't know that this government has achieved pensions at the level of 25 per cent of average weekly earnings. Does he need another 21 years? Is it 42 years before he finds out the basis of policy for the old age pension? And then there's Tim Fisher. Then there's Tim Fisher, one unnamed National Party member, possibly the member for Gippsland, said last week, with Tim we don't know if it's a lack of intellectual capacity or intestinal fortitude or both. Well, we know the answer on this side. It is both. It is both. It's lack of intellectual capacity and intestinal fortitude. When it comes to the leader of the National Party, he's not only dumb and dumber, he's weak and weaker. He is the weakest figure in the history of order. Australian politics. Order. The other member they resume must sit his there seat. The member in the National Party saying it's Resume your seat. The member in the The member is being offensive and uh, referring to a member in that way and should withdraw those, st those statements. I have, uh, I have heard during the course of the debate this afternoon uh, a number of a number of uh, points of view, which I'm sure people would have, in normal circumstances, taken offence to. Uh, in fact, the honourable member's time has expired, and we'll leave it at that. The original question was that the motion be agreed to, to which the honourable prime minister has moved as an amendment. Well, if we have to do that, we'd be going back all afternoon. Uh, that all words after that be. A Oh, look, don't press it. We're going to go on with this now. Oh, no, I feel strongly about it, Mr. Speaker. The point of order I make is that if you agree with me that the statements are offensive, just because someone no, else has I got didn't away agree with them, you at all. I you said shouldn't let them get away with there's it. No, there's no point and of I... order. It's a censure motion. There have been things said during the course of the debate this afternoon from both sides, which I'm sure honourable members would find offensive. And that's where it'll end. The original question was the motion should be agreed to, to which the Honourable the Prime Minister has moved as an amendment. All words after that be admitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division, division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that must be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint tellers for the ayes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tellers for the nose, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina.
Well, the result of the division is ayes 73, noes 57. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint tellers for the ayes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tellers for the nose, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina. Order. The result of the division is ayes 74, noes 57. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Honourable Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, order. Order. I have received messages from the Senate returning the following bills without amendment. That's it, I think. Superannuation industry supervision legislation amendment 1995. National Food Authority amendment 1995. The Honourable Member Hindmarsh. Mr. Speaker, I wish to make a personal explanation. Claim to be misrepresented. I do, Mr. Please Speaker. Please proceed. Uh, no, order. I want to get this over and done with. Today in the Senate question time, Senator Cook made false allegations regarding my motives when I sought to prevent CSIRO from allowing the erection of billboards on their green space along South Road at O'Hallon Hill in Adelaide. Senator order, Cook said, order. it is interesting to ask the question, why does Mrs Gallus have an interest in ending order. this project? Member for O'Connor is not helping his colleague who has the call. Either is the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. She said the CRO it was to she said to the CRO it was to give other companies a chance to bid for the contract to erect boardings. Thank you, Mr Prime Minister, for your civility in this matter. Order. This is Remember, not, 
Keep going. This is not correct, Mr. Speaker, as my opposition on my right. was on environmental grounds only, and I was opposed to the erection of billboards by any and all companies on the O'Halloran Hill site. And I know order, there was order. no. The, the member behind Marsh just for a moment. The member, Mr. Speaker, I'd like, you, I'd like you to be aware that whatever the reason, that it is impossible to hear the member for Hindmarsh. Perhaps. Start again. Start again. Like, the member for Perhaps the volume could be turned up. Okay. Member for, no, no, just keep going. Member Hindmarsh. This is not correct, Mr. Speaker. As my opposition was environment, on environmental grounds only, I was opposed to the erection of billboards by any and all companies on Order. the O'Halloran Hill site. The member, I think, is now debating the issue. No, Mr. Speaker. I did raise the issue of the CSIRO failing to obtain approvals Order. from the Marion Council and not following normal government tendering procedures. However, these actions were only taken to strengthen my case to Order. prevent an act of environmental vandalism, which Senator Cook should also criticise instead of imputing untrue motives to defend the indefensible. Mr Speaker, I will continue to oppose the erection of any billboards by any and all companies on the CSIRO site at O'Halloran Hill. The right hon. Member for New England. I seek to make a personal explanation. You claim to be misrepresented. Yes, also, Mr. please Mr. proceed. Mr. Speaker, I do. Order. In uh, this morning's Canberra Times, in an article Those edited, on my right. in an article edited by a Simon Groves, there's an attempt to link me, in some way, to the same measure of culpability as the honourable member for Kingsford Smith and the honourable member for Fremantle. I point out in the. Uh, matters to which that particular article refers that I paid all my own legal fees, that I stood down from Cabinet and I was acquitted on all charges, yeah, yeah, in yeah, contrast yeah. to both of those honourable gentlemen. Can be honourable yeah, yeah, yeah. The honourable member for Groom. Yes, Mr. Stabby, speaker, I speak, uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Do you claim to be misrepresented, yes, I, also? Yes, I do, uh, Mr. Speaker. In a, in a press release uh, earlier this evening, the Prime Minister accuse me of being uh, mischievous or ignorant or possibly both Order. and that I need to do my homework before I burst into print. Can I just uh, say to the Prime Minister that he's, he's wrong on both counts? Order. And no, 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 no. We're going to be here all night. The chair will be resumed tomorrow, Friday 1st of December at 10 o'clock. Have a good night. Oh, yeah. The most days.